David Case Fen Griffin David Case, born 1937, is an American writer who spends most of his life in England and Europe writing pseudonymous novels. Once in a while he turns his talent to weird fiction, though never enough for him to be recognized by a sufficiently large readership to make him the name he ought to be. He first crept out of the woodwork in 1969 with his collection The Cell, which showed his predilection for stories of psychological lycanthropy. He later wrote a whole novel on the theme in Wolf Tracks, 1980. It reoccurred in his second collection, Fen Griffin, 1971, and it is the title story I've selected here. It was picked up by Milton Subotsky and filmed in 1972 as And Now the Screaming Starts. Case reckons he once saw a werewolf in Greece. Perhaps that helped him write from personal experience. Certainly there's a wonderful atmosphere about Fen Griffin, the tale of a family curse. More recently, Case turned to a novel of a more ancient curse in The Third Grave, 1981. He's long overdue for a new book. My first impression of Fen Griffin House was skeletal. I saw it from the carriage, rising against a stormy sundown like the blackened bones of some monstrous beast, not the fragile, bleached bones of decaying man, but the massive, arched columns of a primordial saurian who had wandered to this desolate moor and there lay down and died, perhaps of loneliness, long ages before. The spires and towers loomed up in sharp silhouette, and the structure squatted beneath, sunken but not cowed, crouched ready to spring, so that the house seemed to exist on two planes at the same time, massive and slender, bulky and light gross and fragile. It was a building which had aged through a series of architectural blunders, and it was awesome. Our approach was from the east, by a twisted trail through the hills, and the agony of sunset formed a backdrop to the house. The sky swirled darkly above a fringe of blood red, etching on a low and tempestuous evening. The turrets were aglow, and the tallest trees caught the final slanting rays of cloud-filtered sunlight, while the world below was already drenched in the gloom of night. I am a man of science, seldom affected by moods and not much given to fanciful thought, and yet as I gazed upon this remarkable construction I sensed a pervading evil, an adumbration of unholy darkness. For a long minute I continued to stare, before I was able to smile at myself for my irrational sensations, and leaned forward to the driver. He did not wait for my question. I, this be Fen Griffin, he said. He cracked his whip. I leaned back again. The wind was in the trees, playing a light motif behind the horse's clattering hooves, and perhaps it was the chill in the air which caused me to shiver. The carriage swung around and halted before the front entrance. An archway of stone set with massive wooden doors capable of admitting giants, doors worthy of a drawbridge, doors to stand fast against armies and defy the rush of dragons. A man feels his insignificance while approaching such portals. The driver brought my bag, leaving the horses to paw restlessly at the turf, eager to move on to the stables and suffering the habit of obedience. As we drew near, the doors opened silently. A servant, bent and deformed with time, took my hat and stick, and relieved the driver of my bag. The driver returned to his carriage, and I passed through the arch and into the house. "'You will be Dr. Pope,' the servant said. "'I am. The master is waiting in the library. If you will follow me, sir?' He ushered me through panelled hallways of such dimension that the corners were shrouded in darkness— and rapped lightly upon a door. A voice called, Enter. The servant opened the door and stood back, and I went into an impressive room of oak and leather and mellow candlelight. Charles Fengriffin walked across the room and extended his hand. Ah, Dr. Pope, it was kind of you to come so quickly. I am indebted. His grip was firm and dry. He was a tall, lean man with aristocratic features and sufficient graciousness to keep arrogance from taking control. Yet beneath this surface lurked something of strained emotion, a hint of desperation behind his eyes. I was scarcely surprised at this, for he had not summoned me from London without reason. 
I trust your journey was comfortable. Quite so. And not, I hope, in vain. His eyes held mine for a moment, then shifted restlessly. It was natural that he should experience some degree of nervousness at this meeting, natural that he should have qualms and doubts concerning a practitioner of an infant science, not regarding the urgency of his summons. I had long grown accustomed to such reactions, resigned to them, I might say, for they so often prevented effective results. I hope not, sir. Yes, he said. He looked about the room with a vague expression, came to himself again and offered me a seat by the fire, sat opposite, then immediately rose again and crossed to the chimney-piece. He returned with a decanter and, without inquiring whether I wished to drink, poured me a brandy. I sipped and found it excellent. "'I expect you are tired and hungry,' he said. "'Perhaps before we talk. I am more curious than tired.' Curious. Curiosity is necessary in my field. Fen Griffin nodded. How did you come to hear of me, sir? The village doctor recommended you, Dr. Whittle. A good man, well able to mend a broken bone, but unversed in modern techniques of... of... psychology. Ah, yes, psychology. Yes. Dr. Whittle has heard of your studies at Leipzig, and your subsequent success, and suggested I enlist your services. That is rare. Few provincial practitioners have faith in my science. Few indeed have knowledge of it. As I say, Whittle is a good man who recognizes his limitations. And the problem? Fen Griffin gestured meaninglessly. A matter of psychology, certainly. I am not sure, sir a matter in which I am helpless, in which I desperately need help. It is my hope that you may provide it. You will not find me ungrateful. I held my hand up, palm towards him. It is never good to speak of financial reward in these things. Your message mentioned your wife. Yes, that is so. And something is troubling her. He nodded looked down at his hands, then raised his eyes and stared directly at me. "'I fear she is losing her sanity,' he said. This was more overt than I had come to expect, and we regarded one another for some moments before he shuddered slightly and looked away. "'What causes you to believe this?' I asked. "'There are certain symptoms, certain changes in her attitude towards me, alterations in her physical appearance, a disinclination towards all the things which she formerly found interesting. It has the appearance of declining affection, and yet I am positive it is more than that. We were very much in love, you see. He seemed to be repeating this sentence to himself, pondering over the significance or mourning his loss. I waited silently. And since her pregnancy, these changes have become more rapid, more apparent. That is often normal with pregnancy. These are not normal changes. I assure you of that. My wife seems to despise me, almost to fear me. I have often found her staring at me with unconcealed loathing. And, too, I have seen her gazing at herself, at her swollen stomach, you understand, with an inhuman grimace. I fear she does not want my child. If it were merely a case of not loving me, but there seems no reason, no justification, and I must fear that her mind has conjured up some falsehood. Sir, you must realize, I am a doctor and a psychologist. I am not a counsellor upon marriage. Yes, yes, I am aware of that. Perhaps it will appear to you that my wife no longer loves me. Perhaps, objectively, it must appear that way. But I know Catherine. I knew her. We were very happy. Her actions are inexplicable to me. If you can fathom this mystery, find, if not cure, at least some reason behind it. I will do what I can. I can ask no more. Does your wife know why I am here? 
She knows you are a doctor. I have not informed her of your, your field of study. Do you wish to speak with her? In due course, not directly. She will dine with us? As you think best. Yes. It is often better to observe a person before inquiring into the details of the illness. It makes it easier to form an unprejudiced opinion, you see. If I might be shown to my rooms now. Yes, of course. He sprang up and drew the bell cord. I finished my brandy and rose. Fen Griffin was about to say something further, then hesitated as the door opened and a maid appeared. Ah, Mrs. Loon, will you show Dr. Pope to his rooms now? Very well, sir, she said. I followed her from the library. Fen Griffin's eyes followed me. Mrs. Loon was an elderly woman with a firm jaw, the sort of servant who attaches herself to a household early in life and remains in their service a lifetime. She preceded me up the wide staircase with a proprietorial stride, thrusting the candlestick like a weapon before us, an ineffective weapon pitted against the black shadows of this vast edifice, washing a meager and transient path along which we trod. But Mrs. Loon had no need of illumination for she must have known this house completely, stone and nail, through her long years of service. At the top of the stairs we turned down a hallway or gallery lined with numerous portraits, presumably the Fengriffin family, and all done in dark and somber tone and attitude. I lagged somewhat behind at this point, interested in the family resemblance which ran through the ancestral chain. Heredity and inherited traits are, naturally enough, very interesting to me, and I believe them as valid as environment in the understanding of a personality, believe that a physical resemblance may well offer a hint of further and deeper inheritance, for a man whose bloodlines are potent enough to pass on appearance will naturally pass on the less obvious aspects of his person to some degree. Mrs. Lewin, finding that I had dropped back, paused and turned, offering the light to my direction. The stern Fengriffin faces glared at me from the wall, surrounded by massive gilt frames which bore at the bottom the names and dates of the portrayed individuals. They seemed to progress in chronological order, beginning at the head of the staircase, and I moved down the line, glancing at the dates and noticing that the canvases became less antiquated, if none the less grim, as I advanced. They were spaced at regular intervals, as if the purpose were to form a family tree or chart easy to decipher— rather than a gallery of artistic interest. So regular, indeed, was the layout, that when I came to a break it impressed itself sharply upon the optical sense. I looked beyond, and saw that the paintings continued again, and that only one was missing. The wall at this point was slightly lighter than the surroundings, and a rectangle the size of the frames, as if the missing picture had but recently been removed. The fact nudged my curiosity. "'There seems to be a missing ancestor,' I remarked. "'Yes, sir.' Mrs. Loon said, and quickly added, "'Your room is just here, sir. "'Who might this be?' "'She appeared not to hear me, "'moved off and opened a door "'leading from the opposite side of the gallery, "'and stood back waiting for me to enter. "'Instead I walked past and observed the next portrait, "'found it to be the penultimate one. "'It was Peter Fengriffin. "'The last portrait was of Charles Fengriffin himself. "'He looked remarkably like his father on canvas, "'more so indeed than he looked in the flesh.' for his picture had the lifeless and stiff attitude common to all the portraits. By the simplest logical deduction, it was apparent that the absent picture, being the antepenultimate, had been of Henry Fengriffin, Charles Fengriffin's grandfather. "'What has happened to the missing portrait?' I asked. "'I wouldn't know, sir,' said Mrs. Loon, and immediately my curiosity moved past idle musing, for it hardly seemed possible that this woman would fail to know such a simple fact concerning the house she managed.' Perhaps it has been removed for restoration? That might well be, sir, she said. She would obviously say no more. I shrugged and moved past her into the chambers assigned to me. Mrs. Loon entered behind me and proceeded to bustle about making preparations which had already been seen to. The fire was laid and the candles lighted, the heavy curtains drawn and the bed turned down. Mrs. Loon scurried about, poking at the wood and patting the bedclothes, adjusting the curtains an imperceptible fraction, moving a candlestick a trifle. "'Will that be all, sir?' she asked, when everything was to her satisfaction. "'Yes, this is fine.' She moved to the door, then hesitated. "'Yes, Mrs. Loon?' "'You are a doctor, sir.' 
I am. You forgive my asking. Are you here to see about the mistress? Genuine concern played upon her countenance, and I wondered what she had noticed of Catherine Fengriffin's disorder, if indeed there was a disorder. Charles Fengriffin had thus far been vague, and I debated whether I should attempt to elicit further details from this woman. I intend to speak with her, yes, I said. You won't be— Forgive me, sir, but you won't be cutting into her, will you? Cutting, I repeated, not sure of her meaning. You won't be cutting into her body, will you, sir? Good heavens, no! I'm not a surgeon. No, I meant, well, boring holes into a skull or anything devilish like that. Trepanning? I asked incredulously. If that's how it's called. Wherever did you get such an idea? Well, I've heard tell of such, sir. Here? At the house? Oh, no, sir. No. In olden times. Very old, I should think. My good woman, that was a prehistoric remedy for letting out evil spirits. Yes, sir, she said. She wasn't at all surprised at the knowledge. I assure you, I will perform no physical operations of any nature. I'm a... a different type of doctor. Mrs. Loon peered at me. The candle she held cast oblong shadows upwards over her face, and her eyes glinted from the darkness of the sockets. It's not a doctor as is needed here, she said. Whatever do you mean? Oh, sir, it's not for me to say, Mrs. Loon replied. She left the room, closing the door behind her. She closed it rather quickly. I stared at the oak panels for a moment, pondering upon this remarkable conversation. Then I turned to the room. My bag had been brought up, and there was hot water in the basin, and I began to dress for dinner. Catherine Fengriffin greeted me civilly enough, but with a coolness that seemed more than normal reticence at meeting a stranger, a coolness that was all the more surprising in that she gazed full upon my face for an inordinate length of time. It was impossible to judge the emotions which she experienced during this appraisal, whether curiosity or malice or scorn or possibly even friendship. I found it difficult to return this equivocal observation. At length she turned away and stared at her husband in a similar manner. I regarded her thus in profile, found her a strikingly beautiful woman, and yet when she had looked at me I had not been aware of that beauty. It existed in the superficial structure of her countenance, but dimmed in her expression. She was younger than her husband, quite young, in fact, and yet even in her youth there lurked a paradox. Her complexion was smooth and clear and free of wrinkles, and yet she was strained and drawn. Her carriage was erect and graceful, yet one had the impression that she bore a heavy weight upon her shoulders. Her eyes were bright, but it was the brightness of sunlight filtered through an overcast sky. The cords of her neck were prominent as her head turned, and she kept her hands clenched at her sides. She was swollen with child, her condition more advanced than I had expected, but she lacked the glow and bloom of pregnancy which normally adds so greatly to a woman's appearance and personality. She stared at Fengriffin every bit as long as she had stared at me, as if he too were a stranger and I had ample time to study her features, decided that, despite the tenseness, none of the more overt signs of mental disturbance lurked there. Quite unexpectedly she turned back to me. "'You have journeyed from London?' she asked. I told her that was so. "'A tedious journey,' she said, and her tone implied that my travel had been wasted. The journey had been more useless than tiring. Then we went into the dining room. It was a spacious chamber with an Adam ceiling and a trestle table of polished oak, at which we were seated some distance apart. Jacob, the old fellow who had admitted me upon my arrival, served us from the sideboard. He was attentive and efficient, if somewhat slowed by age, as he shuffled along the considerable length of the table, serving us in turn. The food was abundant, and the claret superb but the conversation added nothing to the gracious atmosphere. 
I made a few idle comments concerning my journey. Fen Griffin spoke of his horses without the passion of a true horseman. We discussed very briefly the differences we had found in life on the continent. Catherine said nothing. At one point, while we were talking of Italy, her eyes lighted and she assumed an attitude of interest, but this lasted for only a moment before she lapsed once more into a morose and uninterested expression. I found her behavior peculiar, but not outstandingly so, more preoccupied than disturbed. Presently, partly through lingering curiosity, but also in an attempt to keep the feeble and faltering intercourse alive, I said, I took notice of the gallery upstairs. It seems a very complete history of the Fen Griffins. Catherine looked up sharply, and Charles occupied himself with his goblet. I didn't count them, I continued. How far back does the representation go? Fen Griffin thought for a moment. Twelve generations, he said. A long time. Something of a family tradition. I've had my own portrait added. Perhaps you noticed. I did indeed. There is a distinct physical resemblance running through the series. Unusually so. He nodded. I can't say I approve of portraits in such a stilted manner, but I don't wish to break the continuity. Catherine had been staring at me once again. I find the resemblance rather disturbing, she said. Indeed, in what way? It may all be to the good to have an ancient family and be proud of one's bloodlines, but surely a man should be an individual, should be more than another link in a chain of deceased humanity. Every man who ever lived is that, I told her. That, at least. He may be more in his own right. I express myself badly, Catherine said. Fen Griffin turned his goblet about, cupped in both hands, swirling the wine. I mean to say, if such a strong physical resemblance is inherited, does it not follow that other traits will be passed on as well, the bad as well as the good? Catherine, Fen Griffin said and paused. Not necessarily, I said. She smiled. It was an inordinately bitter smile. I bow to superior knowledge, she said. I do know something of heredity, I began. I'm sure you do, Doctor. I'm really not interested. Fen Griffin turned toward her and was about to speak, but I thought it better to discontinue this line of conversation. I interrupted by saying, Twelve generations, you said. Is the gallery complete for that time? He turned slowly back towards me, his lips still parted with preparation for speech, and nodded. I noticed one space which was vacant. I expect that picture has been removed for cleaning or restoration? That is correct. It has been sent away to be repaired. There was a slight accident, actually. One of the servants, carrying a candelabrum, stumbled. You undoubtedly noticed how dark it is in the gallery in the evening— stumbled and fell against the painting. One candlestick was forced against the canvas with violence and tore the fabric. It was necessary to have it removed. Ah, I wondered. Why should you wonder? Catherine inquired. Such is my nature. Which ancestor was it, may I ask? My grandfather, Charles said. Henry Fengriffin, said Catherine as though the words were anathema to her. Charles scowled. I suppose Mrs. Loon was the culprit. It seems her domain. Yes, Ben Griffin said. Yes, I believe Loon was the one. I don't really recall. An accident, hardly worth remembering, of course. Will it be returned soon? Why, I don't really know. I haven't thought. Why do you ask? I take an interest in such work a layman's interest. I should be interested in inspecting the quality of the restoration. Jacob clearly's away, Fen Griffin said, gesturing at the remains of our dinner. It was rather badly damaged, Catherine said to me. I shouldn't be surprised if it is beyond repair. And she smiled again, the same bitter smile, turned upon her husband this time, while Jacob hovered between them, bent over at his task for all the world like some gothic gargoyle sprung living from the wall.
Catherine excused herself directly the meal was finished, and Fen Griffin and I retired to the library for coffee and brandy. The wind was rattling the windows ominously, but the fire was burning and the room was pleasant. Fen Griffin stood at the window, hands clasped behind his back, and said nothing until Jacob entered with a silver tray and began to pour the coffee. Well, Jacob, Fen Griffin asked without turning around, what do your joints say? Are we in for a storm? Not tonight, sir. Only been aching a bit through the day. Maybe in two or three days. They can say what they like about this modern weather prediction. There's nothing as accurate as old Jacob's joints, Fen Griffin said. Jacob seemed enormously pleased at such praise to the barometer of his bones. He was almost smiling openly as he shuffled from the room. Fen Griffin left the window and sat opposite my position, his long legs extended in a relaxed posture, his face composed, his hands clasped before his breast. He looked almost too much at ease. Well, you have seen my wife, he began. I nodded. Did her behavior not strike you as... as unusual? A trifle distant, perhaps. Ah, but of course you did not know her before. You have no means of gauging the depth of her change. She was warm and loving, the antithesis of what she is now. But a change of that nature hardly implies insanity. His head was slightly forward, and he regarded me from the tops of his eyes, rather like a practitioner of the gentle art warily circling a formidable antagonist. Here again was the difficulty in my profession. I was employed to find truth, and yet he dreaded truth. I was instructed to correlate facts, and he withheld those facts. There would be more to this case than studying Catherine. It would be necessary to relate those studies to her husband, to judge her mental state objectively, and then to comprehend how that state appeared to Fen Griffin's subjective perception. I had little doubt I could discover the dichotomous truth. My doubt was whether those truths would be the solution. Oh, I know, Finn Griffin said. You believe she has merely ceased to love me. Merely? It seemed a curious word. I said, if she has ceased to love you, there will be reasons for that, too. But my task is to unravel the wandering paths of the mental process, to untangle the web of disorder. With understanding often comes cure, but that is all I can do. I cannot persuade her to love you if she does not. Nor would I expect it. It might well be necessary for you to change. He shook his head. I was not sure what he meant to negate by this gesture. A brief silence followed. Fen Griffin leaned forward to poke unnecessarily at the fire, shifting the flaming logs. The reflection danced curious patterns across his cheekbones. I sipped my brandy and coffee and waited. He took a cigar case from his pocket and offered me one, and we made something of a ritual of clipping the ends and lighting up. A light gray haze arose between us, and we looked at one another through this smoke. You won't make a hasty judgment, he asked. You will speak with Catherine. Of course. Alone, I expect. Eventually. But first I should like to listen to you, to form a background upon which to judge. Tell me how you met, how you came to love and marry. You think that will be relevant? Anything may be relevant. Who can say? At some point, after some occurrence, or, more likely, series of events, your wife's attitude altered. It is possible to reason back from the fact to the cause, but I believe it more effective to look first for that cause and apply it to the effect. It may not be difficult. I can stand apart and look objectively upon events in a way that an involved person cannot. Fen Griffin nodded. Whether knowing the cause will enable us to change the effect, of course, is a different matter. Once again, his head nodded. Tell me as it comes to mind. Finn Griffin drew on his cigar and settled back. His eyes were closed. After a few moments, he began to speak. There is really little to tell, Finn Griffin said. 
I had no intention of speaking, but my face must have reflected my thoughts, for he raised his hand and said, Yes, yes, I know. That is for you to decide. Well, I was born here at the house. My mother died while I was yet a child, and I remember her only in the barest snatches of recollection, more a mood than an image. I spent my childhood and youth in these surroundings, and I believe, according to the standard judgments, that it was a happy time. That is, I recall more pleasantness than otherwise, more happiness than grief, and the normal pangs of adolescence were mild. But I did not know Catherine in those days, and can see no possible connection. Well, those years passed, as years tend to do. I became a young man. Happiness to a man is not the constant that it is in childhood, and I decided I must see something of life. I arranged for rooms in London. My father had no objections to this, indeed thought it was a fine idea, and provided me with adequate income. So I ventured, for the first time, away from my home. I was instantly charmed by an urban existence. I was, I fear, something of a wastrel, spending my time in the pursuit of pleasure and wallowing in the charm of degradation. I realized all this at the time, of course, although I now understand it in a different light. But I might describe myself, might have even at the time, as a gentlemanly rogue or a philanderer, or perhaps a mild libertine. I had the typical realizations of a young man, and, even more typically, thought them unique unto myself, never dreaming that I was merely experiencing the same perceptions that all men do. He paused. I expect this is the sort of thing you had in mind, he asked me, without the slightest trace of embarrassment. I was taken by his natural and direct approach to self-analysis and nodded. Yes, continue. I drank rather too heavily and gambled considerably, although never exceeding my means or getting into debt or difficulty. There was always some sober part of my mind to hold the reins on abandon. Still, it was a wild life. It was London in a vintage year. Many a sunrise did I see through bloodshot eyes and hazy perception. Many the turn of the cards upon which I wagered recklessly, believing luck a living entity which stood at my shoulder. Many the theatre I attended and played my own little romantic role before the stage, amidst an audience all of whom believed themselves to play the lead. And yes, there were women of dubious virtue as well. Fen Griffin smiled slightly. Catherine knew of those women before we married, he said, anticipating a question which I wouldn't have asked. It was while I resided in London that I first made her acquaintance, actually. This was, let me see, it must have been seven or eight years after I arrived there. My original intention had been to spend a year, two at the most, and then return home. But one tends to fall into a track of existence. Time passed quickly. The year was over before I knew it. Two and three years passed at a stretch. Similarity of events grants fleet wings to the passage of time, reduces the constant of time's value. I was ensnared. I have no doubts in retrospect that I was infinitely bored by my meaningless life, so bored that my senses were numbed, and I could not perceive my boredom through my stupor. So, like Hector around the gates of Troy, I was dragged behind the chariot of monotony. Then I met Catherine. I was immediately struck by her beauty, but at the time I was interested in less permanent arrangements than marriage, and it was apparent Catherine was not the sort of woman who— You understand. We became friends, and there was great affection between us, but nothing more. Nothing more. Nothing spoken, at least— although I expect the seeds of love were sowed long before they were acknowledged. Catherine knew the sort of life I was leading, and did not castigate me for it, viewed it with, if anything, an amused tolerance. He drew on his cigar, as though using it to paragraph his speech, and I watched the long white ash advance up the cylinder, sending tentacles into the leaf. And then, quite unexpectedly, my father died. I was left in possession of these estates, and with a sense of filial failure. I had not seen my father in several years, and animadverted upon my neglect. 
It brought a sense of reality back into my life, however. I had inherited responsibility. I suddenly understood how jaded I had become with my wild life, and knew it was time to return home. I did so. But I had not been here a month before loneliness and celibacy began to interfere with my happiness. I determined to find a wife, and Catherine sprang instantly to mind. She was talented, charming, graceful, and beautiful, all that a man could desire. Her financial means were limited, but her family was old and of excellent lineage. Money meant little to me. I found myself possessed of far more than I should ever need. He gestured vaguely at our gracious surroundings with the hand which held the fine Armagnac. I believe it meant little to Catherine as well, that money could never enter into her decisions. I loved her and flattered myself that she loved me in return. Perhaps that was my error. I pray to God it wasn't. Although the alternative, it may have some bearing. Then Griffin's face clouded darkly for a moment as he twisted his thoughts in silence. But I ramble. In any event, I loved her. It was curious how I suddenly realized this love, realized that what I had believed to be friendship had been forged in a false image, that my emotions towards her were an anamorphosis which, when viewed correctly, ceased to be deformed by my perception. It was love revealed, and I longed for her. I journeyed to London immediately and proposed marriage. Catherine accepted me without the slightest hesitation with a smile and an amused and tolerant glance, as though she had expected my proposal and had been awaiting it patiently. Perhaps my intentions had been more obvious to her than to myself. At any rate, we wed in London, as soon as it could be arranged, and left directly after for our honeymoon on the continent. It was a time of extreme happiness. More, it was bliss and ecstasy. I had not the slightest doubt I had married wisely and well. Married, I might say, to perfection. Catherine proved all I could have desired, and more. My love increased beyond restriction, beyond limitation, beyond the capacity of thought. And she responded to my love in the same manner, until we were linked together by bonds greater than either emotion or ratiocination, greater than the sum of both. We travelled through France and Italy at a leisurely pace, stopping where it struck our fancy and taking several months longer than we had intended. We shared the pleasures of new discoveries without need of words, with our own communication, a smile, the tender pressure of her hand, a glance. It was sufficient to send a deluge of feeling cascading between our minds and hearts. We needed no one else, avoided other people for the most part, sought private experience and beauty, and found it everywhere found it in the caress of a Mediterranean breeze, the color of a cloud, the eternity of a shapeless lump of rock. We ventured to the museums and appreciated the subtle touch of the old masters, and then the wind would stir Catherine's hair along her neck, and all the talent and glory of Rubens or Botticelli was as nothing to her splendor. She was the brilliance in the chiaroscuro of life. She was mystery understood reflecting love with a radiance which would shame the moon into darkness. Ah, but why attempt to express a thing you have not known? You understand, we were in love without boundaries. Then Griffin leaned towards me. And then eventually it was necessary to return to manage my estates. Had I known, I would have forsaken all. I would willingly have lived as a peasant on some rocky precipice, a shepherd in some rustic cabin, a fisherman on a stormy sea. But I did not know. Damn me, I could not have known. And so we returned. And that was when the change began. His voice hardened and his face tightened. The ash dropped from his cigar unheeded and fragmented against his well-polished boot. I can place it to the second, you see. I raised my eyebrows. He failed to see my gesture, for his eyes were turned inwards. He was looking at the past, recorded in his mind, lurking and lingering in the shadows, cowled shapes silently waiting for a moment when defenses are down, 
and they may rush out to deal a savage wound. The recollections of regret, those parasites that torment their host and rage like dragons through the brain. I felt less objective than befits my profession. It was the very moment that she first looked upon Fengriffin House, he said at length. You have seen the house. It is impressive and somehow eerie. Even I, who spent all my childhood roaming through these grounds and rooms, often feel a strange mood pervading the walls themselves. Yet it is a house, no more. The mood stems from the mind. God knows it was the furthest thing from my thoughts on the evening I brought my bride home. An evening rather like this one, in fact. The sky was flaming, and the house was framed against the sunset. We were in an open carriage, winding through the hills, and I looked fondly at my bride, wishing to witness her first reaction to her home, hoping she would be pleased. I knew, of course, the exact point when the road turned past a shoulder of barren land and left the view unhindered. Our carriage made that turn, and suddenly Catherine stiffened and shuddered. Her lips parted, and she gave an involuntary gasp. I believed she had taken a chill, and drew her to me, felt her trembling, asked what was wrong. She would not answer me. She continued to stare towards the house with an expression difficult of description, an impression of foreboding, perhaps, for whatever had caused it, it was from that moment that the change began. Fengriffin leaned back again, his senses once more in the present, emerged from the forest of recall. I see, I told him, and I do not see. Has she ever told you what it was she felt upon first sighting the house? Never. I do not believe she knows herself. It was a feeling, unique, but intangible. Intangible. Yes, I felt something of that myself. There are legends, of course, he said, with a gesture of deprecation. What ancient home is without its ghosts, its haunts, and superstitions? I pay them no mind, certainly. The servants believe them, I expect. And I fear Catherine has come to believe them as well. But at the time when she first saw the house, she could not have known of the legends, which seems to make them an after-effect and irrelevant, a symptom rather than a cause. What are these legends? They are nonsense. I shan't waste your time with them. Cannot in truth recall the details myself. The point is, from that very instant, and without any connection, Catherine began to draw away from me. She became reticent and silent took long solitary walks, and spent hours alone in her room, or here, locked in the library. Books had never seemed to interest her very much before, and the obvious assumption was that she no longer wished to be with me. All the pleasures we had shared ceased to exist. I tried at first to ignore the change, to force myself to think it the normal way in which a marriage settles after the first passion, after the romance of the honeymoon has become a daily pattern of necessity, but I could deceive myself only so long. Eventually I had to admit that her love had changed, to attempt to find the reasons. Catherine would not speak of it, however. I asked her, begged her to tell me what was wrong. She would not even admit to a change. I told her we could go away again, if that would please her, told her that we could leave instantly, retracing the paths where we had found such happiness, that her love was all that mattered to me, and I would gladly have dressed in rags and torn a living from the soil with naked hands as long as that love existed. She merely shook her head, rather sadly, and, the only time she came close to admitting the change, said that it was too late, and that the past could never be recaptured. And then she left me, standing helpless and hopeless, and seeking desperately for some hint or clue amidst my grief. I could only hope that time, that greatest of all healers, would undo the unknown damage. But time did not heal. Time served against me. By the time that we knew Catherine was with child, the change had become so pronounced that it was apparent even to the servants that something was wrong. 
I have heard them discussing it amongst themselves. Can you imagine, sir, the agony of overhearing such intercourse? My wife will no longer even admit me to her room. I have done nothing, to my knowledge, to offend her, am willing to make any sacrifice at her slightest whim, and she refuses even sacrifice. I am desperate, sir. And it was a desperate and beseeching glance he turned upon me, waiting for me to speak. I wished I could have found words of encouragement, but it was too early, and I knew too little. Would have thought the most likely answer was the simplest, that she no longer loved him, and that his own fancy had contrived this sudden change, protecting his emotions by inventing the balm of hope. You have told me everything, I asked. He nodded, slowly. You have no idea as to the cause? None. Catherine has mentioned the legends, and has made it clear that she despises this house, but that seems to bear no relation to her feelings towards me. I have offered to take her from here, and she has refused. The legends, yes. Well, they could have affected her in this manner, one supposes. If she has that turn of mind, has connected you with the house, and all the hatred and fears which have developed in relation to it. If only it were that simple. No, Fen Griffin, not simple. It would scarcely be a rational judgment, but it could be a deep connection, difficult to sever. I understand that, sir. But I fear certain possibilities more than I fear irrational connections within her mind. It is selfish, of course, but love is a selfish thing. Necessarily so, since it is reflection. But other possibilities. What I mean is, I have mentioned, I believe, Catherine's financial circumstances when we met. Is it possible she wed me for wealth, loved me superficially in the gaiety of London and the brief happiness abroad, and then found her feelings too shallow to cope with life in this secluded place? That she began to regret her marriage, and then, when she became pregnant, she saw it as a hindrance to escape, saw her route to freedom blocked by her swollen womb. Is that what you believe? He started to reply, then clamped his lips together, said through clenched teeth, No, damn it, no. If it is so, there is little I can do. You can find the truth. I must know. I nodded. I felt very sorry for this man. I will speak with your wife tomorrow, I said. And waiting, I will know how Aegeus felt, waiting on that rocky coast for his son to return, praying that you will raise a white sail, sir. But I feared it would be black. That night I found sleep elusive. Hypnos is a fleeting god when the mind is aroused, and Fengriffin's tale had moved me to feeling. I sat at the window, smoking a pipe and looking across the moonlit moors. The landscape was silent and awesome, blocked in patterns of silver and black. Thoughts ran at random through my brain. I was not seeking a solution, knew there could be no more than conjecture as yet, but the thoughts had a will of their own, tempting me with vague urgings telling me at one moment that it was obvious she did not love him, and at the next that there was some mystery far deeper to be disclosed. I recalled Mrs. Loon's curious comments, remembered the missing portrait and Catherine's bitter smile, thought of the strange chill which had moved me when I first saw the house. Yet I made no effort at correlating these factors. They moved at a level beneath the surface of ratiocination, and my controlled thoughts were superficial. I looked at the moors, and I smoked. My pipe burned out, and I filled a second, lit it, tamping it down carefully, and fired it again, until it was burning evenly and the smoke was cool. Tobacco is an ally of contentment, and I told myself I must be content, with the cheerful blaze still in the grate, and the wind howling ineffectively outside, shaking the trees in a fury, but unable to get to me. Indeed, defeating its purpose as in rage it sucked the draught up the chimney and caused my fire to burn more freely. 
I was able to judge the force of that wind by regarding the shadows beneath the trees. The filigreed moonlight shifted and blurred, laying silver tapestries beneath the limbs. It was hypnotic. I lost awareness of time as I studied the moving shadows. My second pipe went out. I pulled thoughtlessly at the mouthpiece. My eyes grew heavy. And then, gradually, I found myself looking at a different shadow. I must have observed it for some time before I realized it was more than the wind snatching the trees, for this shape had advanced beyond the trees, and it brought a shadow of its own, moved near to the house and then paused. I snapped to alertness. I stared at this dark form and had the grotesque impression that, whatever it was, it was staring back at me. A finger of ice tapped up the articulation of my backbone, leaving me rigid in its wake. And then the shape was gone. I leaned closer to the window, but there was nothing there. If it had been, it was gone. A jest of deceptive perception, I told myself. And then from the trees came the unearthly howl of a dog, a sudden and rising sound which ceased as abruptly as it had begun, in a way no dog willfully terminates its cry. A dog, I told myself. No more. But strange formless doubts accompanied me to my bed that night. I found Catherine walking in the gardens. It was early, and the damp mist clung to her, so that she appeared to drift over the ground. I had to quicken my stride to overtake her, and she did not seem aware of my approach, gazing abstractedly into the distance. And yet when I spoke she was not startled. She seemed to have been expecting me. She nodded, and I fell into step beside her. She was wrapped in a tweed cloak, and wore stout walking shoes, yet her manner implied more than a sensible stroll before breakfast, more suited to the clinging mist than the heavy cloak. We moved on for a short distance without speaking, came to a shattered stump from which the fallen trunk still angled to the earth, and Catherine sat upon it. "'Why have you come here, doctor?' she asked. "'Your husband summoned me.' "'Is my husband ill?' She smiled slightly. I found a loose tongue of bark and pulled a strip from the dead tree. The wood beneath had not yet begun to rot. "'Charles believes me insane,' she said. "'Not insane, no. Unhappy. "'And can you treat unhappiness? "'Is there some arcane herb to cure it? "'Some unguent or liniment to make me content? "'Some leech to draw sadness from my soul?' You are unhappy, then. Surely you don't ask me to diagnose my own sickness. I ask you to talk with me. Of what? Whatever you choose. Of unhappiness? If you like. She shrugged. I shredded the strip of bark and let the fragments drift away on the mist. The sun was rising now, distorted by the dampness and applying a pastel wash to the landscape. Drops of moisture sparkled from the amaranthine blooms and gathered brilliance at our feet. Catherine was silent for a time. She seemed indifferent to her surroundings, to me, even to her own sensations. Then she shrugged a second time and looked up at me. "'What is the harm?' she asked. What is the good, certainly, but what harm in speaking? You are right. Charles is right. I am immensely unhappy. It is no one's fault, not even my own. I am accursed. I looked at her rather more sharply than I had intended. A fanciful word, perhaps? Or do you think it an expression selected by an infected mind? Words are symbols, no more. Yes, she said. Yes, there are far worse things than words. Will you tell me? She began to tell her tale. I love Charles with my heart, she said. But what is the heart? It beats so many times a day. It stops. So it is with love. 
my heart still beats, and I still love. Sooner or later, rather sooner, I fancy, it will stop. But I love my husband, and I pity him. I know the agony my behavior must cause him. The very fact of your presence here is proof of his pain, and yet I am helpless to avoid it. My love is not lessened, but my responses are. Responses are not governed by that pounding organ. Reactions are not carried through the bloodstream. I cannot tell Charles of my feelings. Confession is impossible for me. I feel as an unfaithful woman must feel, a woman who continues to be devoted to her husband and yet is driven by some prepotent whim into infidelity. She shook her head. No, I have not been unfaithful, she said, not in the common sense of such words. But here again we have symbols, and I have been unfaithful in a far more terrible way than words can encompass. Words that I can use. Infidelity is a living entity within this house, an organism dwelling in the walls themselves. The instant I first looked upon these wretched towers and spires, these ghastly rocks rising from the desolate moors, you, sir, have seen this place. Did you not feel the evil? I did not reply. Ah, blind men of science! I know no science, and therefore wear no blinders. Truth cannot penetrate the shell of false knowledge which foolish men have erected in the name of progress. But I am not hindered by this. When this house first came into view, I shivered. I felt a shaft of cold enter my body. Charles drew me to him, inquired as to my trembling, and what could I tell him? It was a feeling. The symbols were inadequate. Or are feelings symbols as well? Perhaps they indicate. Yes. Well, this feeling indicated. If only I had known what it indicated, I would never have entered the house. But I did not know. I told myself I was being ridiculous, and I passed through those loathsome portals. Inside, with the fires laid and the candles burning, it was momentarily better. For a while I became more cheerful, and thought of my fear as irrational and absurd, tried to believe I had, as Charles suggested, merely taken a chill. Then the other indicators began to appear. Mrs. Loon kept regarding me with eyes of pure and simple pity, looked at me as one might some piteously malformed infant, or some innocent prisoner unjustly doomed to the gallows. This threw my husband into gloom. He shot Mrs. Loon a fierce glance, which I was not supposed to notice, and she left. He sat brooding, his chin lowered to his chest. It was the first time I had ever seen Charles other than gay and cheerful, and I inquired about his mood. When he glanced up at me for an instant, I saw something in his expression which might well have been fear. But he, as I had been, was unable to express his feelings. He said he was merely tired after our journey, and suggested that we retire. Catherine paused. I had taken my tobacco pouch out and begged permission to smoke. She granted it. I dropped the dark, dry tobacco carefully into the bowl and leveled it with my thumb, lit it, and added a gray haze to the heavy air. The mist was sinking low now, and the sky was lightening. Clouds hung like sheepskins against an El Greco heaven. I had been given a separate room, she said. I did not wish a room apart from my husband, but modesty is a powerful restraining force. I found it impossible to speak of such desires. Do not know how it is that I am able to speak thus to you, sir. I am a doctor. A curious sort of doctor, I imagine, to listen to events as if they were symptoms. There are certain new methods. She raised her slender hand. No matter. It is nothing to me. But I am speaking. Shall I continue? I nodded the pipe in my teeth. That first night Charles slept in my room, and all was well but for the nagging memory of my feelings. But in the morning, alone at my toilet, I once again experienced that dread chill. It enveloped me. 
It was much greater than it had been in the carriage, and different. It did not seem to originate from within, but to be an external circumstance. It was as if the atmosphere were closing in to crush and freeze my body. For long and terrible moments I was helpless in the grasp of this sensation. I could neither move nor speak, but I determined to struggle against it, told myself it was an irrational foreboding, nothing more. I forced myself. It took great effort, sir. I forced myself to rise from the table and move to the window, willing my limbs to obey, my muscles to function, as one moves through deep water. Feeling as if I would soon suffocate, I threw open the window and stood, gasping for air. Gradually the feeling began to subside. I could feel it, a physical thing, being drawn from me towards the window. The cocoon of cold slipped from my flesh, the curtains quivered, and then I was left trembling, gazing out across the bleak moors. I concentrated on the view to keep my mind from other tracks. They were, they are, beautiful, stark and hard and lonely, but tranquil and peaceful as well. A sense of eternity is engraved in the rugged contours. Some of this peace reached out for me, and I determined that I would grow to love this land as much as did my husband, hung suspended in the balance between this desire and the fear of of whatever caused my fear. Ah, but this is meaningless to you, to one who has not experienced the sensation. No, not meaningless. Somewhere there is a key, if we can find it, a Rosetta stone to unlock the mystery, to decipher the language of the mind. It is not within my mind, sir. I chose not to comment on this point at the moment. I wished her to continue, but she stood up, drawing her cloak around her, and the wind tossed her golden hair in wild disarray. Come, let us walk, she said. I nodded. I wish to show you the place where I walked that morning, my first morning at Fengriffin House, where I strolled in solitude, attempting to let the peacefulness seep into me, determined to be at ease and grow accustomed to my new home. I followed her around the fallen tree. An ill-advised attempt, she said. We followed an almost non-existent path, overgrown and broken, which wound from the gardens across a field of gorse and heather and thorn. I walked slightly behind Catherine. She had a determined stride, an erect carriage, and moved rather more quickly than is normal for a woman in her condition. The mist had been torn now, scattered and drawn to the sky, and the clouds were increasing and darkening, dividing and joining, drawing slender and then breaking apart like monocellular creatures in an act of reproduction. And they were reproducing. The sky had become overcast. Only a few wedges of blue were visible, and the gaps were closing. I wondered vaguely how Jacob's joints were reacting. The field ended in a ragged line of trees, the limbs and trunks tortured into grotesque angles by the wind, and the ground beneath mottled with filtered sunlight. Catherine headed for this woodland. The ground was more broken here, and I moved to her side and offered my arm, but she did not take notice. She moved directly into the trees. Large rocks were entangled in the roots on either side, but Catherine followed a narrow opening, passing through shadows and shafts of light, certain of her bearings. Suddenly she stopped, gesturing with one hand. I moved past her, and found myself in a graveyard. It startled me for some reason. Catherine was staring at me, smiling. It was not a pleasant smile, and her hand was still extended in the gesture towards the tombstones. These slabs of granite and marble were sunken into the earth, ancient and discolored as the decaying teeth of dragons. They seemed to signify rot and corruption. They were not well cared for, and there was no apparent order in the arrangement of the graves. Gravity and time were working their ways upon this place. This is where my walk brought me, Catherine said. I sought peace and tranquility, and fate guided me to these forsaken tombs. 
this place of memory and sadness, where my husband's ancestors are interred, and where some day my earthly remains will be left to moulder. Not a pleasant thought, Doctor. Not the conversation you might expect from a young woman with child. But I have no fear of death now. Would welcome it if it truly brings oblivion. At that time I did not have such thoughts. I saw it as an omen, however. It frightened me, and yet something kept me from fleeing. I wandered among these odious monuments to Thanatos, as though my steps were preordained. I glanced at the stones, but moved on. As Catherine spoke, she advanced into the graveyard. See, here is the grave of Charles' father. It is quite recent. The stone has not yet sunk into the earth. The coffin will still be intact. Perhaps the corpse will not yet have rotted. Perhaps shards of flesh will still drip from the bones. How long does corruption take, Doctor? Despite the grisly aspects of her subject, her voice was detached and calm. She continued to move past the headstones. I noticed how deeply her stout walking shoes pressed into the dark earth had a ghastly image of some force drawing her down towards the graves, reaching up through the earth to grasp at her ankles. Or was the force above, pressing down upon her sagging shoulders? I wished to persuade her to leave this morbid place, and strode after her. Suddenly she halted. And here is the sepulchre of Charles' grandfather, she said, the monument remaining to a man who governed and ruled, and— it is no more than rough-cut stone, you see, not the only thing he left to his ancestors. It was an arched slab of granite, set with a brass plate. The weeds had begun to overgrow the stone, but the inscription was still decipherable. Henry Fengriffin had lived to a ripe age, and the rectangular outline of the grave had settled at a lower level than the surrounding soil, seemed darker within the boundaries. Catherine stepped directly onto this lowered patch and passed her hand across the dome of the tombstone. Her face contorted with an expression of loathing, an expression far too intense to signify hatred or fear, but rather as her countenance might have reacted had she been looking at the contents of the opened crypt itself. I stared at her, fascinated, remembering that it was Henry Fengriffin's portrait that had met with an accident. Catherine, I said softly. She did not notice my voice. She turned and leaned against the stone, and the black earth oozed at her feet. Something drew me to this very tombstone, she said. I knew nothing of the legend then, and yet I passed the others with scarcely a glance, directed to this particular grave by some magnetism of the senses. Everything was clouded. I saw only the stone. Around it the world was hazy, but this rock stood out, illuminated in my vision. I approached from this side. Her calm was gone now. Her eyes were wide, turned towards me, but not seeing me. Suddenly, from behind the tombstone, a face rushed up at me, a hideous face with hollow eyes and a red smear running upwards from the corner of the mouth to the cheekbone, a smear the color of blood as though he had been tearing into raw flesh. I staggered back and cried out. Never have I known such horror. I did not believe it a human form, thought it some fiend, perhaps some ghoul feeding upon the corpses. I tried to rip my eyes from this manifestation of evil, but they were held rigid in their sockets, wished to escape into unconsciousness, but could not faint, wished to scream, but found my vocal cords bound in a knot. This face turned upon me. The eyes glowed from the shadows, the mouth twisted in a leer, showing blackened teeth, teeth like those tombstones, wide-spaced and rotting. For an eternity we looked at one another, and then abruptly he had vanished into the trees. His figure was tall and gaunt, swathed in rags of fur and leather. I could hear his passage through the undergrowth. Then all was silent. I was unable to move. I was petrified. Time had no meaning. Even my heart was frozen. I stood that way for God knows how long. 
and then suddenly my reflexes returned, my muscles melted into obedience, and I fled back to the house. From that moment, all hopes of ever finding peace at this place were shattered. I left the mortal remains of my hopes to molder in this graveyard. Catherine laughed. Despite myself, I looked at the trees behind the stone. She saw my glance and laughed harder, leaned back until she was actually seated upon the headstone. Well, doctor, what does your learning tell us? This apparition, I began. Oh, it was no apparition. The creature exists. It is even human, one supposes. You know this? She nodded. I have seen it since, she said. Then surely it is some wretched man dwelling in these woods. A poacher, perhaps. A hermit. But, doctor, you assume too quickly. Often I have found doctors are prone to that blunder. But I knew it was real, even then. When I reached the house, I went to my room and lay for several hours in cold dread. Eventually I summoned my strength and went downstairs. Charles was in the library. I told him what had happened, and watched his jaws tighten, watched the skin grow white across his cheekbones. I asked if he knew who the creature was, and at first he did not reply. I could read his thoughts, knew he was trying to decide what to tell me. Finally he said that the man was gamekeeper, and that I need not be afraid. Yet even as he said this, I could see the fear which enveloped him. I sat beside him and took his hand, found it cold, but he would tell me no more. A woman of curious disposition I have always been, but it was far more than curious speculation which drove me to discover the secret of this mysterious and hideous man. I sensed that in some way he was inextricably bound to my fate. I summoned Mrs. Loon to my room. That good woman arrived, and I managed to assume an appearance of calm and keep emotion from my voice. I merely mentioned that I had seen this man on my walk, and asked if she had any idea who he might be. At the moment I described the red mark on his face, Mrs. Loon's kind, solid face dissolved. She was near to tears. She said she would rather not speak of it. I insisted, forcing sternness and annoyance which I did not feel, to enter my voice. A woodsman, Mrs. Loon said. But who is he? Is he a servant? She shook her head and muttered something to herself. Then why is he on my husband's lands? I demanded. Mrs. Loon's shoulders quivered. I asked the question again, crossly, wishing in no way to cause her anxiety or pain, but feeling that I must know the truth. She said, I don't rightly know. Really, I don't. I've heard tell as he's inherited the right to live in the woods, in a cabin, where his father lived before. But why should this be? Mrs. Loon wrung her hands together, said, Some injustice in the past. I've heard it spoken of. Something that the master's grandfather did, which wasn't, which hadn't ought to have been done. And then he wrote it in his will, that they had the right to live on these lands always. What was this injustice? I can't say, madam. Come, tell me. I cannot. I don't know. God help me, I don't. Please, madam. That's all as I've heard whispered. And despite both coaxing and threatening, I could learn nothing more from Mrs. Loon. She seems a superstitious woman, I said. Surely you have not let such talk disturb you. These folk believe in legends and tales. Catherine shook her head. Disturbed, she said. Yes, it disturbed me. But here again you do not know. I was determined to know what this legend was. I had to know. I dismissed Loon, much to her relief, and pondered over what little I knew. Decided that I would ask Charles when he came to my room that night. More than ask, I intended to demand the truth. It was compulsive. I had to know how this legend and that odious creature affected me. 
I believed that, with knowledge, I would be able to defend myself against this influx of dread and fear, this feeling of absolute despair. I still feel that, had I been forewarned, no, that is untrue. It was already too late. The wind was rising with the sun. It toyed with the gnarled trees and shifted the slender shadows along the aging monoliths. Somewhere distant a small animal scurried through the undergrowth, and a solitary bird was describing an arc high above. Perhaps the rodent scurried because it too saw this gliding hunger against the clouds. I noticed these things, for I had succeeded in standing my emotions aside, listening to Catherine objectively so that external events and appearances were magnified in my perception, so that my senses rushed in to fill the void where emotion should have reigned. I was aware of her voice, not in relation to my sensations, but played against a natural background. The heavy scent of rich earth, mingling with the heavy air, the flickering play of light and shade, the ponderous motion of laden clouds, all these assumed a reality beyond the natural, and formed the set upon which Catherine's monologue was enacted. Charles did not come to my room, she said. I have found that when my husband is disturbed or worried, he seeks physical effort. He has always been that way. I expect it is a good way to be. He drives his body to fatigue and releases his mind. Well, he was disturbed that day. He spent the afternoon and early evening riding with the hounds, following a mad course at breakneck speed and allowing no moments for thought. I waited for him to return. Several times I saw him in the distance, leaping the stiles or thundering at full gallop across the fields. When he returned, the horse was lathered to a frenzy, and Charles was exhausted. He trifled with dinner and then retired to his own room. I was forced to do the same, and lay tossing restlessly in my own bed. I was disappointed and impatient, but hardly angry. I am a passionate woman, but not irrational. My passion is not aroused before my husband expresses desire, and such were my sleepless thoughts that it was not passion which caused me to wish my husband were at my side. I speak of desire because... Well, because... Because... Catherine shrugged. It is a basic function of mankind, I said. It is more than that. Never mind. Let me continue. I could not help but wonder at the significance of this reference to physical need, but chose not to press the issue. She was talking freely, and I did not dare tempt her mind from the track. Inevitably my thoughts turned to the woodsman. I saw his face haunting me. I closed my eyes and found the vision even stronger when trapped behind the lids. All the details were there, more graphic in my mind than when I had actually looked at him in the flesh. Once again I saw that frightful visage rise up from behind the tombstone, saw that birthmark so much like blood from a grisly feast, those blasted and shattered stumps within his mouth, and the inhuman eyes turned towards me. I could not drive the image from my feverish brain. I could think of nothing else. For hours I lay there, drenched with cold perspiration, and staring at the ceiling while seeing the woodsman. At long last I felt sleep begin to creep over me. I tried to accept it. My mind dimmed, then snapped awake once more. Objects in the room seemed to draw towards me, swelling out of all proportion, and then recede into darkness. Gradually I sank into a state of torpor. The mind can bear just so much turmoil, and then it erects the protective barrier of insensibility. Values cease to have meaning. Indifferent slumber stands sentry over sanity. And then it came. It was the same feeling I had felt in the morning, but magnified a hundred times. It was far more than a rushing of air, a closing of the atmosphere. There was a sound at the window. The curtains billowed inwards, and then the thing raged within the room, swirling in the corners, blindly seeking and assembling. It gathered above my bed. It descended upon me, a touch of air so heavy and so cold that it had substance. It wrapped itself about my body like a living thing, 
holding my limbs motionless and piercing my breast until my heart itself was impaled. I could not move. I could not cry out. My eyes were open wide. I was fully awake, but totally helpless in this supernatural grip. I cannot say how long I endured this frozen embrace. It seemed hours, perhaps it was minutes, but for this time I was captive, a prisoner of forces beyond comprehension. And then, finally, it seeped from me. I could feel the pressure lessen, the chill grow faint, the rushing sound abate gradually until it was gone, and I screamed. I screamed again and again, mad with terror and awakening the household. I was no longer held fast, and yet I could not move. My own fear had taken over the function of deadening my limbs. Charles was the first to enter. He stood in the doorway, wild-eyed, his hair disheveled, holding a pistol. His noble head swung from side to side as he sought a target. Mrs. Loon appeared behind him, one hand clasped at her throat. Her throat writhed like a snake beneath her fingers. The curse! The curse! she babbled over and over, until Charles pushed her roughly aside and closed the door. He came to the bed, attempting to conceal the pistol beneath his dressing gown, and sat beside me, took my hand and looked into my eyes. I knew how much effort was necessary for him to appear calm. He stroked my hair and spoke softly, and I told him of what had occurred my words falling out in mad confusion and disorder. He attempted to quiet me, told me I must have been dreaming, while I clung to him and begged him not to leave me alone. Eventually I managed to gain some semblance of control, more for Charles' sake than my own. All peace of mind had fled from me forever in those timeless moments, in the grasp of intangible talons. I let him believe he had convinced me, let him think— it had been a nightmare. And yet, even then, we both knew better. Catherine pressed her toe into the damp earth, leaving a sharp impression at which she gazed with interest. And yet, I said, and my voice stumbled at some obstacle in my mouth, and yet it must have been a dream. Catherine raised a look of disdain and scorn. A dream caused by your disturbed and feverish state of mind. Of course, she said, a dream. Can you cure me of a dream, man of science? If we can find the root of the dream, dreams may appear reality. The line of demarcation is fine, and when the mind is intoxicated with emotion. But it was no dream, she said. It was real. That was the first time, but not the only time. Many times since have I felt that frozen touch. And one time, Charles came again to my room. But no matter. She leaned toward me. I am wrong to mock your ignorance, she said. I know you wish to help me. But I know, too, that you cannot help me. No living man can. Her eyes burned, windows on the inferno which was melting her mind. One more thing I will tell you, she said. I waited. The next day I went into the woods and sought out the woodsman. Yes, I went alone into the middle of the forest, and I sought that base mockery of all that is human. Sought him and found him. She grimaced. I regarded her incredulously, appalled. It was not courage or bravery, she said. I had no choice. It was compulsion. I went alone and unarmed along the overgrown trail without the slightest doubt in my mind that I would find him. It was certainty. I walked straight to his wretched hovel without a single mistake, although I had never been in those woods before, and there were many trails intersecting. He lived in the middle, where it is thickest and darkest. I came to a clearing, and there was the man's cabin. I stood in the trees for perhaps half an hour, gazing at the ill-kept structure. 
It did not appear real, far less real than the experience you believe to be a dream. I felt no fear at this point. My legs rebelled, and for a time refused to carry me forwards, but my mind felt nothing of this. And at length I walked into the clearing and approached the door. It was open. The woodsman was within, crouched over a filthy pot suspended over the fire. His brutish dog was beside him. Both man and beast looked at me, and neither appeared surprised at my appearance in the doorway. The dog raised his lip, but made no sound. The man did not speak. His demeanor was not so repulsive, somehow, in his own foul den. I felt something akin to pity. I told him I wished to speak with him. He did not reply, lifted a wooden spoon and stirred the odious contents of his pot. I entered and stood beside him. The contents of the pot bubbled and cast fetid fumes from the greasy surface. Foul odors rose, too, from his unwashed body and filthy rags. I felt nauseous and dizzy, but determined. I sat, actually sat, upon the bare floor beside him, and asked him of the legend. It seems impossible, and yet at the time it was natural. It was necessary. He seemed to debate if such a mind is capable of abstract thought, and then, still turning the spoon sluggishly through his ghastly stew, he began to speak. He told me, in coarse language and crude accents, of the legend and the curse. Catherine lowered her voice but raised her eyes. And there I came to know my fate. A long silence, a silence befitting our sepulchral surroundings, followed these words. No animals darted through the undergrowth now. The bird of prey had dropped towards the horizon and taken the sound of the wind with him. It was so still that I fancied I might be able to hear the vermicular scavengers which, bloated and gorged, performed their necrophagous task beneath our feet. I shuddered at the thought. Catherine continued to stare at me, judging my reaction. And the legend, I whispered. She shook her head. Of that I will say no more. It faults my husband's ancestors and makes a jest of innocence. It is a tale of flagitiousness which I cannot repeat. She rose from the tombstone, and the wind returned suddenly to gather her golden hair and pluck at her cloak. I am tired now. I have said enough. I will walk back with you. As you wish. She turned. For an instant I believed she intended to address the tombstone or the grave, but then she turned once more and brushed past me. She walked quickly. I overtook her, and once again she ignored my arm. We passed through the trees and out into the open field. The stables were at the far end, and the house towered above and beyond. Catherine headed towards the house, paralleling the gardens by this direct route. Fengriffin appeared, walking towards the stables, but if he noticed us he gave no sign. He walked with a preoccupied air. Catherine glanced at him, then looked away. Well, have I incriminated myself? she asked. I don't understand. She turned, stopping so abruptly that we nearly collided, gripped my arm and looked intensely and searchingly into my face. Am I mad? she asked. It was rhetorical. Catherine did not think so. And I knew not what to think. I went up to my room, but the moment the door was closed behind me I was taken with a restlessness, an urge to action or motion. I filled one of my briars and tried to channel this feeling into contemplation, to piece together what I had learned and discover, in theory at least, how a dream and a rustic woodsman and a legend of wickedness could combine to the sum of Catherine's disturbed state, could result in loss of love for her husband, who seemed in no way responsible. 
but the evidence was not sufficient, and I felt positive that I had not been given all the relevant details by either Fen Griffin or his wife. This is a grave difficulty in my profession, for people place hope without placing trust, and despite my efforts I was unable to forge my restlessness into rational force. I stood up and wandered to the window. The next logical step, I believed, was to discover what this legend consisted of. It had obviously affected Catherine tragically, although it was impossible to know whether that effect had been due to the content of the legend itself or to the particular method by which it had been revealed to her. From my window, looking past the far wing of the house, I could see the stables. Fen Griffin was still there, talking to the groom and I contemplated asking him what this legend was. And yet he denied belief in superstition, dismissed such things with impatience, and would not understand how a thing need not be true to be valid. If he were to reveal the legend to me, it would surely be modified by his own beliefs, and would scarcely be the same tale that Catherine had heard. For that I would need, at the very least, objectivity. And who, involved in this, could be objective? and at best, the woodsman. I glanced up at the sky, wondering if the impending storm would hold off long enough for a visit to that hovel in the woods, perhaps hoping for black and swollen clouds, for I did not relish the thought. I had to scoff at my own timidity, to tell myself that Catherine had ventured there before me, alone and unprotected, and in the final stages of pregnancy. I turned my gaze towards those woods. The sky was low with unbroken clouds, but I refused to allow myself that excuse. It was in the woods. I must seek the clue. I donned a heavy cape of Scottish wool and changed my light stick for a heavy cudgel which I had purchased in the Swiss Alps. As my hand closed upon the thick shaft, I felt a touch of irony in the fact that a man of science should take heart and comfort from a length of carved hardwood. Yet such is man— and to say that a man knows himself is to say that he has looked into a bottomless chasm and claimed discovery. Fen Griffin was watching while the groom saddled his horse. He was immaculate in finely tailored riding clothing, absent-mindedly slapping his crop against a gleaming boot. My path took me past the stables, and I paused. He walked towards me, still snapping the crop. You have spoken with my wife? Yes, we talked. Have you learned anything? Things, yes. It is necessary to connect them. To separate the truth from the absurdities, you mean? No, that is not what I meant. He looked speculatively at me. Then you have nothing to report? Not as yet. I see. Well. And where are you going now? A walk. I often walk while I think. Will you ride with me instead? I think not. A solitary stroll is more conducive to contemplation. As you wish. I started to turn away. I expect Catherine told you a great deal of nonsense. I turned back without replying. I mean to say, you cannot take all she says these days at face value. I will make the evaluations, I told him. For a moment I thought he was going to make a sharp rejoinder. Then he shrugged rather elegantly. Of course, he said. I crossed the field on a tangent to the course Catherine had led me over earlier, coming to the trees somewhat to the south of the graveyard. When I was in the shadows and paused and looked back, Finn Griffin was watching me. I had the impression that he had watched me all the time it took to traverse the rolling ground. It was hard to be sure at that distance, but he appeared to be scowling. The groom was behind him, holding the horse patiently. Fen Griffin turned away then and swung gracefully into the saddle. The horse took two steps sideways, rearing slightly, and then they were off at the gallop. The groom looked after them, scratching his unruly hair and pushing his cloth cap to the back of his head. He waited until Fen Griffin had turned his mount sharply around the side of the house, and then moved into the darkness of the stables. And I moved into the woods.
The wood, although wild and overgrown, was not large. I anticipated little difficulty in locating the woodsman's dwelling. There were numerous trails, slender paths, where the growth had been beaten down by the passage of animals, and I followed the largest of these. Occasionally I looked up through the twisted limbs, judged the position of the sun by the brightness of the clouds, and thus attempted to keep some semblance of direction. The deeper I penetrated into this forest, the thicker the trees became, and the lower limbs caught at my shoulders and hindered my progress considerably. These trees were somewhat protected from the bellowing wind, and were formed more symmetrically than the twisted arbors of the periphery, stood taller as they contested with their neighbors for the favors of the sun. It was a contest for survival, and one which all had not won, for withered dwarfs, lifeless and dry, clung to their neighbors, wrapping tormented roots and boughs tenaciously about the healthy bowls, drawn to the flowing sap, arboreal mendicants in a kingdom which gave no alms. Several times I was forced to squeeze past these misshapen forms where they leaned over the path, and once a dead limb cracked sharply at a slight pressure from my elbow. It was not difficult to think of this forest as a physical manifestation of twisted mind, and I have trod through mental labyrinths just as I wandered through those trees, seeking the darkest spot in the deepest and most secretive seclusion. The earth became damper, almost swampy. The mud sucked at my boots, reluctant to release my feet. It became exceedingly unpleasant, and in annoyance I used my stick to batter at the tenacious creepers and vines. Caught myself doing this and chuckled at such unguided rage, paused to light a pipe and allow my nerves to relax. Then I pressed on more slowly through the Fuscus forest, and came abruptly upon the cabin. It was a structure of rough grey stone and splintered wood, badly in need of repair. A thin ribbon of smoke arose from the jagged chimney, coiling straight upwards for a few feet, and then, taken by the wind, was torn to shreds. I stared at the hovel for some moments before I became aware of the woodsman. He was seated in front of the door, directly in my line of vision, yet so well was his figure suited to the surroundings that I had failed to notice him until he moved. He raised his head and regarded me. His countenance was terrible to behold. The birthmark, for such the blood image proved to be, stretched in a wedge of vascular tissue from the corner of his mouth to his temple, and his greasy hair fell in matted twists over his brow. I was repulsed by his appearance, and yet his features were not without intelligence. Not the intelligence of civilized man, but the animal wile and suspicion of one who lives alone with nature. He did not move at my approach, but his mouth opened, the long wolfish jaw dropping to reveal tobacco-stained teeth. Beside him an object which I had taken to be a pile of rags stirred. It proved to be his dog, a mangy creature of skin and bone, and this brute regarded me in exactly the same manner as his master. I moved to within a few feet of this bestial pair, and leaned on my stick. I wish to have a word with you, I said. He nodded. The dog moved towards him, slinking, and he placed a gnarled hand on its neck. Will you grant me a few moments? He blinked. Perhaps he was unaccustomed to a civil approach, or perhaps unused to human relations in any form. I have not done nothing, he said. I did not imply that you had. His discolored fingers moved nervously through the animal's stiff pelt. This here be my home, he said. He nodded his head, as though affirming the words to himself. Ain't no one as can deny me my land. I can't be sent from here. He slowly closed one eye and cocked his head so that the cords stood out in his stringy neck. It's all written out proper. I have no wish to send you away, my good man. Did ye come from the manor, then? I nodded. From Fen Griffin? I nodded again. He turned to the dog, made a curious sound deep in his throat, whereupon the brute lifted a ragged ear. The dog's teeth were every bit as foul as the man's. 
I am a doctor, I said. Something akin to interest sparked in his eyes. The mistress will be poorly, then? he asked. I ignored the query, said, I understand that the mistress spoke with you some time ago. Oh, aye. I would like to know what you spoke of. He shook his head. His expression was sullen and stubborn, but modified. It was as if he took pleasure from the mood. Will you tell me? Nay. But why not? Ain't no reason I got to. This here be my home. No reason to talk, less I like. But surely there can be no harm in it. He shook his head again. I contemplated offering this wretched creature money, but decided against it. Felt certain that he could be bribed into speaking, but that what he said would lose all validity if he spoke purely for emolument, that he would tell me anything that came into his dubious mind and take some perverse pleasure in the deceit. And yet you spoke willingly enough to the mistress. Not the same, not the same at all. I had to tell the mistress as I did. Had to? Was a duty. But you won't tell me. No reason. I stared at him, trying to trace the meanderings of his thought process, wondered if his refusal was merely a characteristic perversity or something more motivated. I said, The mistress is ill. I believe you may be able to assist in curing her by revealing what your conversation was concerned with. He looked incredulous. His odious face registered amazement for an instant, and then pleasure. Cure her? he asked. Cure her? And he laughed. His laughter was fiendish and inhuman. It seemed impossible that such sound could be formed on living vocal cords, resonated in a human skull. It vibrated and undulated, and then broke off in a fit of coughing which racked his emaciated form. He spat upon the ground and peered at this mucoid blob with interest, studied it as some arcane sorcerer seeking knowledge in the entrails of a sacrifice. I shuddered with revulsion. When he looked up again, no trace of amusement marked the passage of his laughter. Then, without another word, he rose and entered his hovel. The dog crept after him, slinking like a reptile, and the door swung closed on broken hinges. I was left standing alone, my hands clenching on my stick. From within came a repetition of that hideous laughter. Once more it ended with uncontrolled coughing. I was filled with a mad and irrational desire to bring my cudgel violently against the man's gruesome mouth, to still that abominable sound. And what use would that have been? Was I, too, sinking into the strange mood which tormented this estate? Or was my loathing for this creature directed by some instinct deeper than the rational, some fear passed down through the eons of time which recognize pure evil and cause a physical reaction, some racial memory long forgotten in the conscious mind, lying dormant until an hour of need? I turned and plunged into the forest, too tense for proper consideration. It was not difficult to imagine the effect the woodsman had had on Catherine, both at his sudden appearance in the graveyard and on her visit to his dwelling. Indeed, I found it hard to keep his image from springing into my own mind in all the odious detail, and it had obviously been far more terrible for her, with her mind already stimulated by fear and resting precariously on the balance of sanity. What was more difficult was judging why he had been reluctant to speak to me, had, in fact, displayed all the overt signs of a guilty conscience. Did he, in fact, have some dark secret to conceal, or was his silent suspicion no more than a constant state of mind? I could not decide with any sense of certainty. But one thing I did decide. I was determined to know the legend. In the morning I asked Fengriffin if I might have the use of a carriage for the day. Certainly, he said, but why, may I ask? I wish to go into the village. He frowned. Wouldn't your time be spent to better advantage here? I have decided it will be advisable to have a word or two with the village doctor. His frown darkened. Old Whittle? I've already informed you that 
By his own admission, he is powerless in this matter. And yet I think it might prove wise to speak to him. I must gather facts from different points of view before I can sift them together. Whittle may well have noticed symptoms which were meaningless to his frame of reference, but might be of value to me. Finn Griffin nodded, slowly. As you wish. Will you require a coachman? I will drive myself. He nodded. I'll arrange for a carriage to be readied, he said. He started to move off, then paused. Did your walk yesterday stimulate any theories? he asked, peering rather sharply at me. It's too early to judge. You went into the woods, did you not? Yes, in point of fact, I did. You didn't encounter anyone there, by any chance? Something in his tone set my senses rasping. Why do you ask? I said, carefully and casually. Oh, nothing. Some difficulty with a poacher. Nothing of importance. He turned then, his shoulders high and square. It was just an idle thought, he said. I did not press the point. I sent my card into Dr. Whittle's office, and he admitted me immediately. He was a man of considerable age and snow-white hair, but a spark of youthful interest remained in his eyes. His office was a pleasant room, tinged with the lingering odors of tobacco and coffee and books, pleasant without pretense to luxury. We shook hands. His grip was firm, and he inclined his head in a gesture which was deferential but in no way servile. I liked the man instantly, recognized qualities which would make him worthy no matter what his chosen profession. I wish to thank you for your recommendation, I told him. It is a compliment. Ah, on the contrary, he replied. It is a compliment to myself to be able to. I have read something of your studies and work, or I have been able to, in fact, my regret is that I am too advanced in years to pursue this new science myself. He offered me a seat and sat opposite, his desk between us and the window behind him. I could see the dull red gables and chimney pots of the village, and in the distance a few sheep dotted on the hill. A tranquil and pastoral view, seen across the shoulder of tranquil and practical man, and it struck me as strange that, in such a setting, I had come to seek the clue to a disrupted and tormented mind. Yes, he said, I am fascinated by these new theories and approaches. But you have come about Catherine Fengriffin, of course. I have. He spread his hands. I fear I will be unable to help you, Dr. Pope. I treated her to the best of my limited ability, without results— at the first I expected she was in the initial stages of brain fever, and recommended the usual treatment, relaxation, and fresh air. But it is far deeper than a physical disorder of the brain. The mind, perhaps, but that is not my field. And yet the mind and the body are inextricably connected. Either can affect the other. If I might ask you a few questions first concerning the general state of her health— Certainly. But as far as I can determine, her health, her physical state, is satisfactory. I have given her a thorough examination, and can find no symptom of any malady known to me. She is listless. She has no interest in life. And what may be more to the point, she does not appear to desire to regain her interest. Seems quite content to sink into torpor and lethargy. But, although I can recognize these attitudes— I can find no reason for them. He paused, frowning slightly. I have the impression, he added, that she does not find her condition a mystery, that she believes she knows what has caused this state of Laodicean indifference, and furthermore, believes it chronic and incurable. But that is only my passing impression, Doctor. I could not vouch for it. The acedia is present— but by what reason I am helpless to discover. I nodded. This much I had already discerned. If you have any specific question, he asked. Not concerning her health, no. I do, however, wish to make a certain inquiry. 
Perhaps you will know the answer. Perhaps you will be surprised at the question as well. But I believe it may have some bearing. I paused. I was suddenly almost reluctant to take this line of inquiry further. Examined my own feelings and found myself disturbed, as if I were moving into a field where I did not belong, intruding where I could do no good. This was a unique and, considering my science, an adverse mood. And yet it persisted, despite my realization, proof of the fact that more than awareness is necessary to subjugate emotion. The good doctor was waiting, obviously curious at my sudden hesitation, and I forced myself to trespass beyond the boundaries of unfounded dominions. "'Are you acquainted with the legend of Fen Griffin, doctor?' I asked. He seemed momentarily startled. His bright eyes blinked, the reaction of wise bird. The legend concerning the woodsman, I asked. Dr. Whittle nodded slowly. I believe there may be some obscure connection between this legend and her state of mind, you see, that the knowledge has affected her in some manner. She knows the tale, then? Yes. Charles asked me not to mention it in her presence. Not that I would have, of course, but perhaps he, too, saw that she might be susceptible to it. I believe so, but she has heard it. She is possessed of an imaginative mind, if not superstitious, at least fertile and able to be easily stimulated. In many ways this fecundity of consciousness is a blessing. In other ways, as in the case in point, it can be a curse. But it may well be of great help to me if I, too, know the legend. Once more he nodded. Well, it is not so much a legend, he said. It is, in fact, truth. A terrible tale, but true. I know, Doctor, for I was there. The curse certainly is nonsense, but the tale itself is nightmarish. I can fully understand how knowledge of this crime could have affected a young woman, will freely admit that it affected me to a certain extent, caused me to spend many a sleepless night as, despite my efforts to resist it, the gruesome details assumed a place in my mind. He paused and withdrew a rosewood snuff-box from his waistcoat, offered it to me, tapping the box. I partook of a pinch. Overdid it, in fact, and sneezed, but was too engrossed in this conversation to let such an impropriety bother me. He placed the box on the desk, and spent some moments squaring it with the corner, as if this regularity were of enormous importance. It was long ago, he said. He moved the box another millimeter. I was but a young man, in my first year of practice— and perhaps I would not have been so troubled had I been more experienced in the agonies of accident and illness. It is hard to say. I have never spoken of it, you see. Only speak of it now because I understand the necessity, and because you are a man of science. And yet, through all these years, the interest— Is that the word, I wonder? Are terrible things always of lasting interest? The memory, at least— persists in vivid and graphic detail. I recall the sounds and the scents and the colors which at the time were carved so deeply into my perception. I recall, too, my own emotions, indefinable because they were interwoven and mingled, but with something of horror and something of outrage and a great deal of physical nausea. Still you will want facts, not impressions. Impressions, too, may be valuable— Tell me all you can recall, both of fact and feeling. I recall everything, he said. The snuff-box was lined up perfectly with the corner of the desk now, and he suddenly tapped it with his forefinger, causing it to spin across the polished surface. It slid towards the edge, and he stopped it under his hand with a startlingly violent motion, as if he were swatting some loathsome insect. It is not a pleasant tale, he said with an understatement which did not match his expression. Then he told me the story. It was in the time of Charles' grandfather, Henry Fengriffin, he began. I was, as I have told you, in my first year of practice, 
and was called in a professional capacity just after the event. But I had better tell it in chronological order, to avoid confusion, and also because even now I find it difficult to be objective, to avoid stressing certain aspects out of proper proportion. Since that time I have had a great deal of acquaintance with violence, but this was my first involvement with the evil of which man is capable, and still I believe the most gruesome. Like a man's first love, a man's first cognition of evil remains imprinted upon his soul. Thus, it will be necessary to tell you something of Henry Fengriffin first. He was a strange man, this Fengriffin, a man of sharply changing moods, not a brooder, but a man of impetuous action and insufferable arrogance for the most part. A debauched man, I might say. And yet there was this acute definition in his attitudes, that is, he would commit some base act, and moments afterwards suffer enormous regrets and do his best to undo the damage he had done. Of course, this was not always possible. He did not seem to realize this, seemed to believe that a gift of money was all that was required to atone for debased and wicked actions. Despite his regrets, he found it constitutionally impossible to offer apology. Perhaps he never saw the faintest possibility of lowering himself in such a manner, and truly believed that money purchased absolution and respect. More likely, he did not condescend to desire respect, but merely wished to absolve himself in his own mind. Oh, he possessed virtues as well. He was extremely generous and absolutely loyal to those he had befriended, was truly admired and esteemed by all whom he had not injured, and, in justice to the man, I must say that it was far easier to be debauched in those days. Henry dearly loved to play the squire, galloping madly through the fields of his tenants and drinking heavily with his companions, journeying to the cities and seaports to wench and game and carouse with a savage abandon. I cannot imagine the depths of depravity to which he sank on these bouts of libation, nor do I care to. I know he often fell in with the foulest sort of fellow, the scum of the docks, professional pugilists, purveyors of women, and chronic tosspots, God knows what else. Perhaps he absorbed the wickedness from these wretched creatures. Perhaps his own inclinations were magnified by their presence. Perhaps he was helplessly drawn to them by the gravity of evil. I do not know if I say this in excuse for the man, or merely because it is how I remember him. And yet I also remember that he gave lavishly to the poor that he arranged many times to supply me with medicines and to pay my fees for treating the unfortunate, that he financed the renovation of the church, although he was a professed atheist, that although I was appalled at his way of life, I could not help but recognize his charm. Not an easy man to judge harshly, a man, in fact, whom I would have thought inherently good beneath his vulgar exterior, had it not been for the affair of which I am speaking. Now, Fengriffin had at that time a young gamekeeper living in a cabin in the woods. Silas, his name was. He was a local lad, and I had often seen him in the village. He seemed a pleasant youth, well set up and rather handsome, lean and powerful and attractive, despite his crude leather clothing and cloth cap, and a large and unsightly birthmark on his cheek. Not intelligent, of course surely not educated, but nonetheless a fine example of sinewy health and unspoiled nature. The young girls of his class were all attracted to him, would greet him with blushes and lowered eyes as he strode down the street. He could, I suppose, have taken his choice of any of them, and eventually, when he was perhaps twenty-five years of age, he took a bride from the village. Her name was Sarah. She was barely seventeen, a virgin of unblemished beauty and it was first love for both of them. They were married in the village, and on the wedding night Silas brought his bride back to his rustic cabin, thinking it proper to consummate the marriage in the place where they would undoubtedly have lived the rest of their natural lives in concord and happiness. Would have, I say, for this is where the foul deed occurred. 
Dr. Whittle had begun to toy with the snuff-box again, staring down at it intently, as though the rosewood were a crystal revealing the past. Henry Fengriffin heard of the wedding, and of the bride's virginal qualities. Normally that would have meant no more than a crude conversation or coarse joke with his cronies, but fate played a cruel hand at this point, for he was riotously drunk, at the tail end of a three-day binge, and alcohol had destroyed what judgment he possessed, left a vacuum to be filled by lust. He decided to view the bride, decided it was his feudal right, perhaps. His cronies were in accord, as usual, always willing to make sport. And so they mounted at the house and thundered off across the fields and into the woods, ignoring the dangers of galloping through the trees and setting the forest vibrating with their foul-mouthed shouts and raucous laughter. It seems incredible that they did not suffer at least one injury on that mad gallop, an injury which might well have proved a blessing by preventing a far worse event. But the devil guided their horses, and they arrived at the cabin. I firmly believe that at this point no harm was intended, that it was no more than a drunken jest. Who knows? At any rate, they dismounted and came to the door just as the couple were bedding. Fengriffin beat loudly upon the entrance, shouting demands for entry, and at length Silas opened the door and peered out suspiciously. "'I have come to view the bride!' Fengriffin roared. "'She is a bed, master,' Silas said. "'All the better then, my man,' said Fengriffin, and he pushed the gamekeeper roughly aside and strode into the cabin. His cohorts trailed in behind him, amidst laughter and gaiety. Several had brought bottles of wine, which they passed around, drinking from the neck and spilling the liquid down their chins and chests. You may imagine the feelings that overwhelmed poor Silas at this intrusion. His bride pulled the coarse covers up to her throat, staring in wild-eyed dismay, and her fright added to Fengriffin's pleasure. He was well acquainted with women of easy virtue, of course, but virgins were not so well known to him. He grasped the covers and pulled them roughly away, leaving the pitiful woman naked and cringing upon the cot, while Silas looked on in helpless rage and frustration. Then Griffin's companions all crowded around, joking and drinking and slapping each other on the backs. Silas was trembling violently. His eyes rolled about madly, his fists clenched, and his teeth sank into his lower lip. Some wit said— been many the year since old Fengriffin has sighted a virgin, eh, lads? And they all thought this enormously humorous. They roared with laughter, and Fengriffin determined to have his own jest. He turned to Silas and asked, Have you taken her yet? No, master. Then I claim my right to break her. No, Silas shouted, advancing. Their eyes locked. Finn Griffin swore afterwards that up to that very instant he had no intention of actually committing this act, that until then it had been no more than an amusement. I believe him in this. But he was a strange man. The moment his servant denied him the right, he felt an overpowering compulsion to take it. They stared at one another, their wills locked along the visual path. Neither would yield. The others became silent, fascinated now. If Silas had been a weak man. But he wasn't. A servant, but a man in his own right. And he placed himself between Fengriffin and the bed, his powerful arms folded across his chest. Possibly even then Fengriffin would have heeded words of reason, could have yielded to pleading. But Silas had no words of persuasion could not have spoken in such terms to his master. Fengriffin stepped forward, and Silas acted in the only way known to him, acted as a threatened animal. He seized Fengriffin by the shoulders and threw him violently to the floor. His eyes were blazing, his broad chest heaved with hatred, and he drooled from the mouth. He stood over Fengriffin in a threatening manner, and Fengriffin shouted for assistance, suddenly terrified by his servant's black rage, and thrown into a fury by the attack. His companions hesitated for an instant, 
stunned by the scene, and then they obeyed Finn Griffin's command and seized Silas. Silas struggled with preternatural strength, knocking several to the floor. I treated their wounds. I know the unbelievable extent of the damage he inflicted upon them. But they were too many, and in the end he was subdued and held securely. Held, doctor, and forced to watch while Henry Fengriffin raped his virgin bride. Whittle paused. Not a pretty tale, I said. He looked at me rather sadly. There is worse to come, he said. When Fen Griffin had had his way with her, he stepped back from the bed and bowed sardonically to his disobedient servant. With a gesture he offered the ruined bride to her husband. He was satisfied that he had justly punished the man's insubordination. Silas was still held by the others, had ceased to struggle while Fen Griffin abused his bride, but now he fought again, foaming at the mouth and uttering bestial snarls. Sarah was hysterical, sobbing and moaning, scarcely able to breathe. Her eyes rolled, and then she saw the axe which leaned against the wall, close by the bed. It was a heavy-headed tool which Silas used not only to chop wood, but to dispatch animals caught in his traps, and there was a dark stain of dried blood on the metal. She stared at this for a moment, until the import registered, and then she seized it quite suddenly and dragged it to the bed. She had not the strength left to lift it, but dragged it across the floor and then up onto the cot. Before anyone except Silas had ascertained her purpose, she drew the edge across her throat, held the head in both hands, and worked it back and forth like a blunt saw. The poor woman could not face life after her debasement, not with sanity. The men released their grip on Silas at this, not thinking of the consequences, for they were taken aback by this action they had not bargained on, had still, for all the flagitiousness of their deed, regarded it as no more than a humorous episode to be retold amidst ribald laughter at the fireside, just as they might have recalled dallying with a woman of the streets in carnal frolic, or, perhaps more to the point, remembered some particularly violent end to a hunt. They did not actually think of a gamekeeper or his wife as human beings, you see. Silas tore free of their loosened grasp and fell to his knees beside the bed. No one sought to restrain him now. Sarah was babbling incoherently as Silas gently withdrew the axe from her hands. The wound was not fatal. She hadn't the strength to press deeply enough to sever the jugular vein, but the flesh was broken and torn in a jagged line, and blood streamed down her naked body in rivulets which mingled with the previous blood of her ruination. Silas stared at her for an instant, moaning deep within his breast moaning in his very heart, which ceased to beat for that instant, and then commenced again, drumming the burden of torment through his arteries. He sprang up, his blood pounding, and spun around, swung the axe in a wide and vicious arc at Fengriffin's head. Fengriffin raised his arm to ward off the blow, and the edge caught him a glancing cut across the shoulder. He fell against the wall, and Silas stepped after him, raising the weapon to dash his brains asunder. But once again he was seized by Fen Griffin's cohorts. Once again he struggled with berserk rage, only to succumb to the weight of numbers, struggled with even greater vigor, so that they were forced to land several heavy blows to his head before he could be subdued. Fen Griffin arose, holding his shoulder. He was insane with anger. His arrogant pride could not encompass an attack of this nature, and he was aroused far beyond the bounds of convention. No matter his guilt, he could not tolerate equality. Silas, although semi-conscious, still retained a firm grip upon the axe handle with his right hand, and in that instant Fen Griffin saw what form his revenge must take. He commanded his companions to drag Silas outside. They did so as he kicked and bucked spasmodically between them. His head hung down, 
He was dazed, but still he would not yield. Finn Griffin followed, directing them to force his gamekeeper to the wood pile which stood beside the cabin. There was a chopping block beside the wood, and Finn Griffin pointed to it with a quivering finger. His friends hesitated at this, not realizing his intentions and wanting no part of murder, but Finn Griffin ranted and howled with such fierce domination that eventually they obeyed. They bent Silas to his knees before the chopping block. Finn Griffin sent one of his men to the well for a bucket of cold water, while they took off his coat and rolled up his sleeves. He was sweating, his eyes were inflamed, blood ran from the gash in his shoulder, but he ignored the pain. His rage at being wounded far outweighed the pain of the wound. The man returned with a bucket, and Finn Griffin seized it and placed it beside the chopping block. Then he gave a further command. When his companions saw he intended less than murder, they were no longer reluctant, for they were men of his temperament and inclination, and understood intolerance. Two of them grasped Silas' right arm and forced it upon the block. The wiry hand writhed like a pale squid in the moonlight. "'You have raised your hand against your master twice in this night,' roared Finn Griffin. "'It shall not happen again!' He took up the axe and positioned himself to the side of the chopping block. "'Will you beg mercy?' he demanded. Silas turned his head to the side, looked up at Finn Griffin with one eye in profile, and spat out a foul oath. "'Then take justice!' Finn Griffin said between his teeth, and he swung the axe over and down. The edge dropped across Silas' hand at the knuckles and buried itself into the wood with a dull clunk. The severed fingers flew up like splinters, spinning in the air. The index finger curled up like a wood chip, striking Silas in the face. Four separate streams of blood spewed across the chopping block. Silas' body leaped convulsively, but he made no sound. His eye was still turned upon Finn Griffin. Finn Griffin stepped back and nodded and his men thrust the dismembered hand into the bucket of icy water. Then they all moved away. Silas knelt there, his hand resting on the block now, and his right arm in the bucket. The cold liquid numbed the bloody stumps and kept the fire from rushing up his arm. He did not move, did not dare withdraw his hand from the icy anesthetic. The gentlemen stood around him, silent. They were abruptly stricken by the awareness of their fiendish crime. Finn Griffin was pale and perspiring as he slid his coat back on. Suddenly they all wished nothing more than to flee from that terrible scene. They moved, still in silence, to where their horses were tied, unfastened them, and began to mount. And then Silas moved. They all paused. Finn Griffin had one foot in the stirrup and halted, frozen in place, Looking back over his shoulder, he saw Silas' left hand began to grope like some sightless animal over the ground, watched as, one by one, Silas found his severed fingers and gathered them into his hand, and then he wrapped his left forearm around the bucket, cradling it to his chest, and his right hand, still immersed, stood up. He raised his face to Fen Griffin. The moonlight struck full upon his countenance as he drew his amputated limb from the merciful water and pointed the gory stump, a blunt and solitary finger of accusation, at Fen Griffin. The cold had stopped the rush of blood, but sluggish drops crept down his forearm and dropped heavily to the earth. The agony, as air replaced liquid on the open wound, must have been almighty, and yet no pain showed in that bleached face— and he mouthed the curse. A curse that has fathered legend, a curse which must have come from his soul, for that rustic tongue knew no words of anathema. His arm extended, he made his vow, swore that the monstrous spirit evoked in the blood of this night would know no rest until it had known vengeance, and that the next virgin bride of Fingriffin House would taste the horror of violation. His voice held them in unbreakable bonds of frozen steel. No one moved, 
Even the horses stood still as statues, showing wide white eyes. At last Silas pressed the gruesome remains of his hand back into the bucket, and turning, staggered to the cabin. The blood which had run down his arm left a trail in his wake. The moonlight plunged darkly into these drops of blood, and dark terror plunged into Finn Griffin's heart. Well, as I say, Ben Griffin was a man whose moods changed quickly, and the curse had acted as a catalyst upon his emotions. He became instantly sober and overflowing with remorse. Despite his wound, he galloped all the way to the village to summon me, burst into my rooms, demanding haste. I wished to treat his shoulder first, for it was a rather nasty gash, and I did not at that point understand what had occurred in the woods. But he would not allow treatment cursed me most foully for suggesting it, and, between his verbal abuse, told me in fragmented phrases what had transpired, phrases which were all the more vivid for being disjointed. Later I was to hear the tale in a restrained manner, and be able to piece together all the details, but at the time I received impressions rather than facts, impressions which came from his tone of voice as much as his words, from his wild eyes as much as from his broken speech, and you can imagine what those impressions were like. Ben Griffin rode back with me. We lathered our horses and sent stones clattering beneath their hooves in a mad dash such as I have never made before or since. He had inspired me with his own sense of speed, the sort of man who is capable of transmitting such emotions and desires to another. But when he had led me to the cabin he would go no farther, could not face his crime again. He turned back, and I went on through the last few trees and into the clearing. The first thing I saw was the chopping block, with the axe still buried in the surface. I turned my eyes away from this, dismounted, and entered the house. Silas was kneeling beside the bed. The bucket was on the floor beside him, and his hand was in the water. His left arm cradled his bride. As I approached, he turned his head, as on a swivel, to look at me. God knows how or why he had retained consciousness, but he had. He recognized me, seemed perfectly aware of his surroundings, rational and coherent. He had lost a great amount of blood, and the bucket was filled with shredding ribbons of congealed groom, but the water had preserved his life. Better it had not. Silas refused to let me attend his hand until I had seen to Sarah's superficial wound— "'gnashed his teeth at me like a cornered beast when I hesitated. "'She was babbling, and her eyes were clouded. "'The flesh was torn at her throat, but it was not serious, "'not that torn flesh. "'There was a far deeper wound beyond her throat, "'for her mind was gone. "'In those moments of agony and terror "'she had been reduced to a madwoman. "'Silas continued to hold her to his breast "'as I treated her injury, his fist was clenched against her shoulder. As I tilted her chin back, she slipped slightly in his arm, and as he caught at her, his hand opened, and his fingers fell out. All four severed fingers dropped into Sarah's lap, and we all looked down at them. If there had been any hope of restoring her sanity, it fled at that instant. She emitted an inhuman howl, a sound which no human should have made. Not the sound of human emotion, but a meaningless cry, the automatic response of a mind from which comprehension had ebbed. It is a sound which still vibrates in my ears, on nights of solitary silence. Vibrates from within, where it is stored, woven into the fabric of my mind. Dr. Whittle stood up and walked to the window stood looking out, his hands clasped behind his back and beneath his coat-tails. He seemed to have aged, but perhaps that was because I could no longer see the bright intelligence of his eyes. I assumed that his tale was finished, and was about to speak when he turned back to me. Well, he said, the rest is anticlimax. Silas lived, Sarah lived. Henry Fengriffin's regret knew no bounds. He wished to make restitution, but Silas would accept nothing, refused money and food and wine, 
all the material possessions with which Fengriffin settled his debts. This drove frustration through Fengriffin, a spit of helplessness on which he revolved over the fire of guilt. He became desperate to atone for his crime, in his own eyes, of course. But when he sent wine, it was poured into the ground. When he sent food, it was left to the wild animals, or to decay. When he sent money, it was scattered among the trees— for Silas believed that retribution would come in a different manner. He continued to live in the cabin, tearing a meager existence from the woods and nursing his wife. She had become, from a beautiful and healthy young bride, a thing of horror, with scarred throat, a hag in rags, frothing at the mouth and wild of eye, thin as a skeleton, with long talons and filthy habits, an odious mockery of woman. Several times she ran away, or perhaps wandered off, and Silas was forced to search for her on the moors and bring her back by force. And still he loved her. He seemed to realize that her insanity had no bearing on justice, and continued to cohabit with her as a husband. Eventually, years after, I was astounded to hear that she had given birth to a son. I ventured to the cabin, or I must confess through curiosity than duty. The child was a robust enough lad, but marred by the hereditary birthmark which Silas possessed, larger than Silas and more hideous, like a web of blood. Sarah had become the most wretched creature imaginable, scarcely human, a grotesque caricature of a Madonna, clutching the squalling infant to her sunken torso. Silas, too, seemed to have become somewhat deranged was far more incoherent than his rough accent warranted. But with great effort I came to understand that he had at last accepted a gift from Fengriffin, for Henry had never desisted in his efforts, and upon hearing of the child's birth he saw his opportunity to present a gift which Silas could neither return nor refuse. He had never assumed that Silas would have children, quite naturally, because of Sarah's condition. Now that it was an accomplished fact, he made a small alteration in his will, small enough, you will think, to the effect that Silas and his descendants were granted the eternal right to reside in the woodlands of the Fengriffin estates. He had probably expected Silas to refuse this right, in theory, while remaining there in fact, since there was nowhere else for him to go, and that the true value of his recompense would go in time to the child. However, such was not the case— Silas seemed inordinately pleased with the rights granted to his child. At first I took this as a sign that his hatred had lessened over the years, or else that he had let the past slop in his senile brain until the importance diminished, for he had refused gifts of far greater value. Such, however, was not the case. While he was telling me of this, he took the child upon his lap and let it make a plaything of the gnarled stump of his hand, the child began to laugh with glee as its tiny fingers explored the grottos and crevices of that gruesome toy, and Silas' eyes lighted with fatherly pride, and with something more, upon his offspring. He was pleased, you see, because he knew his son would be able to remain there, and to witness the revenge. And so it would appear he has. Dr. Whittle raised his eyebrows. Silas Child, then, is the woodsman who dwells there now? He is. Both Sarah and Silas lived well into old age, lived long past self-sufficiency, and depended on the child to feed them, while all the time, over all those years, Silas instilled the rotten seeds of hatred into the boy, warping his mind until he knew only visions of vengeance. They died within a few weeks of one another, some few years past now but the sun has remained. This explains a great deal, Doctor, I told him. Will it be of value? I hope so. It is obviously the root of the damage, and must be ploughed from her mind. I stood up, extending my hand. You were most kind to afford me so much of your time, I said. Perhaps we shall meet again. If you are staying at the house, he said, Ah, of course, you will deliver the child. 
Yes, as I have most children in the village during these long years. When is the child due? Oh, quite soon. Within the week, perhaps. I nodded thoughtfully. Whittle was a man in whom one could place the utmost confidence, and I said, I have an idea that the birth may well prove a turning point, that the cares of motherhood and child love may bring her mind back from the dark course it has taken. It will leave her less time to brood. We are men of science, Doctor. We do not countenance the power of the supernatural. But Catherine Fengriffin is a woman, and by believing in the curse, she has given that curse a power to affect her, has invested power in a non-existent concept, you see. Then let us pray that the new interests of motherhood will dull that power, Whittle said. Yes, I said, but I had long since subjugated prayer to insight. Still, one hopes. I drove slowly back from the village, pondering upon Henry Fengriffin's crime in relation to Catherine, trying to superimpose my mind upon hers and understand what the full effect had been when, in those distasteful surroundings, she had heard the tale from the child of Silas and Sarah, the child who had been sired and reared with but one purpose in mind, guided toward one goal, instructed only in the one dual emotion, hatred and revenge. Even Dr. Whittle, who had not been involved directly, had found it impossible to be objective while recalling the events of that terrible night. How much more frightful had the telling been, as the words fell from the woodsman's lips, as Catherine looked into those brutish features, and watched the twitchings of that mobile birthmark which ran from his lips. And yet, realizing how disturbed and troubled she must have been, had the tale been enough in itself to force her to her present condition? Was she irrational enough to blame her husband for the sins of his forebear? Or was there something more, something that Dr. Whittle did not know? It seemed likely. Catherine did not have the symptoms of one whose mind had snapped under stress and emotion. She was still aware of the proper proportion of her life, and even if she believed the curse and lived in constant terror, awaiting God knows what frightful vengeance, that alone would not account for her negative reaction, might have caused a positive state of nervous fear, but not her decline into resigned indifference. I was baffled by this paradox, and felt certain that some essential fact had eluded me, or been deliberately kept from me. My first task, then, was to discover the truth. I left the carriage at the stables. The stable lad was looking up at the dark clouds, his young face creased prematurely with his frown. "'Will it rain in the night?' I asked. "'Well, I've never known it to hold off so long once that the clouds are black as this,' he said, waving his greasy cap at the ominous heavens. It's right peculiar. Old Jacob says twon't come down till morrow, though. Never know old Jacob be wrong nor neither. Right peculiar. Makes a fellow wonder what's a-waitin' for. I smiled at this personification of the impending storm. The lad jammed his cap back on, pulling it well down so that a few strands of matted hair stuck out at right angles from beneath the band. He began to unfasten the harness with the deft motions of experience, still glancing upwards, suspicious of those looming clouds. Don't much fancy weather of this sort, neither, he said. With the sky low and the air all heavy and wet-like, sort of the same as being in a cell and not having air to breathe proper. Ain't right, somehow. Makes the horses fussy and all. Whilst they's being groomed, ye can feel em all shaky under your hands, and all the night ye can hear em a-pawin' at the ground and snortin' like pigs. Horses got plenty of sense, mostly. Ain't very long on wits, horses, but they has plenty of cunning. They can tell when t'weather ain't as it ought to be. He started to say something more, then clamped his mouth shut and shrugged, rather embarrassed at having spoken at such length, or perhaps at having voiced an opinion. He grinned foolishly and turned away. I walked on to the house. Catherine did not dine with us that evening. She was staying in bed as her time drew near. Neither Fengriffin nor I had much appetite, and the meal was quick and quiet. We adjourned to the library, and after coffee had been brought in and Jacob had departed, I told Fen Griffin that I knew of the curse. 
His eyes were sardonic as he depreciated my remark with a quick gesture of intolerance. This annoyed me, and I gestured in turn, causing his aristocratic eyebrows to lift in surprise. What is a curse? he said. He leaned towards me, his brow furrowed in chevrons of irritation. Words no more. Superstition. Balderdash. I did not summon a priest to exercise my home. I summoned a doctor. It is a doctor to whom you speak, sir. But in all truth— It is not a matter of truth, but of belief. If your wife believes in this curse, what does truth matter? The mind is capable of conjuring its own truths. You mystify me, doctor. Ah, but it is you who have added to the mystery. You have not revealed all that you know. Perhaps you have told me all you deem relevant, but you are wrong in your selections. You knew that your wife visited the woodsman. His frown shifted crosswise, corrugating his forehead, and his face darkened. I know that she compromised herself by going alone to his hovel, yes. That is the wrong of it, not some absurd vow of revenge. You judge her harshly. But with justice! Ah, yes, the Fengriffin justice. The justice your grandfather inflicted upon his gamekeeper. His eye glowed, and for a moment I thought he was about to strike me. His hands clenched on the arms of the chair, and his frame tensed and trembled. I leaned towards him, ready for what action he might take. My anger at that moment was as great as his. We were both on the edges of our seats, our faces close together, and our eyes fighting a skirmish over the intervening distance. In his countenance I saw the inherited attitudes of his grandfather, saw the descendant of that unjust man struggle in the grip of his heredity. And then he relaxed. He slumped back in his chair, his face averted and turned slightly from me. He became absolutely still. He might have been asleep from his posture, but I knew that he was waiting for me to speak, waiting for whatever hope or insight I might give him. He was a man born to violent emotions, but he had managed to subdue them, and my own anger faded. I spoke softly. My science is in its infancy. Less, no more than a moat in the field of knowledge. I have never claimed to understand the workings of the mind, but I have often looked upon the symptoms, and believe me, they can be awesome. Some day, when the spark which has fertilized this unborn science has caused it to emerge and mature, some day, in the distant future, it may be possible to trace the functions of thought through the convolutions of the brain and up the articulation of the spinal cord. But as yet we are less than mice in a maze, and the mind is the greatest of all mazes. And, sir, if we do grope our blind way through the labyrinth, who knows what mental minotaur may lurk at the center? I am no Theseus. I have no ball of twine to guide me and make no false claims. I may only treat the symptoms from the entrance to these devious corridors. If that is not enough— it is enough, he whispered. Then believe me, your wife's illness is connected with the curse. Damn the woodsman, he said. But there was no anger in the condemnation. He was quite calm now, his face the color of ash. Can he really be responsible for my wife's behavior? Can she have truly heeded that creature's word? Responsible? Only in so far as he revealed the past, and certainly she believed him, for it was true. The responsibility must lie with your grandfather's actions, and your wife's willingness to assume beyond the facts. I cannot understand these things, Fen Griffin said. It seems we are discussing some form of black magic, some dark art of a former age. He did not speak sarcastically now, but with genuine bewilderment. You are confusing a science we do not fully comprehend with vague notions of sorcery or witchcraft. You deny the curse, and rightly so for yourself, but you cannot deny the effect it has had upon your wife. And to cure her, we must deal with this curse, seek to disprove it, 
demonstrate the error of her thinking, and show her the truth which is obvious to us. Fen Griffin nodded slowly. Perhaps we may begin now, I said. Tell me, your father, did he too deny the curse? Certainly, if he ever so much as thought of it. We are not a family of idiots. And your mother? Of course. Tell me something of your mother. But what possible bearing can this have? I cannot profess to know, unless you tell me. This is absurd. I do not know what miracle I had hoped you to perform, Doctor, and do not understand what curious methods you studied in Leipzig, but first and foremost I learned that without confidence I am powerless. I must continue to place faith in you, I expect. My last forlorn hopes, eh? Well, what of my mother? Who was she? A noble lady of great distinction, he said, with some degree of pride. Slightly older than my father. I told you she passed away while I was but a child, and I cannot remember much about her, cannot differentiate between what I recall and what I was subsequently told. She was a widow. A widow? Yes, the widow of my father's greatest friend. There had long been mutual admiration between them, apparently, and after her period of mourning, during which my father aided her greatly in the handling of her affairs, it was quite natural that this respect and affection blossomed into love. Not the romance of youth, you understand, but the deep bonds of mature feeling. And thus— And thus, I interrupted, when your mother first came to Fengriffin House, she did not come as a virgin bride. Fengriffin blinked. Of course not. A widow— and he paused, regarding me with a strange expression. Yes, Charles knew the form the curse had taken. This was not the way to disprove it, and for some time we were silent. Jacob knocked and entered, cleared the coffee cups away, and asked if we required anything further. Fen Griffin dismissed him with a wave of the hand, and he left, limping more noticeably than before. The time of storm was approaching, to the discomfort of his old bones. Well, Fen Griffin asked, shall we try a different approach? As you like. When was it that your wife destroyed the portrait of Henry Fen Griffin? He did not appear surprised at the question. Has she admitted that to you? It was obvious. Yes, I expect it was. It is difficult to tell a stranger, even a doctor, of such things. I should have, of course, for it was a milestone in her decline. It was some months ago, at the time her behavior became noticeably worse. He paused for a moment. It was, in fact, the very day when Dr. Whittle informed us that she was with child. He told us both together, smiling at the opportunity to bring us such good news. I was delighted, of course. I turned to my wife. Catherine had become pale disturbed, visibly shaken. Her reaction was inconceivable, for we had discussed the possibility of children, and she had been as desirous as I. I was dumbfounded, reached out to take her hand, whereupon she rose and left the room without a word. It was extremely embarrassing. Poor old Whittle looked absolutely confused. He had come as a messenger of joyful revelation, and been treated as a harbinger of gloom. I smoothed it over as best I could, making some feeble excuse for her. Of course, that was before her state of mind had changed so greatly that I confided in him. He accepted my excuses graciously and departed. I went to Catherine's room. The door was barred. There was no sound within. I did not knock, but retired to my own room and to bed. But I could not sleep. I pondered her reactions, and the hours passed tediously as I gravitated between annoyance and concern. I was still awake, although drowsy, when I heard Catherine pass in the hall. I recognized her step. In those early days of our marriage, I recognized everything connected with my beloved. I thought she was coming to my room and waited hopefully. But the steps passed, moved on down the hallway. I rose and went to the door, thinking perhaps she was walking in her sleep. 
as I looked out. I heard a low exclamation, a wordless utterance, and saw that she had paused in the gallery. I was transfixed. She stood there, a wild thing in her flowing nightgown, staring at the portrait, and, as I watched, she suddenly slashed at the picture with a letter opener she kept in her room. Again and again she slashed at the canvas with quick, desperate strokes, muttering and groaning as she tore it apart. I did not attempt to stop her, for I was too stunned to move. When the task of destruction was ended, and the ruined canvas hung down in ragged shreds, Catherine stepped back, gathered her gown around her, as though taken by a chill. Her bosom heaved. She drew her head back. Suddenly she seemed to become aware of the letter-opener, and threw it violently from her hand, as if it were unclean, as if it had become soiled by contact with the portrait. She came back down the hallway, saw me suddenly as she drew near, but passed without a word. Her face was twisted with malice, with hatred, with God knows what. It was not the face of the woman I loved. Fen Griffin shuddered. God, it was dreadful, he said. And did you not connect this destruction with the curse? I connected it with madness, he whispered, and lowered his head. And then, simultaneously, we became aware of Catherine's presence at the doorway. Fengriffin's head snapped up from his chest, alarmed at her presence and at his own previous statement. Catherine was very pale, swaying on unsteady legs, and yet her expression was collected and calm. She looked at her husband, and then she looked at me, and a grimace vaguely akin to a smile caused her lips to rise at the corners. It was a terrible twisting of the mouth, unrelated to the placid expression in her eyes, the grotesquely deformed offspring of laughter and the ancestor of the rictus of rigor mortis. I could not face that play of feature and looked away. Fengriffin sprang to his feet. Cathy, you should not be here. Oh, and where should I be? Fengriffin advanced towards her, took two strides and then faltered, as if at some invisible barrier, stopped and stared helplessly across the intervening space where unknown emotion had erected a frontier, where the border guards of their disturbed relationship refused to let him pass. His shoulders quivered. Catherine looked beyond him and caught my eyes again. So you have heard the curse, she said. I nodded. And scoffed at such nonsense? I shook my head slowly. Few things are nonsense, I said. Nothing voiced in the agony of a broken heart can be nonsense. There you are wrong, she said. Is he not wrong, Charles? Accusation can be nonsense. And she gestured as though it were unimportant. Fengriffin turned to look at me, seeking an ally. I did not know what to say, what I could possibly say in the presence of both of them together. His eyes slid back towards his wife, but she was still looking at me. And you are wrong also about the curse, she said. You have not understood the meaning, have looked beyond the obvious and found something less foreign to your understanding, less difficult to countenance in your learned system of validity. No, doctor. The curse is not driving me insane, any more than the crime was insanity. Do you not see that? The poor woman went mad as a result of the crime, just as I fear I will go mad as a result of the revenge. But that is an after-effect, no more. The vengeance chooses a far more terrible form than mere madness. And in truth I saw nothing of madness in her appearance at that moment, heard nothing of insanity in the voice which delivered the abstruse message. I wished her to continue, for I sensed she was about to reveal what she took for truth. But her face clouded then, and she turned, biting her lip, and rushed from the room. Her motion broke the spell which had held him, and Fengriffin moved after her, shouting for Mrs. Loon. That good woman appeared, scurrying down the hallway and intercepting Catherine at the foot of the staircase. Mrs. Loon was as pale as Catherine as she took her arm. 
Catherine leaned heavily against her, and Loon assisted her up the stairs, whispering words meant to be soothing, but losing the calming effect in the troubled tone. Fen Griffin stood at the foot of the staircase, his arms swinging about as though he struggled against bondage, gazed up at the departing forms until they had vanished, and then turned to me. What can she mean? he asked. I did not reply, for I did not know. But there was something else which I desired to know, which I needed to know. I took his arm and led him back into the library. He kept shaking his head from side to side, dazed or puzzled, continued to do so even after he had resumed his seat. I stood before him, waiting to engage his eyes, but he refused to look at me. His head still rotated, heavy-lidded, swinging across and below my line of vision. I placed my fist against my hip, pushing my coat back. There are little tricks of convenience which one learns. I drew my watch from my waistcoat and glanced at it, then let it dangle on the chain. His eyes fastened upon this pendulum as the gold gathered the firelight, and his head stopped moving. You have not told me all, I said. Still you persist in denying me the facts. I have, sir, he said. I have told you everything that can be of importance. You have, at some degree of inconvenience to myself, and considerable expense, brought me from London. Expense means nothing to me, he snapped. Nor to me. If you would prefer payment in advance, I shall be glad to issue a check at this very moment. You missed the point, sir. Money is little, and does not much concern me. But I cannot approve of waste, and you are wasting my time and hindering what little abilities I may have brought here with me. The watch revolved. His eyes were fastened upon it, pinned to the darting shafts of reflection like butterflies on a mat. His eyebrows moved like wings, but his eyes were secured, looking into that little golden world, gazing into a dimension in which his suffering had no reality. In that moment he would have willingly plunged bodily into this minute world of shifting brilliance, where his mind had already fled where his consciousness rode smoothly down the bands of light and slipped off painlessly into the mellow shadows. I caused the watch to swing further and faster, and he frowned in visual pursuit, disturbed at this changing pattern, troubled as the spinning dimensions changed to the lateral. And then I clapped my hand over the watch. Fengriffin blinked back to reality. I slipped the watch into my waistcoat again. I had no desire to mesmerize the man, had brought him to the border line and snapped him abruptly back, and it had served the purpose. He looked into my face now. All traces of aristocracy had vanished from his features. He ground his teeth and his eyes rolled, but he was aware of his own existence. You have omitted at least one point of importance, I said. Through guilt or pride, you have been silent. Your wife spoke of accusation. You have accused her of something, is it not so? Something which you have kept from me. Something relating to her behavior. Fengriffin nodded. Now we would have truth. Yes, he whispered. Yes, I omitted one thing. I omitted it from my thoughts as well, you see, from my voluntary thoughts. I cannot keep it from my dreams, nor keep it from stealing suddenly into my mind when control is relaxed, stealing like some vicious footpad from the dark alley where it hides, to strike a savage wound again and again, opening the old scar tissue with another dreadful gash. Injuries to the body, doctor, are simple things. They are mortal or they heal. Not so these scars on the soul. They too can be mortal, but they do not kill. They too can heal, but the scar tissue is weak and can be opened again at the slightest touch of memory, opened as painfully each time, these gory wounds which do not bleed, these violent blows which do not bring unconsciousness, these lethal strokes which send a poisoned spear deep into the heart and fester without death. Yes, doctor, I omitted it. He stood up brushed past me and moved to the chimney-piece, where he poured a large tumbler of brandy with shaking hand. The decanter clattered against the rim of his glass, and a few drops spilled, unheeded, under the carpet. 
He raised the glass to his lips with a sudden movement, as though he would drain it at one gulp. But he took a small sip only, the glass rattling on his teeth before turning towards me. You are right, he said. Perhaps the solution lies in this omission. Perhaps a doctor is not required. It would be so simple a solution, you see, and yet so terrible to admit. Pride? Ah, yes, pride. And pain. Doctor, you must swear you will never repeat what I am about to tell you. I am a doctor, sir. Forgive me he said, lowering his head. I scarcely know what I am saying. Give me a moment. His downcast eyes were looking into the amber liquid in his glass. He swirled the glass, watching the liquid lap at the rim, watching the liquid, but seeing something else reflected in those dark depths, seeing some memory trapped in the moving mirror a memory he wished to drown there, but which was capable of surviving beneath the surface until, in an unguarded moment, it would rise, twisting and bloated, like some monster from the deepest fathoms, rising to the surface to devour the fragile vessels of happiness. For long minutes he stared into the liquid looking-glass, and then suddenly he raised it, and this time he drained the contents, this time he drank those reflections, and shuddered as they sank into his belly. And there, too, they survived. Ben Griffin set the empty glass down and leaned against the chimney-piece, passed a hand across his brow. I knew that he would speak softly, and moved closer to him, on a tangent, so that he would not be distracted by the motion. One evening, he said, some eight or nine months ago, I returned unexpectedly from town. I cannot recall just when this was, in days, but it was before her symptoms had become so pronounced, before we were aware of her pregnancy, that is, although it must have been within a week or two of the conception. Well, I had been in town on business, and planned to stop the night, but the business was settled more quickly than I had expected, and I found myself able to return by the last train. I had left my carriage in the village, and proceeded home as soon as I had detrained. The house was in darkness when I arrived. I awoke the stable lad, of necessity, but saw no reason to disturb Jacob, and let myself into the house. I went directly upstairs. It was necessary to pass my wife's room on the way to my own, as it still is, and I moved as quietly as possible to avoid awakening her as I passed the door. Just as I had advanced that far. I heard a sound which caused me to pause. It came from Catherine's room, a faint murmur which could have been whispered conversation or inarticulate mumbling. I could not tell. I was not suspicious, and believed her to be dreaming or experiencing a nightmare, wondered if I should wake her. It was quite late, and I paused, debating, and heard these sounds increase. I said I was not suspicious, but suddenly a cold fear enveloped me as the sounds became more distinct. I advanced silently and listened at her door. A shameful act, I realize, but perhaps you can understand the torment of such a moment, the impulsive desire to know the truth, the manner in which jealousy may affect honor and judgment, and cause one to act in a fashion unsuitable to a gentleman. But enough of such excuses. I advanced shamelessly to her door and placed my ear against the panels. And then I knew the sounds, Doctor. They were the noises of love. Ben Griffin's face was dark and stormy, and he looked directly at me now, his eyes smoldering with feelings even deeper than the molten jade of jealousy. The noises of love, Doctor, he repeated. Sounds with which I was well acquainted. Pantings and stirrings and soft moans, murmurs and sighs, and the metallic protest of the bedsprings. And they were not recognized objectively, for I was aware of my wife's own voice emitting these non-verbal but expressive, oh, so expressive, intonations. When one lives as a husband to a woman, he learns to recognize the peculiarities of her frenzy, the pitch and cadence of her passion, 
the rhythm unique to the woman he loves. And in that manner these sounds were transmitted to my brain, the sibilants piercing, the gutturals bludgeoning, the timber vibrating with shattering effect. I stood, my mouth gaping open, forced open, as though to provide an exit for the rage and jealousy which welled up to proportions too great to be contained within my breast. And then those emotions escaped me, in the form of a strangling cry, and I rushed at the door in a blind rage. It was barred. I battered against it with my fists and kicked with my feet. At the violence of my attack, the noises within Catherine's room ceased abruptly. The door held, and I stepped back, as a terrible hush fell over the house. Into this silence my agony expanded. The silence seemed worse than the sounds. I threw myself at the door once more, and this time it yielded and flew open. The lock was torn from the frame, and fragments of wood hung dangling across the entrance. The door itself swung back and crashed against the wall. It was a stout door and a strong lock, but in that instant my strength had been supernatural. Nothing organic and fashioned by human craft could have stood against me. But the explosive effort had drained my momentum, and I staggered against the splintered frame for support, and looked into the room while those jagged shards swayed up and down before me, looked past those broken sticks, and saw a scene which burned itself into my mind. Catherine was sitting up in bed. She was naked. The bedclothes were disarranged and trailed onto the floor. She turned her face towards me, mouth open and eyes glazed, and for a moment she appeared not to recognize me, appeared unaware of where she was or who she was. Her white flesh glistened with perspiration. Her hair was disheveled, and she had raised one slender hand to her throat. I noticed the pulse beating in the hollow of her neck, and the way her bosom rose as she inhaled heavily, noticed in vivid detail all these aspects of her appearance, and then looking beyond her, saw that the window was open. The shutters had been thrown wide, and the curtains were drawn outwards, as with the passage of some departing form, carried after somebody in the rush of flight, even as I looked. These curtains slid back into the room. I was at the window in three strides, but the night was black. Perhaps it is fitting that this night was black, black as the tomb of love, black as the crypt of respect, untouched by the moon which had lighted other times. I looked out, but could see nothing, turned back to Catherine, and as I did so, I became aware of a stench pervading the room and assaulting my nostrils a strange and mouldering odour of decay, as might have been left by a man who has travelled on foot through the rotting autumnal forest. This odour coiled sharply up my nasal passages, agitating and causing me to choke and gag. I fought against revulsion and moved back toward the bed. The heavy scent faded as fresh air poured into the room, and my nostrils stopped tingling. Catherine had not moved other than to turn her head as she watched me cross the room, but her eyes had brightened. There is a certain way in which her eyes begin to shine at such moments, a light from within, piercing the clouded lenses like sunlight as an overcast sky begins to break. I observed this change. My raging emotions had frozen into objective calm, as though feeling had solidified into a protective barrier of ice before my brain and it was from behind this defensive wall that I looked at Catherine. She is my wife, Doctor. I have loved her, and I have seen in blissful moments how she appears when the physical act of love has been completed. And that, Doctor, is just how she appeared at that moment. That is exactly how she appeared. Then Griffin stopped speaking and spread his hands in a shrug, which did not signify indifference. I accused her of infidelity, of course. There was, is, no doubt of it. I did not accuse her at the moment, could not bring myself to utter a solitary syllable, but went to my room, where I lived through the most terrible night of my life. But in the morning I accused her. What would any man have done? She did not deny the charge. 
did not even comment upon it, but gazed at me as though I were incomprehensible, as though she did not understand my words. But there was nothing she could have said at any rate. The results of my accusation? He smiled sadly. It was as if I had been in the wrong, Doctor. Since that night I have been refused admission to her bedroom, exactly as though I had wronged her. Then Griffin left the fireplace and walked along the side of the room, turned at the corner and passed slowly along the bookcases. I saw the tightness of his clenched jaw cause his cheeks to harden in ridges, and he struck his fist into the open palm of his other hand several times, but without force. If she has been unfaithful, I said. He stared at me. Have you not driven her further away? Surely your own behavior has been altered by the belief. No, no. Doctor, I am willing to forgive her. I have told her so. I will forgive her anything if forgiveness will regain her love, for I love her beyond recrimination, beyond jealousy, beyond even pride. She will not allow forgiveness, will not listen to my words, does not care. She does not wish my forgiveness, doctor for she despises me. A woman's reaction to her own guilt, I began. Guilt be damned! Find out why she has ceased to love me. Tell me what to do. It was shortly after that terrible night that the initial signs of pregnancy appeared. I hoped that it would bring us closer. You know that it had the opposite effect. My child and heir will be born, Doctor, but to what situation? Cure her of this madness before the child arrives, for the love of God. And he confronted me with such an expression of dumb agony and bewildered pain that I looked away from his face. When I looked up, Fen Griffin had left the room. I sat alone in the light of the fading fire, turning the possibilities over in my mind and attempting to shape insight into the framework of facts. I was not at all convinced that Catherine had been unfaithful to her husband found his whole painful tale rather unlikely, too vivid and too obviously contorted by his own fears and feelings. On the other hand, I felt that he had at last told me the truth as he saw it, and that something out of the ordinary had taken place in Catherine's bedroom. Fengriffin's supposition was the most logical and simplest, was strengthened by Catherine's refusal to deny the fact, and by her spurning of his proffered forgiveness— and yet I could not think her subsequent behavior in line with this solution, could not somehow see her as a woman who would admit another man to her bedroom and commit adultery within her husband's home. If she truly no longer loved him, there was nothing I could do, and nothing I should attempt to do, for dying love is without the range of science. But she had told me that she loved him, and I believed her. She had also told me she had not been unfaithful granting me the denial which she kept from Charles. It created a paradox and forced a new approach, a new alternative. Ah, there was an alternative, and it had been gradually taking form in my thoughts, a figment of the mind which I had never before encountered, but had studied as a classic aberration, and which could have accounted for her behavior. It was a frightful, malignant disarrangement of reality, unfounded and uncommon, a fixation from a darker age which should not have survived the light of reason, but which had found fertile ground in Catherine's mind when, inflamed and distorted by the woodsman's terrible tale, she had returned to this house. But dreadful as it was, it could be treated and cured once I had discovered how she came to formulate such a concept. That would be the problem. Where had this hallucination seized her? Where had she acquired the germ of the idea? Contemplating this, I gazed idly about the room, looked into the long wedges of shadow at the corners, at the orange embers of the fire, at the volumes which lined the walls. I paused. Fengriffin had mentioned that Catherine spent long hours alone in this room. At the time, that fact had assumed no importance beyond her obvious desire for solitude. But I saw it now in a different aspect— felt with a sudden certainty that the answer lurked somewhere amongst the collected knowledge on these shelves. I did not know what book it would prove to be, 
but was positive that one of these ancient volumes held the secret, was certain that Catherine, in bewilderment and distress, had turned to these books, seeking a name for her turmoil, and, as surely as one may turn to learned works for knowledge, so one may turn to books for evil, without desiring evil, guided by frustration and doubt. The image was vivid. I could see the poor woman, caught up in feverish fear, driven to these books in a desperate attempt to understand what she believed was happening. I rose from my chair and moved along the shelves, drew several volumes out at random. The backs were free of dust, but the tops had eluded Mrs. Loon's diligence and carried mantles of flaky grey undisturbed through the years. I glanced at the titles, found that the library was stocked at random with volumes on diverse subjects in no particular order, but in every field of knowledge. On the second circuit I found the book I sought. I knew, even before I pulled it from the shelf, that it was what I sought, knew also that it was the worst it could have been, drew it down and saw that the top was without its coat of dust, and that Catherine had delved into it more than once. The book was Malius Maleficarum. It was the illustrated Paris edition of 1497, that wicked classic which had given rise to the Inquisition, that sinister work of demonology which had caused torture and torment beyond reckoning and crystallized the black fears of superstition into hysteria. And now once again, in an age when it should have lost its terrible power, it had struck at Catherine's bewildered mind. I carried the book to the table, conscious of the weight and the scent of old leather, and of something more, perhaps the evil which pervades those pages, carried it with my arms outstretched, subconsciously keeping the foul object away from my body, and placed it down on the binding. I ran my hand across the pages, and let the book fall open where it would, let the binding bend where it had most recently and most often been folded. It dropped open in the second part. I looked at the page, knowing beforehand what the subject would be. Incubus. Sexual relations with the demons. That was the subject. I did not trouble to read those lines which had devoured Catherine's reason. Closed the book quickly, as though it were a Pandora's box from which evil spirits and monstrous devils would fly at me, intangible and without substance, and yet able to create concrete destruction. I returned the book to the shelves, and found that the hair upon the base of my skull had risen as I realized what infernal torment the poor woman had been put through. Despite the hour, I felt I must speak with Catherine without delay, and summoned Mrs. Loon without informing Fengriffin. Mrs. Loon was reluctant to disturb the mistress, hemmed and hawed and offered excuses, until at last I convinced her of the urgency, and she led dubiously up to Catherine's room. Catherine was awake in bed, the covers mounded over her swollen stomach, and her eyes alert in anguished face. She seemed surprised at my entrance. Mrs. Loon hovered by the door, nervous and uncertain. "'I must speak with you,' I said. Catherine frowned. "'I told him,' Mrs. Loon began. "'It's all right. You may go.' Mrs. Loon looked relieved, departed, leaving the door ajar. Her footsteps echoed down the hall. I moved to the side of the bed and sat on a chair, leaned forward and spoke with urgent demand. You must tell me what you believe to be true, madam, for the sake of your sanity and your unborn child. I am a doctor. You must remember that, and think nothing of embarrassment or shame. Shame? What do I care for shame? There is nothing you can do. You waste your time here. I can listen. She smiled grimly. I know more of this matter than you, Doctor, with all your science and learning. I know from experience. Then perhaps I shall learn from you. She looked startled at this. Do you know what has happened to me? she asked. I know what you think has happened. Have you heard of such things? I nodded. Very well, then. I shall tell you, Doctor. You will not believe me, but you shall hear the truth. She smiled again. Then she spoke. 
I resisted. You must believe that, Doctor. I resisted with all my strength, but resistance was useless. It was not a physical thing, you understand. It was my will which faltered and yielded. What it was, or how it was possible, I do not know. I have searched the books in the library, and found certain terms and names which may apply, and yet they are no more than the names of superstition and witchcraft and sorcery, of self-deceit and ignorance. This was none of those, and it was real. If I am mad, then madness followed the reality. If it was a dream, then dreams are real. And if any ordeal could have been more terrible, then the human mind cannot conceive of it. It came in the night, Doctor. It came, whatever it was, each night that I slept alone. The prelude was the feeling of stifling weight and cold, and each time it came it was heavier and colder. Each night it seemed to have greater substance. Instead of a chill in the air, it became a form of coldness which moved in from the window and lay beside me, and at length covered me. What is a spirit, a shade, a ghost, no more than a shape of temperature? I lay in silence as this presence came to me, and whimpered with fear at its touch, willed it to be gone, and struggled. For weeks I struggled against it. But each night my struggles were less. It did not hurt me. There was no pain, and even the cold was not unpleasant. But the sensation was so horrible, so inhuman, that I felt myself being dragged into a different dimension, a different plane of existence, a different sphere of reality. And I knew, with overwhelming self-hatred and loathing, that I would eventually be sucked away. Perhaps my will was weakened, because I knew it was futile, but that does not matter. What does a night, a week, a month matter, when the result must inexorably be the same? And so I surrendered. The thing took solid form. As it solidified, it emitted a hideous odor of brimstone and rot, and the cold lessened. The molecules of the air compressed until I could see the shape of this thing. It was wavering and transparent, but it had form. It whirled in the air above me, and then it descended upon me. I had no energy left. My thighs parted. I felt the clammy caress, and closed my eyes, for I did not wish to see it, pressed it away with my hands listlessly, and found my arms passing through it with sluggishness, as though through a heavy liquid. The odor caused my brain to spin, thick and fermented and foul the fumes passed into my mind. And then this being took me. I felt it enter my body. I felt it tremble, and heard an unearthly moan, as though a great wind had risen within the confines of my room, or perhaps within my body itself. It moved. I moved with it. God help me. I could not keep myself from joining in that terrible coupling. I do not know how long it took, but finally I felt the thing complete the act, felt the hideous emission within me. Then it drew away, whining from my body. It swirled above me for a time, and then departed. The curtains moved with its passage, and I was alone again trembling and quivering, and how do words describe such feelings? What more can I say? After that the being returned every night. I no longer offered even token resistance. My power had been destroyed by the spiritual burden deposited in me. I waited for its coming with loathing and horror, and yet, terrible to say, with expectation. The sensations of the act were not unpleasant. I was dazed, but I awaited it, and each night it came to me. I had become the mistress of this being, and each night I awaited its pleasure. I joined into the act with this thing of horror, and sank to the depths of evil. And then, one night, it failed to come. 
and that night I knew the terrible fate it had brought to me, knew that its mission was ended and that it would come no more. Catherine's eyes were wild, and that bitter smile played grotesquely over her lips. And so I have told you, she said. Now, perhaps you may tell me something, Doctor. I said nothing. You have read Malius Maleficarum, and Dictionnaire Infernal, and Alexicacan, and a dozen more, yes. And what is your opinion on the much debated subject, Doctor? What is that? Can incubi reproduce in the body of mortal woman? She looked down at her enlarged belly, and her face twisted into hatred. I live in dread of bearing the demon's child, she whispered. And it was with cold horror that I left her room. I spent a considerable portion of that night in deliberation, wondering whether I should reveal the true nature of Catherine's fantasy to her husband. It was not easy to decide upon the best course. Fen Griffin would surely be relieved to find that he had not been made a cuckold, but he was not a man of any great tolerance or understanding, and it was difficult to forecast what his reactions would be when he discovered the fiendish delusion under which his wife's sanity sagged. Finally, however, I decided that it would be best to tell him that my own work in banishing this monstrous shape from Catherine's mind would be made easier by Fen Griffin's knowledge. But I did not wish to discuss the matter in the library where the conversation must necessarily be flavoured by our previous discourse. Did not wish to speak anywhere in the house. It was such a dark subject that I felt it could be managed far better in the open air and daylight. Thus I waited until we had breakfasted, and asked Charles if he would ride with me. He shot me an inquisitive glance, but made no comment, nodded his acquiescence. I went to my room to change into clothes suitable for riding and when I came down again there were two horses saddled and waiting in the forecourt. Fen Griffin was holding the reins of his big bay hunter and looking up at the sky. The stable lad held my horse, a rather smallish and placid-looking gelding, which suited me perfectly. "'It'll rain today,' Fen Griffin said. "'Has Jacob pronounced upon it?' He nodded and swung easily into the saddle. "'Well, we needn't ride far,' I said. Then Griffin nodded again, his face grave. The lad gave me a leg up and stood back, pushing his cap up in that gesture of habit he possessed, and watching as we set off. Fen Griffin was a fine horseman and rose naturally, without thought for the motions, leaving his mind open to concepts and continuing to glance up at the sky from time to time. For my part, I was still turning over possibilities, wondering if I had made a mistake in my decision, and how best to convey my meaning in layman's terms which he could grasp, wanting him to comprehend objectively, so that he would understand the dark forces which held Catherine without being shocked or repulsed. We rode side by side, the hoofbeats dull on the heavy earth, following the contour of the rising land and skirting the trees. Then Griffin's height, and the height of his big bay, combined to give me a feeling of relative smallness beside him made him seem somehow larger than life as I looked sideways and saw his lean form silhouetted against the overcast sky, larger in the way that an elongated El Greco is larger, and grim as a Goya. We moved the horses at a walk for some half-hour, until the house was no longer visible around the turning of the forest's contour, and then he reined in suddenly and looked at me down his nose from that great height, placed his hand against my horse's bridle, as though he did not trust my ability to halt the beast. His nostrils flared, and his steed pawed the ground restlessly. Well, he asked, let us dismount. We did so. Finn Griffin secured the horses loosely to the limb of the nearest tree. An outcrop of grey stone jutted from the woods at this point, a wedge of rock through which gnarled oaks twined their twisted ascent and probed and burrowed with sigmoid roots between the stones. I sat upon the rocks, and Finn Griffin placed one foot beside me and leaned over, his elbow on his knee. Dismounted, he still seemed disproportionately angular. The horses eyed us with patience, but Finn Griffin was not patient. Well? he asked again. 
There is an abnormality in your wife's mind, I began, carefully choosing my words. His lips moved, and I held one hand up. Wait, don't interrupt me yet. Hear me out before you speak. It is abnormal, but hardly insane. However, if allowed to persist, there is every danger that it may cause insanity. It is a belief which was quite common in former times, in the Middle Ages, but it is not common now, and the uniqueness in itself makes it far more dangerous. It is connected with the curse, but I do not believe it was caused by the curse, nor by knowledge of the curse. Rather was her mind ripe to seek the curse as a method of self-inflicted punishment. I believe that your wife is suffering guilt for some reason, some act of which I do not know, and doubt she knows herself, and that this feeling of guilt was inflamed and magnified by her credulity concerning the woodsman's tale. The connection has taken the form of a dream, or nightmare, which recurred for a time, and which was of a quality which made it appear real, made differentiation between nightmare and reality impossible to her. Dreams? How can dreams do this? Because to Catherine they are not dreams. They are real. They are far more real than whatever has caused her guilt, for her mind has failed to countenance that has blocked it from her consciousness as a protective measure. But this must be the starting point. If I am able to delve beneath her conscious memory and discover the reason for her guilt, I may be able to deal with it. It might well be a long and tedious process. Fengriffin took his pipe and tobacco pouch out and began to stuff the mixture into the bowl with great concentration. Could this guilt be rooted in infidelity. It could, but not, I think, on the instance you are referring to. And then again, it could have any of a hundred other motivations. And these dreams, he asked. He struck a phosphorus match and applied the flame to his pipe. What is the nature of her dreams? Sexual. Fengriffin scowled, but not with anger, rather with the effort to understand scowled with the pipe stem clamped in his teeth and ribbons of smoke rising above him. You should understand that sexual guilt need not have a sexual cause, I told him. He said nothing. Do you know what an incubus is? Finn Griffin nodded slowly, took the pipe from his mouth. A demon or devil which seeks intercourse with mortals, is it not? That, and more. But that is an absurdity. To you and me, not to Catherine. You have in your library a volume which deals with such things, deals not as science would deal, but with all the evil belief of an unenlightened age and superstitious faith. Your wife has read this volume. It is easy to believe that what one reads in print is fact. Catherine could not admit that her dreams were dreams, could not face the fact that she was experiencing dreams of sexual content. She sought an answer, and found it in the wicked teachings of that infamous book, at a time when her mind was already disturbed by knowledge of the curse. In conjunction, they formed a cycle. The dreams became increasingly real as her mind became inflamed, and her mind was driven further from reality as these dreams intruded more and more. But why should she have had these erotic dreams? There again is the unknown guilt. It could be something from her past, some long-forgotten event of childhood, or it could stem from a simple need, a failure on your part to satisfy her carnal urges adequately. I think this rather more than likely, in fact. But, and this I must stress, the very nature of her dreams, the very fact that she was unable to admit that they were dreams, proves her innocence. Fen Griffin raised his eyebrows. The lascivious do not become deranged over nocturnal eroticism. They enjoy it as a substitute for their desires. It is the person who attempts to repress these sensations and emotions who becomes disturbed. 
the dread of the sleeping representation of the sexual act increases in proportion to the degree of repression, and, in one with a predisposition to instability, severe repression of erotic desires can lead to fantasies which pass beyond the realm of sleep and persevere into the waking hours. You understand? Your wife cannot believe that she has erotic dreams, and so turns to the curse which began in a sexual crime, and to what she has read of supernatural concepts as an explanation. She came to believe that a demon was visiting her. This surely is madness. For ages it was the accepted explanation. Even the word nightmare comes from this idea. Mare was the old English for demon, you know. I told you the belief is uncommon in our day, but hardly inconceivable. Fen Griffin shifted his foot upon the rocks. And the night of which I told you? The night I broke into her room? Is it truly possible that what I believed to be infidelity was really no more than a dream? Possible and indeed probable. He breathed a sigh of dubious relief. The wind had risen and played through the horses' manes, and the sky seemed even darker. The scent of rain was heavy on the air. And this can account for her behavior towards me? Of course. She does not despise you. She despises herself. She keeps you from her, not for lack of love, but to keep her husband from soiling himself with a woman who has cohabited with a demon. Catherine believes herself unclean and unworthy. But a cure is possible? I believe so. And you will remain here? Remain as long as necessary? Then Griffin seemed to have acquired a new confidence in me, following my revelation, and in turn I lost my reticence and doubt about confiding in him, made, I fear, the error of thinking he saw his wife's illness in the same way as I, and understood all the connotations. I shall stay at least until your child is born, I told him. It may not be necessary after that. The very fact of normal birth and motherhood may be the greatest cure, may cause her to effect her own cure within her own mind. I don't see. Normal? Finn Griffin frowned and I realized he had not followed our conversation to the same conclusions that plagued his wife, that perhaps it would have been better if he did not. But now he began to understand. He began to see the terrible fear which gripped his wife's sanity in the fetid talons of dread. His face changed. His frown gave way to incredulity for an instant, and then turned to horror. He stared at me with hatred, for I had released this evil which flitted and flew through his mind, evil which was beyond his power to rationally dismiss. His countenance became terrible to behold, the muscles writhed beneath the tautly drawn skin. She believes that, he whispered. She fears that. That in her womb she bears a demon's child? Her aberration I began, feeling an appalling sense of helplessness as I looked into his face, looked beyond his features and into the depths of his emotion. But Fen Griffin was no longer listening to me. This was the brittle ice of emotion, and it crackled perilously beneath the welter burden of distress. Fen Griffin stamped his foot. Turf sprang up around his polished boot. He slammed one fist into the other hand, with a sharp crack, and at that very instant the drums of thunder began to roll across the heavens. It was as if the gods themselves shared the man's agony. The sky blackened, echoing the dark sentiments of his countenance, as the clouds altered without changing place, rolled ponderously over to present the darker side of this arched ceiling. Through the darkness ran a hook of lightning. It split the blackness and Finn Griffin's eyes gathered in the momentary illumination, reflecting their own dark light. The first drops of rain descended, slow and heavy as lost hope, while the mournful wind dipped down to toss Finn Griffin's hair in wild disarray. He tossed his head back 
and the hair fell over his brow. He looked less than a man, and more. He looked an idol carved by pagan hands, a colossus fashioned from veined marble and set with obsidian eyes which glowed and revealed the furnace blazing within the cavern of his skull. Another wave of thunder beat above us. You speak of curses, he said. His voice was hollow, its timber forged in a chest cavity where the heart had diminished and left a void. Far better infidelity than this. Far better madness to idiocy. Madness to loss of all reason. To the slobbering depths of mindlessness. His head swiveled back toward the direction we had come. Toward the house. He raised his hand and his lips moved without sound. I did not know what malediction he mouthed in that moment, but knew it was terrible indeed. And then he moved to his horse in two huge strides, jerked the reins free and mounted with a suddenness that caused the brute to shy and stumble, kicked his heels savagely into the animal's sides and blasted off at full gallop, spraying the turf behind him. A clot of muck struck me on the forehead. I wiped it away with the back of my hand and looked after him shielding my eyes against the angled rain. Something of agony came to me in sympathetic vibrations, and I felt a great weight suck at me, felt my boots sink into the softening ground, as though gravity had singled me out to test its prowess and drag me down into the underworld. For some minutes I stood there, motionless, long after Fengriffin had vanished into the storm. Then my horse whinnied. The sound brought me back to time. I mounted and rode after him. The storm was absolute. I could not see more than a few feet before me, and even those feet were a shifting haze. I was forced to let the horse have his head and return us with animal instincts, while I cursed myself for a blunderer, castigated myself for having assumed that Ben Griffin could possibly have accepted such knowledge with rational objectivity. The horse did not blunder did not need vision or intelligence, but headed unerringly toward the stables. And what use, I asked myself, is the mind to mankind? Man would survive without conscious thought, would survive more surely and more efficiently, devoid of that useless by-product of the brain which causes the suffering unique to Homo sapiens, which makes man, alone of all creatures, torment and destroy himself, as I was tormenting myself at that moment and as Fengriffin was doing, on a level beyond words. The mind is the descendant of the thumb and the vocal cord, and a malformed child it has always been. A mistake of evolution with the unique ability to bring its own extinction. So my own mind told me, as the horse moved on, and the rain stabbed through my clothing in a hundred places. The beast's hooves rattled suddenly, and I knew we had come into the courtyard. Lightning forked down, and I saw the house rush at me and then diminish, as illumination played its optical jest. I kept my head down and my shoulders hunched, and waited until we had entered the shelter of the stables before I looked up. Fengriffin's horse was there, lathered and dripping. The young lad was unsaddling the animal, and glanced up at my entrance. "'Where is your master?' I asked as I slid from the saddle, loosing a halo of water from my sodden hair. Don't know, sir. He seemed in a rare state. Happen he was vexed with the rain, but he leaped from his horse and ran off without a word for me. Took the spade with himself and all. Peculiar, I'd say. The spade? Aye, the one which I use as for mucking up the stalls. Can't see what he wants with that. He took the reins from me. Did he head toward the house? Couldn't say, sir. I looked toward the entrance. The rain lashed across, but I could be no wetter than I was, and wrapping my cloak about me, I walked out and started for the house. A light bobbled before me. A moment later the light was a lantern, and old Jacob was peering up at me from his shrunken stature, his face cowled in a rain hood. Is the master with you, sir? he asked. He has just left the stables. Jacob looked about meaninglessly in the impenetrable rain. "'The mistress's time has come,' he said. "'We have sent to the village for Dr. Whittle, and Mrs. Loon sent me to fetch the master.' "'You didn't pass him on your way from the house?' 
No, sir. I wouldn't have come on if I had. Where could he have gone? I asked. And no sooner were the words voiced than, with a dreadful conviction, I knew where Fen Griffin was, knew that when he had turned toward the house and mouthed those silent words, that they had not been directed at Catherine, nor at the house. I seized the lantern from Jacob without a word of explanation, knew he must think me mad as I plunged off into the storm, wondered where madness did lie as I hurried towards the graveyard. The rain was alternating now. For an instant it would lift, as wind and cloud toyed with one another, and then it would fall again in a curtain as dense as a cataract. Against this liquid tapestry my lantern's feeble beam bounced back, illuminating no more than a yard before me, serving more to blind me in the rebounding glare than to light my path. I slipped and slid in the mud, and several times came close to falling, bumped suddenly against some solid object, giving my shin a nasty rap, saw in a momentary flash of lightning that I had banged into an ancient sundial in the gardens, overgrown with slimy moss. It seemed a curious object to encounter on this sunless day, seemed to offer mute testimonial of brighter times. I passed around it, brushed through some shrubbery, caught a glimpse of the fallen tree upon which Catherine had seated herself, and then began to cross the field. Each time the lightning ran across the sky, I could see the line of trees before me. Each time they were a bit taller, a bit nearer, and I plodded on doggedly, placing one foot before the other and not thinking of time or distance or discomfort, until at last I was within the forest. The trees offered a certain amount of shelter, but did not increase the visibility, for the lessening of the rain was more than made up for by the gloomy shadows which clung to the ground in the darkness, and then threw sudden trestles across the lightning's flash. I held the lantern up and peered uncertainly ahead. I had been there but once, and was not sure of my directions, uncertain at what point I had entered the arboreal perimeter. I advanced a few feet and paused again. The forest seemed different under the onslaught of this deluge. The boughs sagged and the rain battered at leaf and limb. I had no idea which way to go and then my blood froze. I heard the sound of the spade. It was a sodden sound in the heavy earth, and following each thud came a low, coarse grunt of exertion. I moved toward this noise like a sleepwalker, a zombie, a nyctophobe cast into night. A lantern was before me, throwing moths of light which darted through the timber and then vanished in the greater flare of the heavenly currents. I was frightened, and I was fascinated, and I moved on toward that sound until, without warning, I stepped past a tree and stood at the edge of the graveyard. Just then another jagged stroke split the sky. Blinding light blocked the shattered cubes of tombstones and sent white tentacles over the sunken graves, and I looked upon Fengriffin. He was bent over his grandfather's grave. As the light ran down his profile, dividing him into carnal chiaroscuro, he appeared but half a man. His head was down. He did not notice the lantern which quivered in my hand. He was intent upon his task. He stooped further and lifted. A pile of black earth slid from the spade and ran down the mound behind him. He stopped again as the illumination faded. The darkness dropped between us, and my lantern could not reach him. I stood as rooted to the spot as the tombstones themselves. I heard the spade again, and again, and then another electric tongue tasted the sky, and he was thrown into view once more. The mound was higher, and he had diminished as he sank lower into the opening grave. As he heaved up, his face turned towards me, blinded in the glare. His lips were squared back from his teeth, and the teeth ivory geometrics. His eyes streamed tears of anguish which mingled with the rain, and his nostrils flared like a hunting beast scenting its prey. The powerful shoulders bunched with muscle. He lifted, and mercifully for my eyes the shade fell again. It was through this darkness that I heard the hollow clunk of the spade against the coffin. I closed my eyes. If lightning flashed again, I did not wish to see. 
There came a brittle sound of shattering wood, rotten with damp age, and then a ripping sound, as of one tearing at a coffin with his naked hands. He cried out. He cried in words which fit no language, sounds which symbolized emotions so deeply buried that words had never been conceived to signify their meaning, so dark that they had never been recognized by the conscious mind or the rational tongue. I heard other sounds from that opened grave. I could bear no more. I retreated, staggering and stumbling, to the edge of the woods, and sheltered as best I could beneath the spreading arms of an oak, and did not think. Ben Griffin came out of the trees a few yards to my right. The storm had ceased. It had ended abruptly some time before. I did not know how long before, or how long I had been sitting beneath that tree. A few drops continued to fall infrequently, and the forest dripped and splattered. Across the field the house glistened and the courtyard gleamed. I stood up as he walked past. He seemed dazed and bewildered, and carried his hands clawed at his sides. The fingernails were torn and bloody from ripping at the wood. What else they had rent asunder I did not wish to know. I moved toward him my joints stiff with damp and my muscles protesting the long, motionless vigil, and he turned without surprise, peered at me without recognition. I spoke his name. What? Yes? What? he said, syllables without meaning. Come back to the house. What? Oh, you. I took his arm. You, he said, come to the house. Yes, all right. The doctor has been summoned. What? Why? Your wife. Oh, yes, I see. Yes, I had better be there. His eyes shifted over me, darting and rolling and blinking. I turned him toward the house, and he did not resist, retained my hold on his arm, and felt him gradually relax until he was striding out in a normal manner. We were halfway across the field when it occurred to me that I had left the lantern beneath the tree. I did not bother to return for it. What, after all, is a lantern? Dr. Whittle's carriage was at the door. I wondered vaguely whether he had come through that blinding torrent, or sufficient time had lapsed since the storm abated. Jacob ran out to meet us. He was excited and rather pleased, and informed us that Whittle was already with Catherine. Fen Griffin nodded, and his face changed from uneasiness to concern. I felt as if I could see his distressing thoughts, the thoughts I had sowed, running from his mind as the rivulets of water slunk around the flagstones at our feet dropping from his heart as the final heavy blobs were wrung from the voided clouds. Sunlight had pierced the sky, the day had brightened, and Fen Griffin's foul deed in the graveyard had served to dissipate his raging energies, had left him calm and reasonable, and allowed his thoughts to return to his wife and child. It had scarcely been a therapy one could prescribe, but it had worked, and perhaps it had been for the best— for there was no telling what alternative measures he might have chosen. We entered the house. The servants were scurrying about in preparation. Whittle's voice called out some instructions from above. Fingriffin and I went into the library and found that Jacob had coffee waiting and the fire alight. The wind was sucking flakes of flame up the chimney. Fingriffin smoked furiously, alternating between cigar and pipe, as though he could not determine which offered more tranquillity. He felt the normal nervousness which an expectant father feels, and it was magnified, no doubt, by his hope that the birth would effect a cure and return his wife to him. He tried to sit, but leapt up again each time, after a few seconds, and paced about the room. After several attempts at distracting him with conversation, I too sank into silence amidst my tobacco fumes. From time to time I looked at my watch. It seemed to be taking a long time, although I had no professional experience of such things. Fen Griffin, however, never so much as glanced at his timepiece as the afternoon wore on. 
he became, if anything, more calm, did not pace as much, and spent some time at the window, looking out into the gardens with composed features and motionless hands. There was a bird singing in the nearest tree, singing no doubt because the rain had brought the worms out, but cheerful nonetheless. And at last came the cry of a child. Finn Griffin was at the window as it sounded. His shoulders stiffened, and for a moment he did not move. Then he spun about and sprang to the door. I followed and entered the hallway in time to see him take the stairs three at a bound and rush down the corridor upstairs. His excitement proved contagious, and I followed at only slightly less speed, arriving at the top of the staircase as Mrs. Loon emerged from Catherine's room. Her face was white. Finn Griffin had to check his dash to avoid colliding with her, and she made no attempt to move from his way. A son, she said. A fine son. But there was something wrong with the way she said it. Her tone caused Finn Griffin to stare at her for a moment before he moved past. Dr. Whittle appeared at the doorway, standing directly in the entrance, as if he would bar access. He shot me a meaningful glance over Finn Griffin's shoulder, almost, I thought, an imploring glance, as Finn Griffin looked past him and into the room, looked from the doorway as he had looked on that other fateful occasion, and looked at a scene even more terrible. I moved to his side and shared this sight. Whittle still looked at me. Catherine was in bed with her child. It was her child. She held it in the tender arms of a mother, but her face was turned away, as if she could not bear to look. Fen Griffin looked. He was rigid beside me, and I felt myself stiffen and grow cold as my nerve impulses stumbled at the gaps. The baby bore the blood-red mark upon its cheek. Fen Griffin gnashed his teeth. Fen Griffin clenched his hands. Fen Griffin swayed for a moment, and then regained his balance and took one step into the room. Dr. Whittle, moving backwards, remained between him and the bed, and I advanced to his side. I thought we might be forced to overpower him, to attempt to subdue him, and Whittle thought the same. But Fen Griffin took only the one step forward. Accursed harlot, he whispered so softly that Catherine could not have heard him. He turned the eyes of a cornered beast upon Whittle. Is it possible? he asked. Whittle peered at him. Could her fears have caused the child to be marked in this manner? Could shock or fright have cursed my child with the mark of the woodsman? The doctor looked away, embarrassed. His eyes turned to the bed, then dropped. He did not know where to look within that room. Catherine whimpered keeping her face to the wall. Mrs. Loon was at the doorway, her albescent face set with tearful eyes and quivering lips. And Fen Griffin turned to me, grasped my collar in his torn hands. Minute details swell in times of stress, and I noticed that he had not troubled to wash the caked blood from his fingers, noticed as those very fingers twisted savagely in my garments, forcing me up and back. Tell me. Is such a thing conceivable? I do not know, I said. Within the realm of science, within knowledge of man, is it possible? Froth flecked his lips, but his voice was controlled and calm. He might have been Socrates, asking an absurd question to reveal the nature of truth. Diogenes holding up the twin lanterns of his eyes above an honest man, or he might have been benighted Heracles, wallowing in the Orgean filth. I tried to shrug, but my shoulders were held fast in his powerful grip, and the effort brought his hands closer to my throat. Perhaps, I said. Perhaps. Science is not a cul-de-sac. His hands tightened even more. I feared he would throttle me. I clamped my own hands upon his wrists, attempting to loosen his hold but his strength was superhuman, supernatural even, and my fingers closed over corded bars of steel. I felt the power run down his forearms and flow into torque at my breast, 
felt that very power run into my own body in a charged current of pure fear, as those fingers, still bloody from rending a coffin, tightened and twisted. I cried out. Whittle saw my distress. He laid his hand upon Fengriffin's shoulder to restrain him, and that hand virtually leaped away as Fen Griffin's trapezius muscles exploded along the line of his shoulders, reared up until his form seemed hardly human as it towered above me, around me. He drew my face to his. His eyes seemed to expand to preternatural dimensions into which I would be dragged. Have you ever known it to happen? he whispered, with the pulse beating at his throat and spittle at the corners of his mouth. Please, I gasped. He blinked. The pressure lessened. Despite the physical discomfort he was inflicting upon me, it was not an attack. No more does a drowning man in a dark sea attack the driftwood whose buoyancy is salvation. And his eyes were beseeching, his voice pleading. He had not realized the menace in his embrace, realized one thing only, realized that there was one possibility to which he might cling, one floating hope to keep him from the depths, one answer he must seek. But I could not bring that answer to my lips. Never have I felt so helpless, never have I so regretted what little knowledge I may have. I wished with all my heart to voice the lie, wished to deceive this pitiful creature, and with my deception give him peace. But there, across the room, was the child. There, upon the child's face, flowed the hereditary stigma of another man. There, in the poor infant's chromosomes, lurked the genes of a different and baser lineage, waiting to develop. What greater evil to give him hope now, knowing that hope would mutate to suspicion, that suspicion would undergo the lethal catalyst of observation, and become certainty, that certainty would be more terrible by far when, magnified by time, it filled the empty vessel where hope had dwelt. My lips parted, but the words faltered at the barrier of my throat. You have never known it to happen, Ben Griffin said. His voice mesmerized me. Slowly I shook my head just once from side to side, knowing that I was cursing this woman across the room as surely as the woodsman ever had, yet unable to do otherwise. Fen Griffin deserved the truth. He watched my head rotate through the gesture of negation, as he might have watched a cobra rear back to strike, fascinated by the venomous fangs of denial, pierced by the poison of knowledge, paralyzed by the toxic truth which ran through his veins. Slowly his hands unclenched. He pushed me from him with open palms, sending me spinning against the wall. His efforts had reopened his wounds. A smear of blood marked my linen. His eyes fastened upon this, widened. He raised his hands before his face, fingers hooked, flesh shredded, stared at them with disbelief, with incredulity, stared as he might have stared at some alien objects which had attached themselves as parasites upon the end of his arms. Why, I had forgotten that he said in amazement. He shook his head. He turned toward his wife. For that, he whispered, staring at her. Catherine looked at him then, for the first time since he had entered the room. She jerked spasmodically. A solitary teardrop ran unheeded down her cheek. Her eyes were wide receptacles, gathering the shaft of loathing he hurled at her, and she held the child closer to her breast, held it not protectively, but as a shield against his hatred. Ben Griffin held his hands up for her to see. For you I have torn my ancestor from his grave, he cried. And then he was gone. The echo of his cry howled in the room and his footfalls were heavy on the stairs. The echo died. The downstairs door banged as its great weight closed. 
I looked at Dr. Whittle. Dr. Whittle looked at me. Mrs. Loon came into the room. She was moaning. Her hands were clasped at her breast. She passed us, moving to the bed, and I forced my eyes from our gaze of mutual horror. Ah, is horror synalagmatic? And followed her. I felt I must do something, and it was a greater feeling than that inspired by professional obligation. I leaned over the bed. Catherine? Leave me, she said. Her voice was rational, but there ran a quake beneath the surface, an undercurrent beginning to stir. Please hear me. Leave me. It is my child, no matter what else it may be. It is my child. Leave us alone. You must face the truth, I said loudly, wishing to shock her, to bring that subterranean trembling safely out in an avalanche of tears. For despite the mark which proclaimed her guilt, I still believed her, believed, that is, that she thought her fantasy was fact, that in subconsciously denying the truth she had fashioned a delusion far more terrible than any fact could be. She shook her head violently from side to side. Mrs. Loon perched on the edge of the bed and slipped one arm around her shoulders in futile comfort, shot a vicious glance at me, and then looked suggestively towards the doorway. "'The truth, Catherine!' I shouted. "'For the sake of your sanity and your child!' "'I know the truth!' she screamed. Spittle sprayed from her lips in the intensity of her conviction. The child's face crinkled, preparing for tears. Catherine raised her face, and madness danced in her eyes. It is true, true, true! She gasped and choked. Dr. Whittle tugged gently at my sleeve. Perhaps later, he said. I nodded. Perhaps too late. I felt a great exhaustion drop over me, and my shoulders sagged. Whittle was right. There was nothing I could do. I followed him to the door as Mrs. Loon drew Catherine tenderly to her bosom and stroked her hair. Whittle closed the door behind us and sighed, led the way toward the stairs. I paused for no reason as we passed through the gallery, and just then came the muffled sound of Ben Griffin's horse crossing the courtyard at the gallop, crossing the courtyard toward the woods. Whittle and I sat in the library. The afternoon angles had slanted into evening, and now night spun a shroud for the window. Whittle was waiting for me to speak, looking at me in silence and thinking that I was delving into dark fields where strange blooms grew at night, thinking that I would pluck abstruse theory like a mythical flower from the fecund soil of science. Perhaps my demeanor was such as to give this impression— for I was staring intently at the window, and my brow was creased. But I looked at a window no more, did not even penetrate the glass with my gaze. It was beyond theory. The fact seemed undeniable. What Catherine believed, that she had been visited by a demon lover, was absolute truth for her. What that hideous birthmark signified was absolute truth for me. The two truths existed on different levels. Dual dimensions which could not be joined. Whether or not that absolved her of guilt was not a question for science, nor one I would wish to answer. It was one which her husband must answer, however. God help him. Presently Whittle broke the silence. It couldn't be possible, I suppose, he asked in weary tones. What's that? It couldn't be possible that she might have marked her child through fright. An old wives' tale. An accepted theory, it is impossible. In fact, well, that is more to your experience than mine. Can you offer him hope? Have you ever known a child to be marked in that way? No, he said, and sighed. And yet it seems incredible that she could have allowed the woodsman to— to, that she could have taken that creature from the woods into her room and submitted to, 
incredible. But she didn't, I said. On the level of her own awareness, she did not. Whoever it was, the woodsman we must suppose, who crept through her window in the night, she truly believes to be the incubus which her unbalanced mind has summoned. God help the poor woman, Whittle said, and God help poor Charles. Can she be cured of this madness? Will he have tolerance enough to judge her innocent in intent, if not in deed? He is not a tolerant man. You know, of course, where he has gone. I fear so. Whittle had his snuff-box out, had placed it on the ornate regency table, and was squaring it with the corner. You have known him for years, doctor, I said. Is he a man who will kill? Whittle shrugged. Revenge begets revenge. He is a fen griffin, said the doctor. And into the silence which followed walked Mrs. Loon. She was clutching a Bible in her hand, and her eyes were rubescent in the wake of tears. She crossed the room with a determined stride and stood over me. The mistress is sleeping now, she said. Good, I replied, although I had no idea whether it was particularly good or not, for the footsteps of merciful Hypnos are dogged by his son. Morpheus stalks without pity through the gentle glades of slumber. Please, sir, may I have a word? Certainly. She clutched the Bible tighter, clutched it as a preacher grips the rostrum when about to hurl his theology like a gauntlet before the congregation. I know as you're a doctor, and trying to do what's right. But, sir, if I may say so, there are things you don't understand as well as some. If I may speak my mind, and no offence, sir, the poor mistress has— I mean, there are things— I am conversant with the details of the curse, I said to help her out and hurry it on. Mrs. Loon nibbled her lip. You see, sir, if you could convince the master that it is true, that the poor mistress is innocent. I will not deceive him, I told her rather firmly. I did not want her to continue, for it was pointless. I will do my best to instill tolerance and understanding in Fengriffin, but I cannot serve him duplicity. Mrs. Loon looked towards Dr. Whittle. I'm sorry, he said. Mrs. Loon knew few words. The thought was in her head, and she struggled for expression, cast her eyes about the walls as though to take by osmosis the needed vocabulary from the learned volumes on the shelves. Her mouth opened, and a piercing shriek reverberated through the house. I started, and Dr. Whittle started and Mrs. Loon, her mouth still open, trembled spasmodically. That scream had not come from her. I leaped up and dashed into the hallway, as a second cry sounded, less shrill, as agony replaced shock in the timber. The scream came tumbling down the stairs, turning over and over as it fell headlong and came to a sudden crashing halt against my eardrums. I rushed up the stairs moved against that descending sound as against a river current, feeling that I swam upstream in the sound waves. A third cry did not come. It was only Whittle's footsteps behind me that punctuated silence as I threw open Catherine's door. Catherine was alone in her bed. The child was gone. The room was cold unbelievably cold, colder than air should be, and despite this frigid chill, a foul odor billowed about, an odor so heavy that it seemed to be visible. I crossed the room and threw the shutters closed. The fetid stench caused me to gag, and for a moment I leaned against the sill for support, shook my head to clear the lingering fumes before I turned to Catherine. The baby, she said. It has taken my baby. I sat on the edge of the bed and took her hand. Her flesh was molded from melting ice. She began to babble indistinctly. Whittle stopped in the doorway, recoiling at the olfaction of decay. 
Who has taken the child? I asked. Catherine grimaced and contorted. I could see the flesh creep convulsively on her arm, as if the skin were now fastened to the bone. Was it the woodsman? She stared at me without comprehension. Who took the child? I repeated. He took it. He. Who, for God's sake? The father, she moaned. I took her by the shoulders and shook her. Her hair slipped over her forehead, and her neck swayed back and forth. She did not resist, but seemed to welcome the violent motion, and began to throw herself about. I stopped shaking her, but she continued to jerk rigorously, and her head banged against the headboards, so that I was forced to restrain her movements. She trembled under my hands. I forced a penetrating sharpness into my voice, and threw the words down through the clouds which hung over her mind. The woodsman, I said. The woodsman took the child. The woodsman is the father. It has been the woodsman all along. You have enchanted yourself into fantasy. The woodsman, the woodsman. It was a man, a living man, no more. But Catherine did not hear me. Beneath those clouds, her mind had turned in upon itself. Like a wounded shark twisting to devour its own flesh, she tore at the weave of her sanity. The woodsman, I shouted. The father, she said. My baby. His baby. The father. He came for his child. He has taken the baby. Gone, gone, gone. Where, where, where? Catherine! Her eyes were suddenly lucid. She frowned. Where? she asked. I wonder where they have gone. And the shutters came down again. She cringed and twitched and babbled. I sighed and stood up. Mrs. Loon appeared, trembling as violently as Catherine, approached the bed warily, Bible held before her. Stay with her, I said. Mrs. Loon turned her old eyes upon me. They mirrored a belief I could never dispel. Perhaps it was better that way. She cradled Catherine in her arms. Poor innocent, she said. In the hall, Whittle took my arm. For God's sake, what caused that odor? he asked. I don't know. An unwashed body, steeped in the muck and slime of rotting vegetation, befouling itself of filthy habit. What else could it be? He shook his head. I have dealt with the corruption of death, undiscovered behind closed doors for weeks, have amputated limbs so festered with rotten pus that the flesh separated at the touch, but never have I encountered such a stench. To think that a creature wrapped in that odor has been with Catherine. He shuddered. It must have been the woodsman, come for his child as the climax of revenge. What can we do? Whittle asked. We moved towards the stairs through the dark arch of the gallery. Where do you suppose he will take the child? To his cabin? Or will he do worse? What action can we predict for that debased mind? We had started down the stairs. I doubt the child is in immediate danger, other than possible exposure. We must recover it as soon as possible, but I doubt the woodsman will deliberately injure it. It is, after all, his own son. He would have no reason to wish it harm. We'll more than likely wish to keep the child as the incarnation of his fulfilled vengeance. Exposure is danger enough, Whittle said. Pray that he maintains enough human sense or animal instinct to keep the child warmly wrapped. But, Dr. Pope, there is another danger we must consider. He turned to face me at the foot of the stairs. Fengriffin has gone for the woodsman, he said. If he is waiting there now, in his state of mind, who knows what he might do? We must make haste, must pursue the woodsman and overtake him before he returns to where Fengriffin waits, and avert... avert God knows what act. I nodded agreement. 
I knew well what Fen Griffin was capable of when blind rage and agony possessed him, had seen him in the graveyard, and felt the strength of his limbs in the bedroom. It was an innocent baby, but it bore the hated mark of Catherine's shame, and it was well that we should hasten. We headed for the door, and suddenly Whittle stopped. He winced and closed his eyes. The sound of Catherine's incoherent babbling had pursued us. It was warped, a mutation of human sound, mangled and twisted out of shape as it passed through closed doors, through the floor, through the dense stone of the house itself, elongated as it slid through grain, compressed as it seeped through rock, bent upon itself as it turned the corners and shattered as it dropped through space. It was a sound to climb the backbone with feathery touch and run like morbid plague through the blood. It was a sound that Whittle had heard before. He did not have to tell me. I knew. The sound that Sarah had made as she lay defiled, and Silas' severed fingers fell upon her lap. We paused just outside the massive door, with the vast house towering like a monolith above us. I took a deep breath of the air, welcoming the untainted freshness, noticed that Whittle did the same. We both turned toward the stables, but with second thought I stopped him. It may well be wiser to follow on foot, I said. He is only a brief start, and must carry the child. There will be delay while horses are saddled, and it will be more difficult to follow his tracks from the saddle. Whittle nodded. We reversed direction, to take up the trail in the muddy earth beneath Catherine's window, had moved only a few strides, when hoofbeats clanked on the flagstones, and Finn Griffin loomed up in the darkness, very still and straight upon his horse. He did not notice us until I called his name, then he halted and dismounted, let the reins trail free to the ground. The horse stood very still. It is done, Finn Griffin said. His rage was gone. He was very calm. What have you done, Charles? Dr. Whittle asked in the tones of the confessional. Done? I have done murder. What else? He shrugged. What else? he repeated. And from inside his cloak he drew a revolver, looked at it as if he were pondering the function of such an instrument. The revolver looked very large, very hard, very real. He stared at it, and his wrist turned slowly, until the weapon was directed at his face. I attempted to seize him, but he stepped back, shaking his head. No, no, don't worry. I shall not take my own life, he said. I was merely looking into the barrel, you see, wondering how it looked to the woodsman in his final moment of life. It is most curious. Have you any idea how large this little black hole appears? It is so much more than a rifled bore through a cylinder of metal. It is a tear in the stuff of space and time, a black hole in creation, a bottomless shaft which can suck a man's soul down, down, down to whatever other dimensions may exist, or may not. Most curious indeed. And the woodsman looked into the chasm, and he smiled. I find that peculiar, to smile into a rent in the universe. Don't you think that peculiar, gentlemen? His dog snarled and cringed, but the woodsman smiled, and I shot him dead. I shot him directly in that odious blemish which has destroyed my life, so that the blood flowed out and covered it. And still he smiled. He was dead, but the smile was set up on his lips. He will carry that smile to the grave. And then, gentlemen, I stood there for a long time. There was an axe in the corner, perhaps the same axe which my grandfather used. And I stood there for a long, long time and wondered if I should use the axe to remove his smile. But in the end, I did not. Ben Griffin smiled placidly. I'm rather pleased that I didn't, you know. 
it would have served little purpose. And the child, Whittle whispered. Fen Griffin reversed the gun in his hand and passed it to me. I slipped it into my pocket. I am no barbarian, he said. I could not harm an innocent child. My wife must leave, and take her child as soon as she is able, of course, but I bear no malice towards the infant. But where is the child? Whittle asked. It was a desperate query, for he had already seen the anachronism of our suppositions. Where? I don't understand you, Doctor. Did not. I silenced Whittle with a gesture. How long has it been since, since you killed him? Fengriffin looked confused. I have no idea, he said. How long has passed since I left the house? I rode directly to his cabin. What difference can it make? Whittle and I regarded one another. What is there that I fail to understand? Fen Griffin asked, swinging his head between us. There was a great deal we failed to understand. Words were not necessary. Whittle and I moved to the corner of the house, moved side by side, coupled by the same emotion, while Fen Griffin looked after us in bewilderment. The earth was soaked with the storm. Our boots left deep indentations in our wake, deep and unavoidable. We rounded the corner and stood beneath Catherine's window. It was not a great drop. It would have been a simple matter for an agile man to jump from that height onto the soft earth. Then we looked at the ground. There were no prints. There were no prints but our own. No man had dropped from that window. Could she? Could Catherine have destroyed the child? In some manner, Whittle whispered in horror. I do not know. I know nothing. Fen Griffin came around the corner of the house and stared dumbly at us, and we stared at the ground. And as we stood there, the wind rose again. It was above us in the highest trees, and yet in its passing came a wave of unearthly cold, damp cold as of the mouldering grave. The gnarled oaks moaned, and from a great distance came the forlorn howl of a dog. The wind passed in a moment, and was gone. Gone God knows where, scattered and lifted and freed. I looked out across those moors and shivered. The dog stopped howling. Only Catherine's mad laughter came to replace the wind echoing through the fabric of that accursed house. A. C. Benson, The Uttermost Farthing Recently the world seems to have rediscovered E. F. Benson, the creator of those two lovable busybodies Map and Lucia. Still awaiting a literary resurrection is E. F.'s brother, A. C. Benson, and yet, if most people did but know it, they are probably more aware of A.C.'s work than almost any other writer, for it was A.C. Benson who wrote the words Land of Hope and Glory to Sir Edward Elgar's famous Pomp and Circumstance March. Arthur Christopher Benson, 1862-1925, was the oldest of the three surviving Benson brothers, Arthur, Freddie, and Hugh the sons of Edward White Benson, who was Archbishop of Canterbury from 1883 to 1896. All three brothers were prolific writers, and all three produced a number of weird and supernatural stories. Whilst Freddy's stories have had a welcome revival, Arthur's and Hugh's are still sadly neglected. The Uttermost Farthing was not published during Arthur's lifetime, but was found amongst his papers by his brother Freddy, who ensured its publication in a slim collection of just two stories called Basil Netherby in 1926. 1. Yes, Hebden Hill was the next station, the porter told me, and as the dowdy little train puffed sturdily across the wide green flat, intersected by dikes, which had once been a great bay of the sea, I watched with pleasure the low shapely bluffs, 
like miniature sea-cliffs, but now covered with thickets and copses, which bounded the plain to the west half a mile away, and thought how like it was to the background of an old Italian picture. It was a warm summer evening, not oppressive, as there was a fresh breeze from the sea, along which white clouds sailed lazily landward. I could see, far out in the plain, hamlets and solitary farms nestling among trees, and it was pleasant to see the birds, crested plovers, and pearly grey gulls that stood motionless, all facing up the wind in the pastures, and a lean grey heron by the old sluice-gate, pouring upon the water. And then I began to wonder how it was that I was going on so vaguely defined a visit to Hector Bendishy, whom I knew so slightly. What exactly did I know about him? He was just an agreeable man, whom one was never surprised to meet at dinner, and whose talk, mildly interesting, seldom flagged. He had been at Winchester and at Oxford. He had been perhaps in the diplomatic service, and had certainly travelled a good deal. He was clearly wealthy, for he had a flat in town, and a house understood to be of an attractive kind in Sussex, at Hebden Hill. But he had done nothing particular for twenty years. He was a man of fifty. He read a good many books. He was fond of music. He was something of a connoisseur. But the more I reflected, the less I seemed to know. He had no relations that I had ever heard of, and no intimate friends, though a host of acquaintances. He went everywhere and got on with everybody. He did not seem mysterious or secretive in any way. He talked easily and frankly about his own concerns and pursuits, and indeed on most topics of general interest. How, then, had my visit come about? I was myself a so-called literary man, who lived, not very prosperously, in rooms in town, reviewing, writing literary articles, putting together an occasional book, and enabled by my small earnings and a little private income to exist in tolerable comfort. I was just over forty, and the artistic ambitions I had once had had long vanished, but I was more than content with my life and my interest in other people was stronger than ever. The unexpected things that happened, the strange contrasts and contradictions of character, the amazing inconsistency of human beings and their intricate relations, so utterly different from and so much richer than the helpless conventional traditions of fiction, all this had kept alive in me a sense of romance in life which amply atoned for a career which had been disappointing and even humiliating. I had met Bendishy at a dinner party some time in May. I had walked away with him, and he had asked me to his rooms. They were well furnished and comfortable, but with a certain austerity that took my fancy. Our talk had turned somehow on psychical things, in which I was a good deal interested, and before we had talked ten minutes I became aware that Bendishy had dropped the mask of amiable levity which characterized his habitual conversation, and was speaking seriously and dryly but with a profound sense of conviction, which was quite unlike anything I had ever heard from him. Suddenly he turned to me, a little sternly, I thought, and said, But perhaps you are not interested in these things. Yes and no, I said, but to tell the truth, I am a little surprised to find that you are. Well, he said, I don't wonder at that. You see, it has become of late rather a hobby of mine. I will tell you why some day, if you care to know. But tell me one thing. Why do you say yes and no? Because, I said, in the first place, I think that ordinary talk about psychical things is such fearful twaddle. It seems to me a scientific affair. But when foolish people talk about it, it's all a mixture of feeble sentiment and weak imagination. That's so, he said. But if you feel about it like that, why don't you look into it? Because the sort of experiments people try, I said, such as seances and trances and automatic writing, seem to me more sickening still, like drug-taking. It's like deliberately playing with the ugliest part of one's mind, the part that deals in fear. I don't want to wake that up. I want to think it is not there. And moreover, I am so much interested in people as I see and know them, that I don't want to explore the unknown. You want to live in a fool's paradise, in fact, said Bendishy, and I could see from the pallor of his face and his distended nostrils that I had angered him, but he controlled himself. 
No, he added, I ought not to say that. It was rude and stupid. I apologize. No, please don't do that, I said. It was my fault. What I said was very crude. It was like talking to a man of science about stinks, or to an actor about his patter, the insolence of the amateur. That's unpardonable. Well, but I really want to know, he said rather gravely. I agreed with you up to a certain point. But what you said amounted to this, that you are so much interested in people when they are alive that you don't take any interest in what happens to them after they are dead. Yes, I said, that is quite fair. I am immensely interested in what I can see and observe and infer in people. It seems to me dramatic, exciting, sometimes very beautiful. But I'm a homeless man and a bachelor, and I don't get very near to them. I only see the polite side of life. And when people disappear, as they unhappily do, and I can't follow them further, why, I turn my back to what I can see and know. I understand perfectly, he said, but it's just the other way with me. People seem to me so amazing, so incredibly fine at times, and so unutterably low at others, that I can't believe it all begins and ends here, and I find myself consumed by the most intense curiosity to use rather a feeble word, to know what the next act is. It seems to me all like a big rehearsal for something, full of trivial, grotesque, and annoying things. Two people playing nap, a girl eating a sandwich as she waits for her cue. But the play is going on all the time, and everybody has his part. I feel that I must know what is behind it all, if it can be known. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I have thought many times of putting a pistol to my head in order to find out what does happen. But I doubt if it can be found out that way. He was silent for a little, musing inwardly. I watched him as he sat. He was a tall, lean man, finely formed and mottled. He had close, crisply curling black hair, a little grizzled. His forehead was high his eyebrows black, and he had large dark eyes which it seemed to me I had never seen fully opened before. He was clean-shaven, and his nose, straight and clean-cut, came down on a short upper lip, but the underlip was full, and the chin perhaps a little large for symmetry. He had a slightly worn air, but his face, which was hardly marked by wrinkles, had a fresh color like that of a man who lived much in the open air. If anything, his expression was a little judicial, but when I had seen him on previous occasions, his prevailing expression was one of tolerant good humor and friendliness. It had never occurred to me that he could be formidable, and indeed my impression had been that, if anything, he overvalued serenity and equanimity. There was nothing ascetic or scholarly about him. His hands were large and mobile, and had, I thought, more expression than his face, and his dress had a touch of negligence about it which became him well. I had never thought him a particularly interesting man, because he never gave himself away or appeared to have any preferences. But now I had seen something very different, something alert, passionate, even terrifying. But when he began to talk again, his mood had changed, and he was his old wary and kindly self. By the way, he said, what do you generally do in the summer? Oh, I stay about a little, I said but I have to stick pretty close to my work, you know. I'm a literary hack, and I have to be waiting on the stand in case of a call. If I happen to be in funds, I go to a quiet hotel somewhere. I rather like exploring the country. Old houses and churches are the next most interesting things to people, but I generally end by being a little bored. I wish you would come down and stay with me for a week or two, he said. I have got rather a nice old house in Sussex, and it's a pleasant country. It is very quiet, and you could work if you wanted to, or wander about. I should like to talk this matter over with you. Thank you very much, I said. I should enjoy it immensely. Where did you say it was? Hebden Hill, he said. Not very far from Ashford. It's a biggish village. I'll drop you a line. 2. That was at the end of May. I heard nothing more for a month, and began to think he had forgotten all about it, or that he was perhaps sorry that he had shown me the inner side of himself. 
But at the end of June I had a note asking me to go down on July the 7th, and an hour or two later a wire. Am unexpectedly alone, and should be glad to see you tomorrow, Thursday, if you can manage it, but don't alter arrangements. Would meet the train arriving 6.30. Hope you can stay a fortnight. It seemed to me a little peremptory, perhaps. No, I had no engagements, and I was glad to get out of the heat of London, so I wired an acceptance, packed my books and papers, and went. And now that I was embarked, I began to have a curious feeling that I was in for an adventure of some kind, not very pleasant. However, I arrived in the summer twilight. Bendishi was on the platform to meet me, and I could see from the civility of the officials that he was not only an important personage, but a highly popular one. He had a pleasant word for everybody, and he introduced me formally to the station-master, saying gravely, "'It's very important that my friend Mr. Hartley should form a good impression of the place. You know he writes in all the papers, and could make our fortunes by a paragraph.' "'Indeed, sir,' said the delighted station-master. "'I'm sure you're very welcome to Hebden Hill, sir.' We're old-fashioned, but going ahead a bit nowadays. Bendishy had a good car waiting. The station was at the bottom of the hill, and he motored me swiftly up a steep irregular street of red brick and timbered houses with pleasant gardens, a most comfortable and homely place. At the top of the hill we turned into a small square or piazza with five or six substantial eighteenth-century houses. Fronting the west end of the church was a long mellow brick wall with big gate-posts, and a gate of fine ironwork. Behind this there appeared a handsome façade, a brick Georgian mansion with a pediment, a solid pillared doorway, seven windows above and three on each side of the door, and a round window in the pediment. It was evidently the chief mansion of the village. The windows had old heavy casements painted white, and the house was flanked at each end by fine old sycamores. Here we are, said Bindishi. It's called the manor house, but it's not my idea of a manor house at all. Inside appeared a white-painted, marble-flagged hall, heavily panelled and pillared, with two mahogany doors on each side and a broad balustrated staircase ascending under an arch at the end. It was all a little bare. There were a few portraits and some solid Chippendale chairs. A venerable and portly butler met us. "'Perhaps you would like to stroll round before you go and dress,' said Bendishy. "'It's a good thing to get one's bearings clear at once.' He showed me first to a room to the left of the front door, a small dining-room panelled with dark oak. Here there were more portraits, and a fine Italian bust of a young man in red porphyry, evidently a masterpiece. The next room was a little library, almost lined with books, with a big French window which opened onto the garden— "'This is your room,' said Bendishy, "'and you can have it entirely to yourself to work in. "'My own study is upstairs.' "'The door to the right of the front door led to a smoking-room, "'a comfortable place with a few red leather armchairs "'and some old dark landscape pictures in oil. "'This is everybody's room,' said Bendishy. "'That other door leads to the back regions, "'but now we'll have a look at the garden.' We went out through a door under the stairs. I could not restrain an exclamation of delight. We came out into a portico supported by pillars extending along the whole centre of the house, between two flanking shallow wings. It was paved with black and white marble, and furnished with some comfortable oak seats and tables. The garden was not large, but beautifully designed. On each side it was walled, and shielded from intrusive eyes by a row on either hand of sycamores, fine old trees. The lawn was perfectly plain, but for a fine leaden statue of a youth with clasped hands looking upwards towards the house, a most enchanting piece of work. At the far end, sheltered by a low wall, was a great flower border, blazing with colour, and as we drew near I could see that the ground fell rapidly, to a tiny park with clumps of trees on either hand, and beyond a magnificent view of a great green plain with low wooded ridges and blue shadowy hills to the right, while a mile or two to the left we could see a wide expanse of sea. I said something feeble about the wonderful beauty of the place and its magnificence. Well, that's rather a tall word, said Bendishy. It isn't a big house, really, and the domain extends to about fifty acres. 
but it is cleverly designed and makes the best use of every inch of earth and sky. Has it been long in your family? I said. No, indeed, said Bendishy. I bought it just as it stands, furniture and all, from the last member of an old family, the Faulkners, that had come to hopeless grief. It was in an awful state, the house almost ruinous, the park full of weeds and thorn bushes. No one would look at it. But I heard of it by what we call accident, just when I wanted a house, about fifteen years ago, and saw its possibilities. I got it very cheap, and I really have not spent much money upon it. But I have got uncommonly fond of it, and feel as if I had lived here all my life, and a little more. The light was beginning to fade as we went back to the house, which I found was all lit by electric light, carefully subdued and shaded. We went upstairs. There was a corridor above the hall, only not so wide, with three doors on either side, and one to the right, close to the head of the stairs, and these I must describe with some particularity. The first door on the left as we came up. The staircase had turned round to the right, so that we were facing in the direction of the front door led to two staircases, one going up to the attics and one descending to the offices. The second door on the left led to Bendishy's bedroom, a very bare place with a press or two and a few books. Then came a bathroom with a door from the bedroom, and opposite the door another door led into Bendishy's study, which communicated with the corridor by what was the third door on the left. The study was entirely filled with books had a big table covered with papers, and two very uncompromising oak writing chairs. A room less luxurious I have seldom seen. It had no ornament but a single picture, a very beautiful portrait of a girl, fair-haired and blue-eyed, with an expression of the most perfect naturalness and simplicity, and full of animation and delight. The room had two windows, one looking out to the church, the other down towards the village. We went out again into the corridor. The door opposite Bendishy's study was my bedroom, one window of which looked towards the church, and the other on the great sycamore by the corner of the house. A little bathroom was attached. The room was furnished with great comfort, and had some fine water colors. Returning down the corridor, the two other doors opened into the bedrooms similar to mine, each with a bathroom, and at the end— Close to the head of the stairs, the remaining door led into another bedroom, which looked out onto the garden. But this room was wholly unfurnished, just a bare-bordered, white-panelled place, with that peculiar and unpleasant staleness that develops in an unventilated, sun-baked room. "'I don't like this room,' said Bendishy. "'It was the room, to tell you the truth, in which the scoundrel from whose heirs I bought the property came to his miserable end.' It's a squalid story, and as for the room, well, I think there is something sinister about it. What do you feel? Yet it's a pity not to use it, because it has the finest view in the house. I don't know, said I. I think that the best way to exorcise disagreeable associations is not to fasten things up, but to let in a new current of pleasant usage. Yes, said Bendishy. If I had children— I should make this their schoolroom. Then it would be all right. An hour later we dined. A well-appointed meal, though a simple one, very promptly served. I don't know what you feel, he said to me, but it always seems to me rather uncivilized to dawdle over food. He himself ate rapidly, but with appetite, and drank a glass or two of wine. After dinner we withdrew to the smoking-room. Bendishy was in his familiar mood, full of little anecdotes and reminiscences. When we had established ourselves with coffee and cigars, he said, Now let me first say how glad I am to see you here. I have a notion that we agree, more than perhaps appeared the other night, about that matter we spoke of, and I think you can help me very much if you are disposed to do so. I think you are a fair-minded man and impartial. Would you mind telling me exactly where you stand? Or perhaps you are tired and would like to defer it. Tomorrow night, I ought to say, the parson, Fortescue by name, is coming to dine, a very interesting and remarkable man, so that if you would like to leave it alone, we must wait till the day after tomorrow. 
The evening is the only time to talk seriously about things. I should like to start at once, I said. But tell me, what did you mean by saying I could be of use to you? Why, said Bendishi, living alone as I do, and with but few people to talk things over with, one gets into a tangle. I generally have a visitor or two here, because solitude unadulterated is not a wholesome thing. But they are not the sort of people I can really talk to, and just now I have got hold of some new material. I am always collecting materials, and it doesn't seem to fit in with my ideas. But the point is this. How much and how little do you believe? Oh, I said, my position is a simple one. It's all just a question of evidence. Any materials ought to be rigidly scrutinized. One mustn't either accept or dismiss evidence summarily, and then one may begin to draw conclusions. Yes, said Bindishi, that's very much what I believe. But it's uncommonly hard to trace these psychical stories to their source. I have tried to unravel a good many, and it gives one a deplorable opinion of the value of human evidence. But, he went on, before we begin, I must tell you in as few words as I can how I came to set to work. I don't like to talk about it. It's like tearing open an old wound, but I must make this plain. Some twenty-five years ago I became engaged to a girl, the daughter of a parson. You saw her picture, perhaps, in my room. You must take it on trust from me that she was a wonderful creature, and gave me not only a new view of life, but something to live for. We arranged everything. We were to have lived in London, and I was actually thinking of standing for Parliament, when just a month before our marriage she caught diphtheria and died within the week. I can't tell you what an appalling catastrophe it was for me. It had seemed to me that her love was the one thing I had been waiting for all my life, the one thing that had given me a reason for living. You see, I was an only son, entirely trusted and indulged by my parents, and with plenty of money about and no motive for exerting myself. The thing very nearly drove me mad. A week before she had been with me, answering every question I had asked of life, and giving me the very water of life to drink. And now she was gone without a word. The last time I saw her she didn't even know me. She was in torture and half unconscious, and there was nothing left, not a glance or a sign or the faintest message to me whom she loved best, or to any other human being, and there were many that loved her. It was so utterly unlike her, and yet there it was. Her parents were what is called wonderful. They had a strong religious faith, and it helped them through. Bendishi stopped with a kind of gasp, gripped the arms of his chair, and abandoned himself for a minute to a paroxysm of misery. It all comes over me again, he said. Don't look at me. I shall be all right in a minute. Presently he went on in a low voice. I hardly know what I did. I travelled. I did some exploration. I courted death, but it never came near me. But I never had the smallest sense of contact with her, or even of any thought coming from beyond. Then I came back and tried to occupy myself in many ways, what is called social service. But I'm a hopeless individualist, and I don't care about my fellow men simply as such, and I was taken in many times. Then I started this work, and it began to seem to me the one thing worth doing, to find out, if I could, whether there was any possible contact with the spirits of the dead, whether they existed at all. I had all kinds of sickening experiences, but could find nothing definite. And I never could cross the threshold, though I came to believe that under certain obscure conditions living minds could communicate direct with each other apart from material agencies. And then the case seemed worse to me than ever, because it all seemed to depend upon material existence as a necessary condition. Then, after a moment's pause, he went on slowly and rather wearily. 
and what makes things even worse is this. There are a good many stories of appearances which seem to have some element of truth about them, but most of these are connected with horrible and tragic occurrences, crimes, murders, solitary imprisonments, as if, supposing for a moment the things to be true, it were a punishment of some kind to have to return to the earth and to reenact the scenes of desperation and wickedness. And even the unhappy victims of such outrages seem condemned to the same fate, as if the only motive force that could bring one back were fear and indelible horror, reconstructing incidents which one would give anything to forget, but cannot. If there were stories of spirits returning to earth to revive gratefully scenes of happiness and love, delightful experiences of youth and friendship and ingenious aspiration, when the heart was full of hope and joy, it would be different. But no spirits ever seem to think of this. Are they ungrateful? Have they forgotten? Religious people would perhaps say, I said, that the happiness of the farther world was so great that a blessed spirit would never care to return to these half-lit skies and to the memory of joys that were always shadowed by some fear of loss and separation. But this is an utterly selfish and indifferent business, said Bendishy. We should despise it in a living human being, and even if it were so, have they no wish to comfort the hearts that ache with the memories of perished happiness? No. If the spirits of even the blessed are so drugged and intoxicated with delight that they have no room for remembrance or tenderness, it is a more ghastly business still. We sat for a little while in silence. I expect it's about time to go to bed, he said. I ought not to go on soliloquizing like this. He escorted me to my room and said another friendly word about my visit, adding, Breakfast at nine. Please ask for anything you want. Hope you'll sleep well, and you will find some good bedside books there if you want them. I was soon in bed, and I fell asleep in a mood of pleasurable anticipation. This was going to be a novel experience, I felt sure, and Bendish's theories interested me. And almost immediately, so it seemed, I woke from a dreamless sleep with old Bartlett the butler in my room, coughing deferentially, and asking if I would have a cup of tea, and whether I would have a hot or cold bath, and if there was anything else I required. 3. That morning at breakfast I found Bendishy in a cheerful and eminently commonplace mood. He told me stories about the village and the people and the countryside. I asked some questions about one of the portraits, an old rugged-looking man with prominent eyes and upstanding hair. What the Dickens, I call him said Bendishy, smiling. But we'll leave all that to the vicar, who is coming to dinner this evening. He knows far more about the house and the family than I do. He has been here thirty years. In fact, his wife, now dead, was connected in some way with the Faulkners. After breakfast I went off to do some writing, but I did very little, and my mind ran with curious persistency on what Bendishy had told me on the previous night. He did not look like a man who had ever had a great shock or passed through tragic experiences. Indeed, his preoccupation with psychical matters seemed to me still a little unaccountable, and inconsistent with the fact that he evidently lived a busy and active life and took a considerable share in local business. He came and fetched me out about noon, and we strolled to the church and village. He had a word for all the people he met. He called the boys and girls by their Christian names, his hat went off to any woman. They met an old man hobbling along with two sticks. "'Why, Mr. Barry,' said Bendishy, "'I'm glad to see you about again. Feeling better? You look quite your old self again.' "'Thank you kindly, sir. Yes, I'm better, Mr. Bendishy, but feeling powerful giddy at times.' "'Ah, that'll soon pass off in the open air,' said Bendishy. "'Now, shall I step in this evening for a bit of a gossip, Mr. Barry?' I always get the news of the place from you. Hartley, this is Mr. Barry. I call him the father of the place. He will be a hundred and one years old in January next. Isn't that so? Mr. Barry chuckled. Don't you believe Mr. Bendishy, sir? 
he said to me with a smile. He will have his joke. Tis only eighty-eight I am, last February. So Bendishi went on, but not for a moment did it seem an assumed heartiness, rather the natural overflowing of a neighborly geniality, while a word of sympathy which he said to an old lady in rusty black was both tender and straightforward. With the children he was entirely delightful, with mysterious jests and illusions. I said something about this. Oh, yes, he said. A child likes to share a secret with a grown-up person, a secret which no one else knows. I'm not sure we don't all like it, he added with a smile. A secret's rather an explosive thing. We went to the church, a fine ancient place which had evidently been carefully restored. One aisle was full of monuments to the Faulkner family, from a knight in armor in a canopied niche to a weeping nymph by Chantry. Fancy throwing away an inheritance like that, he said, as we looked at the old tombs. But the whole history of the family is a steady process of climbing down. I'll show you the remains of their old mansion, about half a mile away, one of these days. The vicar thinks it is the doom of sacrilege, but that's rather too businesslike of you for me. I grew more astonished as the day went on to find the polite and solitary diner out, transformed here into so bustling and genial a squire. I could not fit the puzzle together, and still less did he seem to me a man who carried about, hidden in his mind, so strange and haunting an aspiration. In the afternoon it was very hot. We went round the house and looked at the portraits. They were not particularly good, but the family likeness was strong, and the picture of the last of the Faulkner race, as a boy of sixteen, was a graceful and beautiful thing. It represented him in riding dress, standing beside a pony, slender, blue-eyed, and light-haired, with a gentle, rather wistful expression. Next to the picture was one of his mother, a woman of rare beauty and charm, and a rather commonplace portrait on the other side of his father, a burly country squire. It's all rather an enigma, said Bendishy, looking thoughtfully at the portraits. Up till that time, you see, they had been very ordinary people, moderately prosperous, but not very successful, and quite unadventurous. There doesn't seem to have been a single instance of a man of any eminence among them, not even a soldier or a bishop. One of them was an M.P., but unseated for bribery. And then, just when a strain of beauty comes into the family, and a touch of romance, that minute the devil comes too. It looks as if there were something in the old idea of Nemesis, as if the way to be happy was not to attract the attention of the powers above. That pretty woman was an heiress, and the boy was born wealthy, and he was certainly charming, and I believe clever, too. The vicar shall tell us all about him this evening. I was somewhat struck by the interest which Bendishy seemed to take in the old family. As a rule, the last thing that a new proprietor is interested in is the history of the family he has ousted, but Bendishy seemed to wish to bring me into touch with the personalities of his predecessors, as though he desired me to draw some inference or to solve some problem. Indeed, when later in the afternoon he took me out and showed me the relics of the old Faulkner mansion, an octagonal turret and a crow-stepped gable, with a fine chimney-stack of moulded bricks and a great dovecote, all forming part of a rather ramshackle farm, I became even more sure of this and commented on it. Bendishy laughed a short laugh, as though partly pleased and partly disconcerted, and said, Yes, don't you think it would all make rather a picturesque article? Adding with a smile, You see, if I take you away from your work, I ought to give you some copy in exchange. But don't let me bore you. I am afraid it is rather a tiresome fancy of mine to speculate about my predecessors. Oh, I'm not bored, I said. Quite the reverse. What I feel is rather that you have some idea in your mind, which you want me to perceive for myself, and that you were, so to speak, inoculating me. Bendishy looked at me sharply, but I somehow saw that he was not displeased. After tea I read and wrote a little in the library. I felt rather drowsy after a day in the open air, and fell asleep in my chair, but awakened suddenly with a start, and with a strong impression that someone had entered the room softly and as softly withdrawn. I had, too, a sensation of something chilly in the air, 
and a faint earthy odour such as one connects with stone-built, underground, airless places. But it was all a momentary fancy. The flower-scented air was blowing in from the garden, and the bell of the church was ringing for vespers. I got up and went out into the hall, and found Bendishy with his hat on, just going out of the front door. Was it you who caught me napping just now, I said? Bendishy gave me one of his quick glances, and said, Well, I thought you might be having forty winks, and then added a little shamefacedly, The fact is, I'm going to church. The vicar is very good about services, and doesn't get much of a congregation. Besides, it makes me feel cosy, as Mrs. Carlyle said of the glass of port. Do you care to come? It isn't very much in my line, I said lightly, but I'll come with pleasure. It's all part of the atmosphere, and besides, I shall get into the vicar's good graces. We sat in the chancel. There were only two other people present, both women. The vicar, a big, sanguine-faced man with a fine head of silky white hair, read evening prayer with great rapidity but with extreme reverence, and I was pleased to see never once looked in our direction. His reading of the lessons was strangely impressive. The second lesson was a chapter from the Gospel. When the evil spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest and finding none. He had lowered his voice, and read as though it was a thing almost too terrible to be mentioned, except from a sense of duty. Just before the end of the passage he shut his book and made a slight pause, and then, as though it was his own comment, looking round at us, he added, So the last state of that man is worse than the first. And then he began the Nunc Dimittis in a tone of unmistakable relief. When I got down before dinner, the vicar and Bendishy were sitting in the hall, talking in low tones. The vicar got briskly up and shook hands with me with great cordiality. His face was full of animation and benevolence. Bendishy had said something to me about his being much of a mystic, but anything less mystical I had never seen. He was alive to the fingertips. We had an amusing evening. The vicar made a remarkably good meal and told a few excellent stories of a local kind, crisply and shortly, in response to a direct request from Bendishy. I indulged in some literary gossip, and the vicar listened to stories about some of the well-known writers of the day with childish avidity and hearty laughter. Excellent, excellent, I remember his saying. I have never been able to get on with his books. Rather precious, I think, but I'll give them another try. I didn't know the old man had so much blood in him. Four. We settled ourselves after dinner in the smoking-room, and as soon as we were alone, Bendishy said to the vicar, Now I want you to tell Hartley something about Hugh Faulkner, adding to me, That is the man whose portrait as a boy I showed you. And what happened when you came here? I always think it is an extraordinary story. Hartley won't make capital out of it, you know. He is quite discreet. Well, then, said the vicar, I'll tell you. It was over thirty years ago that Hugh Faulkner, he was a distant cousin of my dear wife, offered me the living through his lawyer. I came down and looked round, but Mr. Faulkner was ill, and I could not see him. I was just thirty then, and working in a quiet country curacy, and this gave me exactly what I wanted, more work and a chance of really getting a hold on a place, and a beautiful church, too and I won't pretend that a larger income wasn't some inducement. Well, we settled here, and then bit by bit became aware that things were very wrong indeed in this house. Hugh Faulkner was about forty. His father and mother were both dead. He had been in the guards, and he had done a good many wild things, and when at last he did something so outrageous that he was summarily told to send in his papers, he came down here. A less courageous man, he had plenty of courage, would have gone abroad for a bit and waited for the thing to blow over. But he wasn't that sort. He came down here and tried to brazen it out. But everyone knew about the scandal, and it was no use. People simply would not meet him, and were out when he called. He was cut and cold-shouldered everywhere. A few of the village people were civil to him, but he couldn't get servants. No one would accept his invitations. 
I've seen people in the street turn back rather than meet him. He stuck to it for weeks and months, and I tell you, Mr. Hartley, my heart bled for that man, though one could neither like him nor trust him. But I couldn't help admiring him. He generally took no notice, but once or twice he lost his temper. I saw him with my own eyes stop and say something civil to a farmer, Pratt by name, in the street, and the man pushed by. Faulkner went after him and screamed something into his ear. Pratt wasn't a very exemplary person either, and the man went on white and shaking. One day he came to the vicarage. I should say that I and my wife did see something of him. We went to dine there occasionally, but it was quite intolerable. He used to tell unpleasant stories, not anything to which you could take open exception, but one saw what he meant. And he had an old soldier servant, a real ruffian, who used to giggle at the sideboard. One day he had come in to tea at the vicarage, and he looked tired to death. While we were at tea, a neighboring parson and his wife called. I mentioned Faulkner's name. They made hasty excuses. They couldn't stay for tea. They had only looked in. They didn't say a word to Faulkner, who stood there with his teacup, looking as if he was on fire within. Then he went up to the parson as he was leaving the room, and said to him in a low voice, So this is what you do for sinners, Mr. Hale. What is your tone with the publicans? What made it worse was that old Hale had the reputation of being rather too good a judge of wine. Then he said good-bye to us and marched out. I went back with him afterwards and did my best to talk to him. We parsons see some bad things, Mr. Hartley, but I never had a worse hour. The man was possessed by devils, not by one only. He was not violent or obscene. He was simply desperate. And he told me, sitting in this very room, what some of his performances had been. And such a catalogue I never heard. However, that is all subsidulo, you know. He said I remember that he had carefully considered whether he could have helped behaving so, and he had decided that he could not help it, and would do just the same again under the same conditions. You see, I didn't make myself, he said. Then he went on to say that once he had left the army, he had kept clear of it all, except in one respect, but that the more he put the pillow on his desires, the more they peeped round the corner of it. He was quoting Martin Chuzzlewit, I believe. He was a great reader, I should say. And then he asked me to tell him plainly if I thought he had a chance of putting things straight. I'm really rather a good-natured man, he said, with a sort of pathos. I hardly expect to be liked, but I want to live on decent terms with my neighbors. I said that it would take time, and it would depend on how he behaved but that if he spoke to people as he had spoken to Hale at the vicarage, it was of no use expecting things to go better. But the man was damnably insolent, he said, and I won't take that from anyone. Well, we argued on, and then I tried to go a step farther. That's my trade, you know. And I wanted to see if the man felt any kind of regret for any of the things he had done. He was quieter by that time but he told me plainly to remember that I was not in my Sunday school. I nearly lost my temper at that, but I saw that it wouldn't do to back out. So I said that I was there to help him if I could, but that I could do nothing unless I knew more or less what his feeling was. It's like calling in a doctor, I said, and then keeping back some of your symptoms. And then, Mr. Hartley, I had a look for the first and last time of my life into the soul of a very bad man. He told me that he regretted it, in a way, because he didn't like the consequences, but that if there were no consequences, he would not even regret it. One phrase of his I remember, Why, I think no more of doing this and that than you think about taking a cup of tea. He went on to say that when certain temptations came to him, he had no choice. I really don't think I am quite responsible, he said. There is nothing in my mind that even wishes to resist. And as to feeling the need of forgiveness, either from the people he had wronged or Almighty God, the idea seemed simply laughable to him. And I will only say this, that for the first and only time in my life I felt like doubting the power of God.
and then at last I got away. I may add that for a month or two afterwards I was really ill. I could not sleep. I could not get the man's face out of my mind. And then there came a worse complication. Pratt, the farmer to whom Faulkner had spoken in the street, had an accident and was thrown out of his dog-cart, and Hale had a sort of stroke and was ill for some time. And this, I think, made matters hopeless. You know what sort of things people say, and underneath all our civilization there's a great deal of the ugliest old superstition left. After that, Faulkner shut himself up altogether, except that he would ride or walk in the early summer mornings before people were about. In winter he hardly ever left the house, and what went on here I don't know. I don't like to think. He read a great deal. He did some gardening. I went to see him from time to time, but he would never talk freely again. He used to ask a few questions, and sometimes told me stories about his boyhood, things his mother had said to him. He had a curious kind of affection for her, the tricks he had played on his father. He seemed to me like a man in a dream. He also took to speculating on the stock exchange and lost a lot of money. The only person who stuck to him was the old soldier servant. They lived in three or four rooms, did their own cooking, smoked and drank together, and the house got into a filthy state. But nothing happened. He didn't die. He was never ill. He simply lived on. Once or twice old friends came to see him, and I remember one man, a retired colonel, I believe, whom I met, leaving the house in haste, looking very much perturbed. He came up and spoke to me, said he had been to see his old friend Faulkner. They had been subalterns together, and he had been very much shocked, though I'm not very particular, he added. Then he suddenly said, Tell me, is he mad? Not in the least, I said. Then, good God, said the colonel, why doesn't the man shoot himself? And he went off straight to the station. Now, for more than ten years, things went on. Think what that means. The garden was all overgrown with bushes and brambles, with a path through to a plot where they grew vegetables, and in front the shrubs grew over the lower windows, and most of the upper windows were broken. But it shows what a strange thing human nature is, Mr. Hartley, for I believe the people here were rather proud of it than otherwise, though there was once an ugly demonstration. The old soldier servant used to be seen about. He did the shopping, and he was rather a feature of the place. And, strange to say, I got rather to like the man. He had been a real ruffian, I expect, but the way that man stuck to poor Hugh, it was heroic. There was nothing he wouldn't have done for him, and he simply worshipped him. I used to wonder what would happen to Hugh if he died. I still went in at times to see Hugh, and I believe he was glad to see me, though when he was in a bad mood he used to ask me all kinds of ingenious and bewildering questions about religious matters which I could not answer. But as a rule I don't think he was even very consciously unhappy. They lived by a routine, and Hugh used to talk mysteriously of his experiments. I never quite knew what he meant, but nothing very good, I fear. And then there were stories. At one time the garden was thought to be full of great black birds, and at another there were supposed to be creatures which grunted and snorted about among the bushes, and screamed out sharply at night. There were said to be curious mounds in the garden, like earth thrown out from burrows. Sometimes the windows were lighted up, and music was heard, and a man was said to have been seen going up the wall at the back like a fly. But I never saw anything myself, except for the fact that the house seemed to me sometimes to be full of smells, bitter, suffocating smells, like nothing on earth, and at times appeared full of shadows, gliding blacknesses, like mist or smoke. But I dare say all these things had some explanation. But I must bring my story to an end, and I must add that though I never quite gave up trying to get hold of something in Hugh's mind and heart that I could pull on, and though I said many prayers for him, it all was a total failure. But I somehow became aware of a change of atmosphere about the house, about Hugh himself. I had generally had the feeling as if some struggle was going on somewhere out of sight, or even as though one were watched by something that would like to make a spring if it dared. 
Hugh himself was less violent and quieter. It seemed like exhaustion. One night, about the end of April, I was alone then, for my dear wife had died the year before, but I must tell you that in one of the last talks we had she said to me, Don't give Hugh up. I think there is something coming to him. But she could not explain. I was working late when I heard someone tapping at the door, quietly and insistently, and I found it was Hugh's servant. He wanted me to come and see Hugh at once. Did he send for me? I said. No, sir, but I'm frightened about him. He doesn't eat. He doesn't sleep. He sits watching something. The man kept moistening his lips as he spoke, and then broke out, Come and see if you can help him. I went off at once, and when we got into the house I knew that there was something very wrong indeed. There was a silence that appalled me. I have never experienced such a silence and though it was a warm night, the house was deadly cold. But worse still, there seemed something holding us back which required pushing into. I fought my way upstairs, but the old servant gave up, sat down on the bottom step and watched me. There was one solitary candle in the hall which flickered and cast hideous shadows. I went straight into Hugh's room, the room at the top of the stairs, I found him stretched fully dressed upon his bed, his eyes closed, and making motions with his hands as if he were trying to thrust something away. His brow was horribly puckered, and his face seemed swollen and congested. I went up and took his hand, and he gave a kind of moan or wail, the sort of cry a hare gives when a keeper takes hold of it. Don't be afraid, I said. It's only me, John, you know. At this he sat up and opened his eyes. The dream, he said. The dream. It's closing in on me. Then he said to me in a faint voice, Surely it's enough. It's all empty and dark. It's draining my life away. Then he turned to me and said, Where have I been? I knew well enough. It isn't only a name, Mr. Hartley. It's a very real thing the most real thing but one in the world. Then he said to me, Fifteen years of hell, John. Does anything deserve that? I hardly knew what I was saying then, for the cold that I had felt on the stairs was gathering in thicker than ever. But I said, the words were given me somehow, Perhaps you have done your punishment, Hugh. It's over and done. He shook his head and lay down again, and I just knelt down and said the last prayers, and in the middle he gave one shudder, which went through him from head to foot, and I knew he was gone. Yes, I know what you would like to ask me, Mr. Hartley, and my answer is that I don't know. He was gone, but something else was gone, too. The servant came running up the stairs and looked in. I beckoned to him. He came and knelt down by me, and I finished the prayers. And when I had finished, he took my hand and pressed it. And then he took Hugh in his arms and stroked his face. I left them there, and went away a wiser man, I hope. The family lawyer came down, and he and I made a search for documents to no purpose. He had kept some papers in a dispatch box that was always near him, but this was missing, and could not be found. There was nothing to throw light on the matter, except that the servant said that he had lately been strange in manner and apathetic, and that he had lost his appetite, and I will only add that there was an inquest. I told my tale with reservations, and they called it natural death. I didn't hesitate to bury him in the churchyard, and there he lies, but no one came to the funeral and the bishop sent for me to inquire into the circumstances, but when I had finished the story, as much as it was fit for a bishop to hear, he told me frankly that he had meant to suggest to me to resign my living, but that now he had altered his mind, and that I must on no account leave the place. I never saw a man in such a state of what we will call godly embarrassment, and the next Sunday I made my flock a little sermon on Judge not that ye be not judged, and gave them a bit of my mind. 
and, strange to say, I have never had any trouble to speak of since. The vicar made a long pause and shook his head. I could see that there was something further in his mind which he had decided not to mention. I confess that this strange and tragic story produced an extraordinary effect upon me. For one thing, it was all so darkly mysterious, so full of unexplained hints and suggestions of evil, that it aroused in me a vague terror which made me wish that I had never listened to it. Not so Bendishy. He was sitting back in his chair, his hands clasped together, looking at the vicar with gleaming eyes, like a man on the brink of a great discovery. Then the vicar turned to me and said, There, Mr. Hartley, I have told you the story at Mr. Bendish's request. You may be thinking that it is the sort of tale that had better not be told, and that such a collection of shocking incidents is better forgotten and buried in oblivion. But I have two reasons for telling you. In the first place, the outline of the story, only greatly exaggerated, is known to and repeated by a good many people in this place and I should wish you to have a more accurate version of what happened. Anything is better than secrecy about such things. And Mr. Bendishy tells me he has a special reason for asking me to relate it to you, which you no doubt know, and of which I approve. I think it ought to be seriously investigated. And then, too, I have a further reason. There are very dark corners in this world of ours, and facts of our existence which seem inconsistent with any faith in a beneficent and almighty Creator, and I don't think it right to ignore them. My own belief, I will speak frankly, is that God is slowly and patiently making a conquest of a world in which there exists, how originated I cannot even guess, a strong element of something atrocious and horrible which defies him and seizes every opportunity of undoing his work. And to my mind, the horror of this story is that it seems like a deliberate attempt to focus this evil power, an attempt which failed because this malignant influence, as I interpret it, is essentially what is called stupid. It has no principle. It works at details with a laborious persistency. That is where its essential weakness lies. But it ought not to be ignored. It must be met by anyone who comes across it with courage and intelligence. I don't think that Hugh Faulkner did any very serious or deep-seated harm here, and he certainly did not succeed in making evil attractive. He may have struck a blow at individuals, and I believe that he certainly did, but that is all. And now I must ask you to excuse me if I say good night. May I have the pleasure of seeing you at the vicarage, Mr. Hartley? You may have some questions to ask about what I have told you, but I have nothing to add, and I may not be in a position to give you an answer. The vicar took his leave, and left on my mind the impression of great simplicity and goodness. He and Bendishy went to the door together, and stood talking for some little time in low tones. When Bendishy came back, he said to me with a curious look, Now what do you think of all that? I don't know what to make of it, I said. At present I am simply rather stupefied. One goes along making the best of life and thinking the world on the whole a satisfactory and wholesome place. And then comes a tale like this, and one wonders if one has any idea of what is going on, or of what may be hidden away in the minds of men and women. I wish I had never heard the story. Oh, come, said Bendishy, don't say that. It seems to me to have all the elements of a big adventure. I would give anything to get a little more information, but here one only gets the wildest and silliest gossip. I may tell you that I have tried to get on the track of Faulkner's servant, but I can't find a trace of him. I expect he's dead by this time, I said. No, said Bendishy. He is not dead. I can say that quite confidently. I have my reasons. We sat for some little time together, and I asked Bendishy one or two disjointed questions. I said, There was one point in what the vicar said which I did not quite understand. He spoke of Faulkner doing harm to individuals. What did he mean by that? Well, said Bendishy, he meant Hale and Farmer Pratt in the first place, and there are some other cases, too, if you care to hear them. No, I don't want to hear them, I said. But tell me this— do you, and does the vicar, 
really believe that Faulkner had the power of inflicting bodily damage upon these unfortunate men without using some known human agency? Of course, it might be that some material shock and physical deterioration followed from a fright which— But Bendishi interrupted me. Do I believe it, he said? Why, I know it. Faulkner was just as much responsible for their illness as if he had fired a gun at them. But how is it possible, I said. Ah, I don't know that, said Bendishi. But that he had the power of doing that sort of thing, at all events in the case, let us say, of people whose moral force was weakened by some indulgence, is incontestable. He didn't use it often, I admit. He was afraid to do so. But in both of these cases, and in others which I could tell, he lost all control of himself, and I believe that he let loose against them an undiluted current of evil. And the vicar believes it, too. But it isn't rational, I said. We don't believe in witchcraft in the twentieth century. Perhaps it would be better if we did, said Mendishi grimly. We can't get rid of facts by calling them irrational. I saw that he was getting nettled by the discussion, so I said, Well, I must have time to let all this settle down. In a moment the other Bendishi appeared. Yes, he said, we mustn't let this visit of yours degenerate into a series of shocks and explosions. I've no right to do that, and if you give me a hint, I will drop my theory for a bit. But I very much hope you will help me to look into the matter. We'll have an easy day tomorrow. He accompanied me to my room and said, I hope the story tonight hasn't made you nervous. Perhaps this will reassure you. He showed me, let in beneath the dado cornice, in the corner by my bed, a little circle looking like the top of a wooden peg, and painted white like the rest of the room. That's a fancy of mine. My butler, Bartlett, doesn't sleep in the house. He has a house in the village, and this bell rings in my room. Both the other spare bedrooms have it. I put it up when old Ford was staying here, and was taken ill in the night and couldn't make anyone hear. If you press on that, I'll be with you in a minute. I'm a very light sleeper. Oh, I'm not nervous, I said. I'm a sound sleeper, and then I'm a rational man. Bendishi smiled at this and said, Yes, that's just why I want your help. Good night, old man. Five. Left to myself that night, I went slowly and deliberately to bed. I felt curiously tired and drowsy after the cataract of varied impressions which I had received during the day, and I was conscious, too, of a growing excitement. The vicar's story had done more to arouse this than any of Bendish's semi-scientific theories. The vicar, I felt, was a man without an axe to grind, and with a certain duty to perform in the world, a desire to illumine the darkness, to extinguish evil. He did not turn his back upon it or ignore it, and his aim was a practical one. Vendishi, on the other hand, was like a man engaged in research. He simply wanted to arrive at facts. Indeed, there had been moments in the day when I had suspected him of being something very monomaniac, but his friendliness was engaging, and the appeal he had made to me for help had touched me. But help in what? That I could not say. Just, I imagine, before I slept, I had a curious sensation of something vague and restless in the house, something that faintly jarred my drowsy nerves. It was all a fancy, but I thought dimly that someone, sleeplessly and wearily, was engaged in pacing about and searching for a thing both secret and momentous, which had been mislaid or hidden. I wondered vaguely if the inquisitive brain of Bendishi, weighing, considering, discriminating, was having a sort of telepathic effect on my own. The house was absolutely still. The church clock struck two with a murmur sweet as honey, and then, curiously enough, I had a sensation of great mental ease. If anything was going forward, I was at least in no way concerned with it. The searcher did not wish me ill. My presence there was nothing to him. And then, I suppose, I passed into sleep. While I dressed in the morning, I could see Bendishi pacing in the narrow strip of garden that lay beneath my windows, lost in thought. He greeted me when I came downstairs with much effusion. 
Slept well, he said. That's right. You look very fit and spry. We'll have a good spin today. We might go to Canterbury, perhaps. And yet, strange to say, I had an indefinable sense that Bendishi was in some way disappointed. Our run was uneventful enough. Bendishi made no allusion to the narrative of the previous evening. I thought, indeed, that he was a little conscience-stricken for having plunged me, so to speak, up to the neck in these dark matters. In fact, I do not think he had intended to do so, but his own overpowering interest in the company of someone whom he thought sympathetic had run away with him. I felt in a singularly placid mood, and the summer fields, the woodland corners, the hop gardens, the hamlets through which we went, worked upon me like some gentle anodyne. We ate our luncheon on the shoulder of a high, upstanding ridge along which the road passed, and I was amazed at Bendish's knowledge of the country. There was hardly a church tower visible that he could not name, and he was full of local and personal anecdotes which beguiled the time very pleasantly. We got back for tea, and I then experienced something of a reaction. In spite of the beauty and comfort of the house, there came on me a sense of lurking dreariness which I could not analyze. Something was going on there, in the cool rooms, the panelled corridors, which I could not penetrate. I tried to work. I tried to read. Bendishy had gone off to the village on some friendly errand, and I became aware that I did not wish to be alone. When the dressing gong sounded, I felt a strong disinclination to leave the room. Ten minutes later I heard the front door open. Bendish's brisk stride was audible in the hall. This was a relief to me, but instead of coming as I had expected to the library, he went quickly upstairs. I decided that I must go too, but just as I got to the head of the stairs I became aware that someone was coming down the corridor as if from Bendish's room. It was beginning to be dusk, and I could not see the figure very plainly. It was a man, carelessly dressed in an old grey suit of clothes, shuffling along very noiselessly, his head hanging down, with a markedly sullen and dejected air. The face looked healthy but careworn, and it came into my mind that it was some petitioner who had come to make a request of Bendishy, but who had been decisively and perhaps unceremoniously refused. I said good evening to the man as he passed me, and then I had a real surprise of rather an unpleasant kind, for he took not the slightest notice of me or my salutation, as if he neither heard nor saw me. He shuffled on down the corridor, and was swallowed up in the shadow at the head of the stairs. Yet it did not seem to me an intentional rudeness, but rather as if the stranger's preoccupation was so intense that there was no room in his mind for any other impression. I went and dressed and was downstairs in the smoking-room when Bendishy appeared. "'You've had a busy evening,' I said, "'and I saw you got caught by a caller on coming in.' Bendishy looked at me quickly and interrogatively. "'Oh, yes,' he said. "'I have endless visitors. "'There's nothing I'm not asked to do.' "'But I expect you can't always do it,' I said. I passed your friend in the corridor, "'and I never saw disappointment so legibly written on anyone's face as on his. He hadn't even time to exchange civilities. You spoke to him, said Bendishy, adding, Poor chap, yes, he has no end of troubles. But what the real trouble is I don't quite know. So he struck you as disappointed, did he? Yes, indeed, I said. I almost wonder that you had the heart to refuse him. He looked quite worn out, and took no notice whatever of me. I should like to know his history. Bendishy stared at me in silence, and it struck me that I had been impertinent. I'm sorry, I said, if I have been too inquisitive. Good Lord, it isn't that, said Bendishy. But the man doesn't know what he wants, or at least I don't know what he wants. I can't make out, and that's just the difficulty. And when I find out, then, well, then I shall know what to do. Bendishy was in a very strange mood that evening, so strange that I more than once thought that my half-formed conjecture of the previous night was true. He seemed to be wrestling against the approach of a secret and triumphant mirth. Our talk turned on the ailments of middle age, and I confessed to being conscious of the necessity of a regime. I don't believe in taking care of oneself, he said. 
Plenty of air, enough exercise, variety, work, plenty of other people's business, not too much eating and drinking and smoking. And most of all, if you think you can't do a particular thing or don't want to, go and do it. That's rather Spartan, I said. No, said Bendishy. It's simply this. We have all of us got three, at least, or even more, people inside us. There's the one that admires and enjoys. He's all right. Then there's the one that criticizes and reflects. Then there's the animal, which needs to be sensibly and good-humouredly drilled, like a dog or horse, and he's a patient and serviceable fellow enough. But behind them all, in the little innermost room, there's the one that fears, and he mustn't be listened to for a single instant, or he will run the whole show. I never thought of it like that, said I, yet I'm sure you are right. But which is the one that wills? Oh, they all do that, said Bendishy, laughing. It's a kind of board. The point is that the right man should have the casting vote. And then he was again overtaken by his tendency to laughter, and laughed unreservedly. I suppose that he detected some annoyance in my face, for he suddenly stopped. Forgive me, he said. I have a fit of the giggles sometimes, and it is bad manners. But I have been lucky today. I have made some progress, more than I expected. After dinner we had a game of piquet, and went up to bed about midnight. As we came out at the head of the stairs, Bendishy said, Was it here you met my poor friend? Which way did he go? Down the stairs, said I, but I lost sight of him. Ah, he ought to have gone down the back stairs, said Bendishy, but I suppose he forgot. Hello, what's this? He turned sharply round. The door leading into the unfurnished bedroom was open, and the moon shone in, showing the boarded floor and the clean-cut panelling. Who the devil did that? said Bendishy, very irritably. Here, come in. Let's have a look. Has there been someone prowling about, I wonder? He led the way into the room, but I felt an insupportable reluctance to enter it. I must have this place locked up said Bendishy, half to himself. Hello, this is all quite new. I followed him into the room, suddenly feeling the need of company. He was bending down, looking at something on the floor. The wet must have got through, said Bendishy to himself. I drew nearer, and saw that a quantity of plaster had fallen from the ceiling. Up above, an irregular square opening appeared, but what, I confess, gave me a shudder of dismay was that the plaster on the floor had a strange resemblance to the shape of a prostrate figure. I saw at once that it was a merely accidental likeness, and even as I looked, Bendishy with his foot swept the debris together. He took me to my room and said a few friendly words. I saw that he wished to obliterate the impression caused by his merriment. I went to bed, and contrary to all my expectations, for the evening had been an agitating one, I slept profoundly. But before I slept, I have determined that I would not prolong my stay. Bendishy was behaving very oddly. And then I thought of the vicar, and I decided that, as he had asked me to his house, I would go and consult him, and this brought me a sense of relief. 6. The morning turned out insufferably hot. Bendishy was very cheerful and pleasant at breakfast. He said he had directed that some chairs should be taken out into the shade of the sycamores. The veranda is a bit stuffy, he said, when the wind is in the north. He got down a parcel of books from town, new books which he thought might interest me. And when we went out there was a table and two chairs and an irresistible heap of neat volumes of all shapes and sizes. We sat mostly in silence. Occasionally Bendishy went off to the house, and twice at least he was summoned by the butler to see a caller. I lead a dog's life, he said, laughing. Plenty of fleas. I had again become immersed in my book, when a sudden exclamation from Bendishy, betraying a poignant and acute emotion, made me look up. He was leaning forwards, his gaze bent on the front of the house. At the closed window of the unfurnished bedroom, plainly visible, and indeed made curiously luminous by the sunlight, a man was standing looking out into the garden. He was, so far as I could judge, an elderly man, with a shock of grey hair, 
and a curiously blurred and puffy face, red and bloated. He was dressed in a sort of apron, dirty white, showing arms bare to the elbow. "'Who's that? What's that?' said Bendishi, in indescribable agitation. It seemed to me so unnecessary and unaccountable in excitement that I said, "'Well, if you ask me, I should say it was the plasterer come to repair the ceiling.' "'You're right. You're right.' said Bendishi, with a gesture of intense relief. Of course I forgot. I mentioned it to Bartlett, but I didn't expect him today. I imagined... Well, I don't know what I did imagine. He got up from his chair and went hurriedly to the house. I was by this time very seriously perturbed indeed about Bendishi, and began to believe that he was on the brink of insanity. It rushed into my mind that I would go to the vicarage at once. I went back to the house, where all was silent. Old Bartlett was laying the table in the dining-room. I said to him, "'If Mr. Bendishy asks for me, will you tell him I have just gone into the village, but shall be back in a few minutes?' He was a comfortable and amiable old fellow. "'Certainly, sir,' he said. "'But it's a terrible hot day for the street. You'll wear your straw, no doubt, sir.' And he bustled out to open the door for me. I arrived at the vicarage an old substantial house behind the church, and was shown straight into the study. The vicar greeted me very warmly. "'Yes, I had hoped I might see you, Mr. Hartley,' he said. "'I'm afraid you think you have got into a very strange place here, and I'm not surprised at your coming.' I sat down and told him the incidents of the morning and the previous day. He listened to me very gravely. Then he said, "'I can't cast any light, I fear.' on what has been happening. Indeed, I am under a promise to Mr. Bendishy not to do so. But the important point is this. You may be absolutely and entirely reassured about his sanity. He is as sane as you are, and a great deal more sane than I am. He is the hardest-headed man I know. Mr. Hartley, I can tell you that that man has gone through experiences which would have sent nine out of ten men crazy. And he is a man of great emotional sensibility, too, but he has got infinite courage and inflexible purpose. I cannot tell you how I admire and reverence him. But I must add this. Bendishi wants your help very much. It is worth your while to give it to him, and I think that, so far as I can judge from our short acquaintance, he has made a remarkably shrewd choice. But if, on the other hand, you feel in any way alarmed or repelled by the claim, I will go over to the manor house with you, and insist on your being released from any obligation, and he will take my advice. No, I said, once really assured of Bendish's sanity, I have no wish to be released. He shall have whatever help I can give him, for as long as I can give it, but I confess I do not quite trust myself. Mr. Hartley, said the vicar, you have chosen the right course, and I am infinitely relieved. And I may add this, that the results may turn out to be of the utmost importance. Please consult me at any time. Just as I was going, the vicar said, Would it be troublesome if I asked you to take a note for me to Bendishy? I will come round at two-thirty to speak to him about it, but I think he ought to have this news at once. The vicar scribbled a few words on a sheet of writing paper, enclosed it in an open telegram which was lying on the table, sealed and addressed an envelope, and handed it to me. I returned to find luncheon ready and Bendishy pacing in the hall, evidently in a state of great suppressed excitement. I handed him the note and gave him the vicar's message. He tore the envelope open, read the enclosure, and a cry of surprise not unmixed with a deep satisfaction escaped from his lips. I thought for a moment that he was going to hand it to me, but he did not, and presently replaced it carefully in the envelope. Then he looked at me, rather a grim and searching look. So you went round to see the vicar, he said. May I ask what you went to talk about? Yes, certainly, I replied. I was beginning to feel this morning that I was getting too deep into a rather mysterious business, and I don't feel very sure of myself. You must remember how new and unfamiliar this all is to me, how little, in fact, I know of you beyond a mere acquaintanceship, to speak plainly, and I felt the other night that the vicar was a man I could trust, so I went round to ask him a few questions. 
Then did she put down his knife and fork and drummed with his fingers on the table. Well, he said in rather a grim tone, what's the result? He seemed to think, I said, that you needed my assistance, and he was very insistent that I should give it, if I felt able to do so, and the long and short of it is that I decided to do so. Bendish's face lit up with a smile. He held out his hand to me, and I grasped it, feeling that some compact of a momentous kind was being made. Well, old man, he added in a tone which showed that he was deeply moved, I can only say that I am truly grateful and thankful. It's a big business, and I want someone at hand whom I can trust, very badly indeed. Mind, he added, I'm not afraid of anything that may happen, but I want a perfectly fair-minded man who isn't afraid either, and that's what I feel you are. Now, he went on, I'll have no secrets from you. Ask me any questions, and I'll answer them. No, I said, I won't ask for that. I know that you want an impartial observer. I can see that something very queer is going on in this house, but I won't ask questions. I'll draw my own conclusions, and then when you think it best, you shall tell me. That's right, said Bendishy. Just what I want. And that's a bargain. If you will keep your ears and eyes open, it's all I ask. You may be surprised. You may even be shocked. But I can assure you that there is nothing to be afraid of. Nothing whatever. We will just go our own way for a bit and see how things turn out. Now, this letter, he went on, slapping his pocket, is the most important thing that has happened yet. Perhaps you will see the vicar when he comes up and tell him anything you have noticed, anything in the smallest degree unusual, and then leave us to discuss it, and thank you once again. While we were smoking, the vicar arrived, and I saw that he looked perturbed. I left the two alone together, and half an hour later Bendishy came to the library and said that the vicar and himself were obliged, owing to the news received, to go away on the following day. We shall leave immediately after breakfast in my car, he said, and we shall be back for dinner, unless anything unforeseen occurs. It's very inhospitable, I know, he added, and I don't feel sure if you will care to be so long alone. Have you anything in town that you want to do? Or you could easily spend the day at the vicarage. That could be arranged. I'm afraid it is absolutely imperative for us to go. Oh, don't bother about me, I said. I will do what I am very fond of doing. Go out for a long, vague walk, get some food at a village inn, and be back in good time in the evening. It will do me good, and I can think over things a bit. It's very good of you, said Bendishy, looking decidedly relieved. The rest of the day passed quietly enough. We sat in the garden, and the only event that struck me was that one of the gardeners and the chauffeur, in the course of the afternoon, brought a ladder across the lawn and got it into the house with some difficulty. Bendishy was thoughtful and cheerful. We played a game after dinner, and he proposed an early adjournment. I was glad to go to bed, but they had been one of some agitation. But when I had got to bed I could not sleep. I was seized with a kind of detective fever, and found myself speculating as to what the whole mystery could be. I did not believe very firmly in its supernatural character, and as for the occult side of it all, I may say I was frankly skeptical. It seemed to me that the vicar and Bendishy were probably affected by the tragic fate of Faulkner, and were perhaps inclined to attribute significance to circumstances of no great importance, but there were evidently things which had yet to be told me. While I was pursuing this train of thought, it was now nearly one, I distinctly heard soft footsteps in the corridor. I went to the door, opened it very quietly, and looked out. I saw Bendishy in his shirt and trousers, carrying in his hand a lantern, walking very gently, his back to me, towards the staircase. He came to the door of the unfurnished room, drew a key from his pocket, unlocked the door and went in, closing it with great precaution. I had a strong impulse to follow him, but thought that he might be annoyed at my intrusion, so I left my door half open, and, feeling restless and anxious, I put on some clothes, sat down in an armchair near the door, prepared to rise and close it the moment I heard the door of the unfurnished room open. 
I will admit that I was far from easy in my mind about this solitary exploration, but I had by this time a robust confidence in Bendish's strength of will. For a time I heard nothing, but then I began to perceive very faint muffled sounds overhead, as though Bendishy, I supposed, was moving about slowly and cautiously, and perhaps searching for something that was not easily to be discovered, for there were long pauses between the sounds, as if the searcher were standing still. I suddenly perceived what was happening. The ladder had no doubt been brought upstairs and put in the unfurnished room. Bendishy was certainly using it to obtain access through the hole in the ceiling to some room or loft overhead, and was quietly investigating it at night so as to be secure against interruption. I confess that the nerve which would be required for such a proceeding fairly amazed me, particularly when I thought of the supernatural influences Bendishy clearly believed to be at work in the house. I suppose that half an hour had passed thus, when suddenly I became aware that a very alarming interruption had happened overhead. Heavy footsteps stamped and rushed in the loft above me, then grew fainter, and then I heard the sound of a fall and a half-stifled cry from the direction of the unfurnished room. I rose and hurried down the corridor, flung open the door of the room, and saw a sight which horrified me. The moonlight streamed in at the open window. Bendishy was sitting on the ground with his hands clasped on his forehead. Beside him lay the extinguished lantern. "'What has happened, Bendishy?' I said, hastening to his side. He unclasped his hands and looked at me, and I could see that blood was flowing onto his shirt. "'I have had an accident, old man,' said Bendishy, in rather a husky tone. "'But I'm not much the worse, I think. No, don't ask questions. Just help me up.' I held out a hand and lifted him to his feet. He looked dizzily round. "'Good God, what a fool I was,' he said. "'I might have known it wouldn't do. "'Here, Hartley, pick up that lantern, there's a good fellow, "'and come to my room with me. "'I don't think I'm much amiss, after all. "'I only hope to God that no one else heard. "'How did you know I was here? "'You came like lightning.' "'I saw you go in here,' I said, "'and I heard you overhead.' and I had a feeling that I might be wanted. We went into the passage. I passed my arm through his, and he seemed glad of the support. He turned on the electric light in his room, and I followed him into the bathroom. He was very pale, his hair disordered. The wound turned out to be at the base of his throat, a scratch or cut, torn and lacerated. He bathed it, and it proved not to be very deep. I must have caught my neck on the broken edges of some of the laths, he said. Well, I'm thankful it's no worse. He came back into his bedroom and opened a small case which I saw contained some surgical appliances. He soaked a bit of cotton wool in some disinfectant and very deftly wrapped a bandage round his neck and under his arms, only asking me to fasten it for him. Then he dropped some liquid into a glass and swallowed it. Now, old man, he said, you get to bed and let me have a sleep. I have got a long day tomorrow. But you won't go in this condition, I said. Yes, I must go, he said. But Elton will drive. I shall be all right. I have just had a bit of a shock. I slipped on the ladder, you see, and I'm only thankful I didn't break a limb. Now, go and get some sleep yourself, he added. You look as if you wanted it. And mind, don't be excited. Nothing more will happen tonight, you may be sure of that. I've had a lesson, anyhow. And so I left him, but lay long awake, pondering and speculating what had Bendishy expected to find in the loft, and what had he found or seen that caused him to beat so hasty a retreat. For I knew enough of Bendishy by this time to know that it must have been something of a very alarming or startling kind to upset him so. 7. I was relieved to find in the morning that Bendishy showed few signs of the adventure of the previous day. The man was as tough as steel. He limped a little, and the wound in his neck was stiff and uncomfortable, but he was cheerful, not with any assumed cheerfulness, but with the tranquil assurance of the soldier who has come out unexpectedly well from a dangerous affray. I saw that the element of danger, whatever it was, about the whole investigation was a stimulus to him rather than the reverse. 
It was a fine, cool day, and the vicar and he started about ten o'clock. It was a four-hour drive, Bendishy told me, and they hoped to be back at seven. If we are delayed, he said, we will wire at once. And if you then don't care about staying here alone, the vicar has arranged for his housekeeper to give you a cold supper at the vicarage. I wrote a letter or two, and telling Bartlett that I should be out for luncheon, and probably for tea as well, I went off soon after eleven. It was astonishing to find how much more cheerful and light-hearted I became on getting clear of the house. I had hardly realized how much the atmosphere of the place was weighing on my spirits. It was not what had actually occurred, for that was trivial enough. It was a feeling of suspense, of hardly knowing from hour to hour what might not happen. I walked off into the country, delighting in the freshness of the green lanes, the views from higher ground, the pleasant villages and farms I passed through. I got some bread and cheese at an inn. The landlord was a chatty old man, amiably inquisitive. He asked where I had come from, and when I said from Hebden Hill, he brightened up. He knew Hebden well, it seemed, and had some relations living there. Then he asked me if I knew the manor house. You mean the big house opposite the west end of the church, I said. That's it, sir, he said. Did you ever hear tell of Squire Faulkner, he went on. Yes, I said. I have heard the name. I think the vicar mentioned it. Ah, that would be Mr. Fortescue, he said. I knew him when I was a young man. Then he went on in a rambling way, telling me about the squire. They did say he'd done a murder, or next door to it, and he'd come out of the army, and he lived all alone at the manor with an old soldier as had been in his regiment for his servant, and they carried on dreadful. People used to say that they cooked the mice and rats and ate them, and the drink going from morning to night. But there were worse stories than that, sir, the old man went on, dropping his voice. Folks said the squire had sold himself to you-know-who, sir, that ain't the one above, and that don't seem hardly worth while, do it? And if the squire had an ill will to any one, he could bring all sorts of mischief to pass. I don't know rightly about it, sir, but it wasn't thought hardly safe to cross the squire, and they used to say that the two would catch a cat, as it might be, and burn it alive, and then it would be like poison to the man the squire had an ill will to. And there was one bad story about a poor girl, a pretty girl she was, Annie Rogers by name, who lived with her mother that was a widow, and had a little money of her own. The old sergeant, it seems, took a fancy to her, and wanted her to marry him, but she couldn't abide the sight of him. That was hard enough, but then the squire got wind of it, and thought that if the sergeant married her he would lose his servant, and they had very high words about it, it was said. But the squire went secret to work, and first old Mrs. Rogers lost her bit of money, and had to go out for jobs, and then she died. And Mr. Fortescue was very good to Annie, and took her as a servant, but she was afraid of meeting the sergeant about the place. And one day the vicar found him at the back door, speaking to Annie and frightening the girl with some nonsense, and the vicar ordered him off, and the sergeant swore in that, and the vicar went after him to the gate. There were some people passing by who stopped to look on, and the vicar kept quite cool, and said to the sergeant in a loud voice that he was going to say before them all what he thought of him, and he said he was a dangerous and drunken ruffian, those were his words, and that if he ever annoyed the girl again, he would have him up before the magistrates, and they would put him where he would have to hold his tongue. The sergeant kept quiet after that for a long time. Some of the Hebden men liked him well enough, for he could be very friendly when he chose, and could tell a good story. But poor Annie fell ill after that, and the vicar sent her to the seaside, but she died for all that. They said it was a decline. The old man stopped for breath. But if the squire was like that, I said, and if the people believed all this about him, did they never show him what they thought of him? Well, not for a long time, sir, said the old man. You see, he was a cousin of the vicar's, and the vicar used to stand up for him. Some of the men in the place went one day to the vicar and complained about the squire, and the vicar said to them, It isn't the squire, he said, as does the harm. It's your fear of him. The worst harm he can do is to make you afraid of him. 
It's the fear does the rest. That was a true word, sir. But a little while after that, some of the same men, who had been having a bit of a drink, went up to the manor and began shouting under the windows, and beating on cans and carrying on. And some of them threw stones and broke some of the windows. The squire would never have them mended afterwards, but boarded them up. Someone saw and told the vicar, and he ran down, but before he got there, the big door flung open, and the squire, he marched out, and stood on the steps between the gate-posts. Here I am, he says, without turning a hair, and they say his face was dreadful to look upon, all white, with his eyes flaming, and then he called them cowards, brute beasts, and a lot of things that it wouldn't be hardly proper for me to repeat, nor for you to hear, and he invited them to do what they liked to him, but no one dare lift a finger. There, he said, you daren't so much as speak, and someone in the crowd piped up at that and called him a hard name. Oh, so that's what you think, said the squire, and if you weren't such a little cur, I'd ask you to step out here and do you the honour of knocking you down. And then he stopped short and said, But there's a better way than that. And he looked about him, they say, like a devil, and then they began to slink away, one by one, and some of them began to run. And that was the end of that evening's work. But would you believe it, sir? Billy Dale, that's the one that spoke, within a week went clean crazy and was took away, and after that they left the squire alone. I felt that I had perhaps better not listen to more of these tales. I did not know how much was fact and how much fiction, but it was clear that the squire was a man suspected of unspeakable things, and not without some reason. I began to feel that the best course would be to forget all about them. But then, why was Bendishy so hot on the scent? And suddenly, like a flash of lightning, the truth, or what seemed the truth, dawned upon me. The evil was not dead. It was alive and active, and Bendishy was trying to drag it to the light. Evil, of course, was anywhere and everywhere. But had something been done? Did something remain in the house that formed, as it were, a guarded stronghold of evil? Was there a core of malignant influence which needed to be extirpated? And if so, by what hideous personal agency, what bodiless ministers of fear, was it perpetuated? And then it dawned upon me that, if there was any truth in my thoughts, Bendishy must be exposed to dangers of a kind that defied precaution, and the more courageous he was, the nearer he got to the goal, the more appalling was the danger. I could not quite understand what part the vicar was playing in all this. He was standing by Bendishy, that was clear, but I thought that his kindly and generous nature might perhaps blind him to the danger, by leading him to believe that things had never been so bad as were supposed. In any case, my duty was clear. I must stand by Bendishy at any risk, and share the danger with him. It was a contest of wills, perhaps, and I could possibly, by throwing my own will into the scale, turn the current against our adversaries and in any case I felt that I must not be left any longer in the dark, but must know exactly what had happened and what had induced Bendishy to embark on the quest. I wandered on in the grip of these thoughts, hardly knowing where I went. I felt for a moment that I ought to return at once to the house, that I was like a sentinel deserting his post, but, on the other hand, I felt that it might be simply foolhardy and reckless to go back and wait in solitude until Bendishy and the vicar returned, and that some experience might befall me which would mar or damage such effectiveness as I might possess. I got a cup of tea at an inn which proved to be about five miles from Hebden, and then I strolled quietly back, arriving about seven. To my relief the car caught me up about half a mile out of the village. Both Bendishy and the vicar looked tired and were very grave. I talked vaguely about my wanderings, and they gave me but scanty attention. When we got to the house, I said to Bendishy, If the vicar is not too tired, would he come back to dinner? I have a special reason for asking this. I have something to tell you and some further questions to ask. The vicar assented, and Bendishy and I entered the house together, while the vicar pledged himself to return at eight. 
Bendishi went to the smoking room and flung himself down in a deep chair. Any the worse for yesterday, I said. Oh, I'm stiff as a board and dog-tired, he said rather impatiently, and just when I had need of all my strength. But we have found what we wanted to know, and it is all as I expected, only worse. And now the whole business is in such a tangle that I hardly know what to do. Then he added, Why were you so keen that the vicar should come back? He has had a shock, it seems to me done up. I couldn't help it, I said. Today I have thought it all out, and I'll stick to you through thick and thin, but I feel that I must know all, and know at once. If I am to share a danger, I must know what the danger is. I can't be of any use if I am still groping in the dark. Yes, you're right, said Bendishi wearily. I have been feeling that too, but I wanted you to form your own opinion. When we went up to dress, Bendishi said, looking round, I don't like the feel of the house tonight, old man. There's mischief brewing of a bad kind. But we'll weather it out. I was conscious to myself of a sort of heavy and brooding stillness everywhere, but I saw and heard nothing. 8. At dinner, while the servants were in the room, we did our best to talk of indifferent matters. It was like a bad play, I thought. When we adjourned to the smoking-room, Bendishi said to the vicar, Here, vicar, Hartley says that he thinks he had better have the whole story, and I agree with him. He won't be taken by surprise, and it's no use pretending now that it is a mild sort of investigation. It's a battle of a bad kind, and we must be forearmed if we can. I made a mistake last night by taking the offensive, and now hell's loose. But I'll go ahead. It was about three years ago that the thing began, said Bendishi. I don't know why it didn't begin before. Perhaps it had begun. But I had been getting more and more interested in my problem, and I had been, I suppose, training my perceptions without knowing it, and the curtain went up with a run. I ought to say that when I first settled in here, I had taken the unfurnished room for my study, but I could never work there in any peace. There seemed to be something on the move there, and if I sat at the table I used to feel there was someone behind me, and there were odd noises overhead, too. I had the roof examined. The only way in was through a little trapped door in the ceiling, in the corner where the plaster came down. But above there was only a long low loft, lit by a window looking out on the tiles and gutters, with a cistern in it and water pipes, and the builder said that the noises came from the pipes. However, one day I was coming down the corridor. I saw a man standing by the door of the room. The same man, Hartley, I will tell you at once, that you saw up there. The same dress, the same sort of expression. I thought it must be a plumber for a moment, when it suddenly came upon me with a rush that the wall, so to speak, was broken down, and I had seen something that a normal healthy man has no business to see. I said out loud, what are you doing there? Who are you? But he took no notice of me whatever, and continued to stand by the door, like a man who wanted something badly, and had been trying for a long time to get it, but all in vain. I didn't think of it as being in any definite and actual way connected with the place. I thought it was an hallucination, produced by overtasking my nerves in one direction. I went along to the door, my eyes fixed on the man, and suddenly he was gone. I wasn't exactly frightened, but I felt uneasy about myself. I went up to town and saw a doctor, a friend of mine. He sounded me and questioned me up and down. Then he declared me perfectly well in every way. I told him about my studies, and he asked me if I had ever seen any such figure in real life, in childhood, or had any fright or shock connected with such a figure. But I couldn't think of anything. He told me at last that he was frankly puzzled, but that he had little doubt that it was an hallucination, and did in some way result from my thinking so much about such phenomena. He gave me the advice to turn to other occupations for a bit, limit my work, have more company in the house, all very sensible. I did just what he advised, and had a succession of guests here who bored me to death. 
and I took up constitutional history as the least exciting subject I could find. But a fortnight later I saw the thing again, this time in my study, looking up at the trapdoor. I got up and walked straight up to him, and the same thing happened. He took no notice of me whatever, and when I was within a foot of him, disappeared. Then I did what I ought to have done before. I went to the vicar and told him the whole story, and then it came out. The vicar told me, with a good deal of hesitation, that the figure I described was beyond all doubt the figure of Hugh Faulkner himself, just as he looked in his later years. Wasn't that so? The vicar nodded. It was unmistakable, your description, and it gave me a dreadful shock, though I can't say I was exactly surprised. Then the vicar turned to me and said, Of course, Mr. Hartley, I am a firm believer in the immortality of the spirit, and I believe that we preserve identity and intelligence, and are not much affected or altered by death. But the spirit is, of course, a bodiless thing, a conscious and intelligent influence. I want to make this clear. There was nothing material there to see, but I realized that Bendishy had somehow or other got within the range of Faulkner's thought, and that the figure was evolved out of this thought acting on Bendishy's mind, just as we evolve figures in our dreams. Yes, said Bendishy, but I was also aware that Faulkner was not consciously influencing me. In fact, I think he was wholly unaware of my existence then, and this was a great relief to me. I was simply a spectator of what was going on, just as you were when you saw him. In fact, if I may say so, I doubt if it was his mind acting on yours which made you see him. I think it was my mind. And then, he went on, I saw the figure pretty often, but never in the presence of anyone else. That seemed an absolute bar. I don't know why. I lost all fear of it, and just accepted it as a fact. Once or twice I saw it in the garden, and once or twice downstairs, but almost always in the corridor upstairs or in the empty room. But I didn't want to run any risks, so I had the trapdoor plastered up, moved the furniture out, and locked the place up. Meanwhile I speculated about it, and discussed it with the vicar, and we came to the conclusion that there was some particular thing that Faulkner was, I won't say looking for exactly, but trying to trace some book, perhaps, or manuscript. I couldn't make it out. But we decided at last that it was something which someone else had hidden. But was it in the house at all? Or if so, why couldn't he see it? Or if he could see it, what could he do with it? I don't believe that these spirits have any material powers at all. They can only act through living brains. I turned to the vicar. Did you ever see the figure? I said. No, he said. I did not. I don't know why. I was nearer to Faulkner than anyone living, except his servant. But I have thought that perhaps Faulkner wished to conceal the very existence of the thing, whatever it is, from me, and was careful not to bring me in. But why then did Bendishy see him? I asked. Oh, said Bendishy, I stumbled into it by accident, I believe. It was just a question of my power of perception being heightened. But let me ask one other thing, I said. How do you account for your seeing it only occasionally? If the thing is always in Faulkner's mind, you ought to see it constantly. Well, said Bendishy, we don't know what his mental occupations may be. I dare say he has other things to think of. Yes, indeed, said the vicar, shaking his head. He was a very self-willed and perverse man. He has much to learn. Bendishy gave a grim smile and went on. What I believe is this, that at times the spirit of Faulkner remembers this thing, whatever it is, and believes it to be still in this house. The result is that for a time his thought is occupied with the house and the familiar rooms, and being an abstract essence, it ranges about the well-known scene, and if one comes within the reach of it, one sees the figure automatically. But why, then, does the figure disappear when you come close to it? Ah, I don't know everything, said Bendishy. Indeed, there is much that quite baffles me. 
but I have thought that it may be in some way obliterated by the proximity of my own consciousness, as the moon obliterates the light of the surrounding stars. But that is only my idea. And now, he went on, we come to the more serious part of the story. Some weeks ago I became suddenly aware that the spirit of Faulkner had become aware of mine. I suppose I had begun to speculate more closely as to where the lost thing was and what it might be. And then, too, it had occurred to me that the old sergeant might be still alive. The vicar had told me that he thought he was dead, and I had begun to make some inquiries, and had employed a detective to try to trace the man. We now know that he was alive all the time. Faulkner had given him some money at various times, and after Faulkner's death the sergeant had rented a farm in Hampshire, a little bit of a place. But he had taken to drink, and was in a bad way, nearly at the end of his resources. He became aware that he was being tracked, and I dare say there were plenty of other things about which he might have got into trouble. Anyhow, he was frightened. He sold his farm, which was mortgaged, so he only got a few pounds out of it, and he went off on the tramp. The money was spent at last, and he took cold by sleeping in the open air. He was taken to the workhouse at Pentlow, near Horsham, and went to the infirmary with rheumatic fever. But I must go back for a moment. While all this was going on, I became aware, as I told you, that I had for some reason or other come within Faulkner's consciousness, and that he realized that someone was on the same scent as himself. His expression seemed to me to change when I saw him. He looked angry and defiant, and as though he was guarding the approach to something. But even so, he was not apparently at first conscious of my physical presence. Then he assumed a menacing air and made gestures of anger and rage. It was at this time that I asked you to join me here, because I began to feel that I must have someone with me, that I could not be sure of my nerves not failing me. Moreover, his appearances became much more frequent. And then you came, but instead of telling you everything at once, which would have been by far the best course, I waited in order to see whether you had any perception of his presence. And when you began to notice certain phenomena, I made excuses and gave explanations. It was all very stupid, in order that you might have your own experiences and draw your own conclusions. And then a quite new development occurred. The old sergeant died in the workhouse and the first intimation of it that I got was the appearance of a new figure at the window, which you also saw. I did not know what to make of this, though I had a strong suspicion, but it happened that they found on the man a letter from someone in the village, one of his old acquaintances, which seemed to show that he had lived here. And then they wired to the vicar to say that an unknown man had died in the workhouse. They gave a brief description of him, who seemed to have once lived at Hebden. The vicar sent the wire on to me, as you know, and I was sure who it was. We went off together to identify him, and the vicar recognized him at once. That is the position of affairs. But, I said, in what way is he connected with these papers, or whatever they are? Do you remember, said Bendishi, that the vicar said something about a dispatch box that was missing after Faulkner's death? The vicar turned to me. I ought to have been more explicit, he said. For some time before his death, I noticed that Faulkner was always writing when I saw him, and that when I came in, he always slipped the papers into an old dispatch box on the table and locked them up. I remember once asking him what he was writing. My memoirs, he said with an ugly kind of smile. An interesting book, don't you think? When he died... I am nearly certain that the box was by his bedside, though I could not swear to it, and we thought, the lawyer who came down to see about the property and I, that there might be papers of importance in it. But when we questioned the sergeant, who knew the box perfectly well, he stuck to it that he hadn't seen the box for the day or two preceding Faulkner's death, and that he was quite certain that Faulkner had hidden it somewhere, and I couldn't be sure that he was not right. Yes, said Bendishy. And what I conjecture happened was that the sergeant, thinking that the contents of the box might be valuable, or indeed might incriminate himself in some way, had secured it himself, meaning later to remove it. That would explain everything. It would explain why Faulkner did not seem to know where it was, and further, 
it would explain what happened to me there last night. What exactly did happen? I asked. I'll tell you, said Bendishi, looking up at me, just how it was. I had had a ladder brought up here. Whether the fall of the plaster was purely accidental, I don't know. But anyhow, it gave me the idea that the papers had been hidden up in the loft. I didn't like to ask you to join me, Hartley, but I did a very rash and idiotic thing. In the afternoon I took the ladder into the room, and when the house was all quiet, I went in with a lantern and up into the loft. At first all was quiet, and I hunted about everywhere, but found nothing. Then suddenly I became aware that I was not alone, and I saw two figures standing together in the far corner of the loft looking down at the boarded floor. And then I felt no doubt at all that I had got near the hiding place. I had better have gone away at once and bided my time, but instead I was fool enough to go to the place. I don't quite know what happened. They flew at me like two wild beasts. It was not a case of any physical violence. It was just a contest of will and brain. But I had all the terror of being attacked without the possibility of offering any physical resistance. I simply felt that my mind would give way. I ran down the loft and tried to get onto the ladder, but I slipped when I was half through the hole, cut my neck, I suppose, on the jagged edges of the broken laths, and you heard my fall. What an appalling business, I said, and there was a silence for a moment. Then I said, But why did the sergeant not remove the box after Faulkner's death? Ah, I can explain that, said the vicar. He had not the time. We had moved Faulkner's body into another room, and we had some talk with the sergeant, Mr. Hartley, and I suppose he was frightened. He had got hold of a certain amount of money, as it was, and I imagine he never dared to come back. There are just two things more, I said. What are these papers, after all? Ah, that I don't know, said Bendishy, but I imagine that they are what Faulkner called his experiments, an account of what he did, or tried to do, and the devices by which he carried them out. The force he used was fear, and the question is, how can you frighten people purely through the agency of the mind? They must remember that Faulkner was a very able man, and that the sergeant was clever enough in his way, too, and that they were both men of remarkable courage and force of character. And if we grant that, I said, what do they want to do with the papers? My belief, said Bendishy, is that they just want to guard them, to preserve them somehow. I don't think they have a very clear idea about them. They don't want them to be made public and yet they want to hand on their secrets to someone who will use them. If any of us three, for instance, were a man inclined to make use of these evil agencies, we should encounter no opposition. But at present they simply know that we are hostile, that we want to find the papers and perhaps to put an end to them, and this they mean to prevent as well as they can. What are we going to do? I said. I am afraid that the question rather is, said Bendishy, what are they going to do? The words were hardly out of his lips when an answer came. A thin, high, mocking laugh was heard in the air, in the middle of us. I can't say how inexpressibly horrible it was to feel in the presence of something hostile and derisive, and yet not to know what it could do or might do. The horror was that it was there. The silent auditor knew what we had said and what was in our minds, and we could do nothing. It seemed to me for a moment as if I should lose control of myself, and that my brain would give way under the consciousness of this unseen and intangible presence. I looked at Bendishy, and he was sitting clasping the arms of his chair, looking down and frowning. The vicar rose unsteadily to his feet, his face very pale. Merciful God, he said. Here have I been fighting with evil all my days, and trying to think it was weaker than good. And now that I am confronted with it, I can do nothing. Nothing. No, said Bendishy, looking up. That isn't so, Vicar. You have a far stronger hold of this business than either Hartley or myself. We are just fighting for ourselves and our sanity, but you have got bigger forces with you. I want to ask you one thing. 
Hartley and I, or I, must go and find this thing, whatever it is, and there's no time to be lost. The longer we put it off, the worse it will be. But will you stay with us and see the end? Whatever happens, you must not lose faith. When Bendishi spoke of the necessity of our going straight to our goal without delay, I confess that I had an access of fear more terrible than anything I had ever experienced. The blood seemed to stand still in my brain. My strength seemed to ebb from me. But I felt, too, that the idea of giving up, of turning tail now, would leave even a worse legacy of terror behind. It was not a question of moral courage. There simply was no way out. The vicar said nothing in reply, but he put up his hand, clasped first Bendish's and then mine, and the next minute we were out in the hall. Then Bendishy took command. Nine. We had risen and stood looking at each other in silence. Now don't hurry, Bendishy said. Just try to think of what we are going to do. I shall want something to prize up the boards with. I know. He went back to the smoking room and returned in a moment with an old ice axe. Its blade was protected by a leathern cover, and Bendishy slipped it off. Then he strode to the foot of the stairs and went deliberately up. I followed him, and the vicar followed me. In a moment we were on the landing. The house was deathly still, with a brooding stillness like that of a thundercloud. Bendishy drew out his key and produced two electric torches from his pocket, and then said, Now I go first, because I know where the thing is, and when I am up the ladder, in the loft, Hartley, you come up. And, Vicar, will you stay in the room and lend a hand? And mind this, they can do nothing so long as we don't fear them. Or if we do, we must behave as if we did not. Then he unlocked the door, and we went into the room. Bendishy clicked on both the electric torches and gave one to the Vicar. The moon was shining bright, and the shadow of the casements lay dark on the floor. Then I suddenly became aware of a strange shadow of an impenetrable blackness in the corner of the room under the trapdoor. But Bendishy strode out straight to the foot of the ladder, and seemed to me for a moment engulfed in darkness. I followed close behind, and there was nothing there. You see, said Bendishy to me in a low tone, it will all be like that. But as we stood together at the foot of the ladder, a stream of ice-cold air came gushing down from the hole in the ceiling, as if coming out of some frozen cave, so cold that I felt my very bones shivering under their covering of flesh. But Bendishy slipped his hand through the loop of the axe, and then very slowly and deliberately began to ascend the ladder. Come when I call, he said, and not before. I looked round. The vicar was on his knees in prayer, but neither that nor Bendishy's courage gave me any relief. I just thought of the next thing I had to do. Bendishy disappeared through the hole, and I heard him step out on the floor of the loft. Then he said, Now, come. The vicar held his torch up to illuminate the steps of the ladder, and step by step I went slowly up in the icy air. As soon as my head and shoulders were in the loft, I felt Bendishy grasp my arm. Steady, he said. Step carefully. Bendishy raised his torch, which sent a long stream of light down the loft, and then in the silence came a strange tremor and agitation of the empty air. Now, said Bendishy, it will be all over in a moment. Hold on to the top of the ladder and keep your eye on me. He walked slowly along the loft, to a place about twenty feet away, looking carefully at the boards and turning the torch down on them. Now, he said, come up here slowly and hold the torch for me. This is the place. Bendishy bent his head down and examined the boards. Then he raised his axe and delivered a tremendous blow at the chink between the boards, and then another. The chips of the broken board flew out on the floor. Suddenly from the hole he had made there was protruded a dusky thing. It was the head of a great snake. I could see its dull blinking eyes, the black spots that ran in a chain down its forehead, its flickering tongue, and the greenish pallor of its throat. Bendishy struck another blow, and the creature came out, 
reared itself up as though to strike at us, and then it suddenly darted back into the hole again. Bendishi again raised the axe and struck fearlessly again. There was now a considerable hole between the boards, and he reversed the axe, inserted the point under the loose board, and putting his foot on the head of the axe, brought it down like a lever. The board cracked and split. Bendishi dropped the axe, and bending down, seized the board and tore it up. A dreadful sight met my eyes. The whole cavity was filled with snakes, entwining, interlocked, writhing. Sometimes a head was put up from the mass, and sometimes half a dozen would detach themselves and wriggle over the floor. I must confess that I was now half frantic with horror. But Bendishi plunged his hands into the mass of snakes and drew out an old leather dispatch box covered with dust. This is it, he said, and I was bending down to look at it, when a thing more dreadful than any of our previous experiences occurred. The icy air beat upon us, and turning my head, I saw standing behind us, stiff and upright, a corpse, swathed in grave clothes, with pale leaden-colored hands hanging down. The face was of the same hue, with a fringe of ragged-looking gray hair straggling over the forehead. It had a faint smile, it seemed, on its lips, and its dull eyes, gray like chalcedony, looked fixedly at the opening in the floor, and then a heavy odor of corruption began to spread around us. And then for a moment I wished that I had died rather than have come into this place of horrors. Bendishi himself turned and confronted the gaze of the figure. Then he signed to me to pick up the torch and axe, and walked firmly down the loft to the ladder's head. "'Go down first, he said, and I will lower the box to you. Don't leave go of it, whatever happens.' And so I pushed on. It was no time to hesitate. I climbed hastily down the ladder, and on reaching the floor saw the vicar standing with his back to me, looking out of the window. But I had no time to attend to anything else, and cried out in a cautious tone, "'Now, the box!' and it appeared from the orifice. I seized hold of it, and a moment later Bendishi began to descend the ladder. But when he reached me, I saw that his strength was failing. At that moment the vicar turned round, and came up to me with outstretched hands as if to receive the box. I was about to hand it to him, when Bendishi cried out in an unsteady voice, No, no, keep hold of it, I say. Don't you see? And then I hardly knew for a moment what happened. Something seemed to rush towards me in a passion half of rage, half of entreaty. I was fighting with shadows. The figure that I had thought to be the vicar came nearer and looked me in the face, and it was Faulkner himself, in a fury of baffled rage and despair, such as a human mind can hardly conceive. And while I gazed, fascinated, I heard Bendishi come close beside me, and the vicar himself came forward out of the dark corner of the room, and after that I knew no more. I awoke not long after from a kind of stupor. I was conscious of having been led and propelled down the corridor. I was in my bedroom, lying on my bed, and the vicar was sitting beside me with a very anxious face. "'How do you feel?' he said in a gentle voice. "'Oh,' I said, "'I'm all right. In mind, that is.' I feel very tired and battered, but not damaged, at least not irretrievably. What I most want is sleep, I think. I suppose I fainted. Yes, said the vicar, and I was afraid it was worse. But don't let us talk about that now. Where is Bendishi? I said. Oh, he is all right, said the vicar. He has just gone to get something for you. He will be here in a moment. He is very anxious, and so am I, that we should settle at once, without any delay, about these papers, whatever they are. But he and I disagree, and if you feel up to it, he would like to have your opinion. I don't know that my opinion is worth much just now, I said. But at that moment Bendishi entered the room with a little cut-glass flask in his hand. He showed few traces of an ordeal. Indeed, he looked more self-possessed and determined than ever. He carried the box with him, I noticed. He came to my bedside and took my hand. Well, old man, he said, this is a good sight. I was afraid. Well, I won't say what I feared, but I felt that if things had gone wrong, 
I should never have forgiven myself for bringing you in. How are you feeling? Only a faint, you think? Well, I am sure of it. Heart, not brain, gave way. He poured something out of the flask, a clear aromatic liquid, and asked me to drink it off. It is quite harmless, he said. It will give you an extreme lucidity of mind for about half an hour, and then the best sleep you have ever had in your life. I drank it, and the other two sat in silence. A few minutes later I sat up and said, It is very strange. I could not have believed I could have felt like this. I can remember and see quite clearly all that happened yesterday. Was it yesterday? But there's no horror about it. I feel extraordinarily happy. Something poisonous seems to have cleared away, and I don't think it will come back. Yes, said Bendishi. I think we have cleared the air somewhat, blown up the wasp's nest, perhaps. But now, do you feel fit to hear two sides of a question? These horrible papers, what is to be done with them? My own view is that I should go through them carefully. They may have immense evidential value. Here is the packet. He opened the dispatch box. I noticed that he had forced the lid, and took out a small packet of papers, not more than a hundred sheets, I guessed, carefully tied up with black ribbon and sealed with two large seals. He put the packet in my hands. On the first page was written in a bold handwriting, A record of experiments made at Hebden Manor House between the years 1890 and 1903, with the results obtained by Hugh Faulkner and Harry McGee. It is earnestly desired that anyone into whose hands they may come will have them examined by someone of scientific eminence, as they deal with the surprising development of a comparatively unknown psychical force, the results of which have been of an extraordinary character. It was signed, Hugh Faulkner. Mine, said Bendishi, I will take the entire and sole responsibility for examining the packet, and I will add that if I had been able to find the packet unaided, as I think I should have done, I should have gone through the whole thing with the utmost care. Bendishi, said the vicar very gravely, and I saw that he was in a state of great depression and exhaustion. I implore you not to speak like this. If you had attempted to take possession of the packet single-handed, it would have cost you your reason, and perhaps your life. It may be that you would have lost something even more precious than life— and I must say something more, painful though it may be. You are not as strong as you think. You are in greater danger at the moment than you were in either of your two visits to that unholy place up there. My feeling is that the papers should be instantly destroyed. I regard them as I would regard a case which I knew to contain the living germs of all the deadliest diseases known to humanity. For you to read them would be deliberately to introduce into your own spirit the most satanical of all infections. Bendishi listened to the vicar's words with a look of ill-concealed impatience, and then turning to me he said, Now, Hartley, it is for you to decide. The quest was mine, and it was the vicar's duty to help me. But you are the volunteer, who might have been a martyr, who made the search successful. I leave it in your hands. Bendishi, I said, you have given me a dreadful task. I see what you feel about it, but I have no sort of doubt that the vicar is right. We have torn the evil out by the roots with terrible risks, and you would propose to plant it again for the sake of scientific curiosity? Bendishi stood holding the packet in his hands. You would destroy knowledge which is being paid for by a man's soul, he said. Yes, said the vicar, because it is the price of blood, and you dare not traffic with that. I looked up, and in a flash I saw, a little way from the group, the figure of Faulkner kneeling, his hands clasped, and a look of agonized entreaty on his face. I lost control of myself. It must be destroyed at once, I said, now and here. Very well, said Bendishi. I yield, but I shall regret it all my life. He said no more, but drew a knife from his pocket, cut the ribbon, 
drew out a mass of closely written sheets, stuffed them loosely into the empty hearth, and set fire to the heap. The little pile flared up, and in five minutes was a glowing lump, the writing standing out in lines of fire, and a moment later it was nothing but ashes. And at that moment Bendishi and the vicar, who had been gazing at the fire, looked up, and they too saw the figure of Faulkner. But then a strange thing happened, and so swiftly that I can hardly say what it was. A figure in white, young, radiant, smiling, seemed to step up to Faulkner from behind, like a bringer of good tidings. Bendishi put his hand before his eyes. The vicar clasped his hands together. The uttermost farthing, he said, in a tone of intense joy. And he departs thence. That is the mercy of God. Oliver Onions, The Rope and the Rafters During the first half of this century, George Oliver Onions, 1873 to 1961, produced a series of polished and stylistic, but also highly original, novels and stories. A true grit Yorkshireman by birth, Onions went to great lengths in every new book to break fresh ground, risking popular success for distinctive and demanding works. Today, when few people strive to reap rewards from a difficult work, Onions's novels have fallen into disfavor. It was true even at the time of his death. The Times' obituarist wrote of him that he was a novelist of uncommonly sensitive and original imagination, and of commanding resources of craftsmanship and style, and one who had received far less recognition than was his due. In the field of fantastic fiction, Onions is remembered for a remarkable collection of stories called Widdershins, 1911. This contained The Beckoning Fair One, which many believe to be one of the greatest of all ghost stories. Onions himself had no truck with the supernatural, but this did not stop him creating a convincing atmosphere with frightening verisimilitude. In The Rope in the Rafters, though, first published in his Collected Ghost Stories in 1935, Onions drew upon a real supernatural episode experienced by his son, Arthur. One night in lodgings, Arthur suddenly became aware of a presence in his bedroom, and though he could see nothing, he could hear breathing and could smell the overpowering aroma of damp earth. That was all Oliver needed. 1. For the last seven miles of his journey, James Hopley's hopes had sunk lower and ever lower, till now, at the gates of the chateau itself, he heartily wished he had never left the clinic in Paris. The driver of the single-horse voiture had descended from the seat, and with the rain beating on his back was struggling with the rusty fastenings. One of the gates had come away from its masonry, and the pair of them were only held together by the lock in the middle, and a turn or two of old dog-chain and even when he had got them apart, he had to hold them so while he led the horse through by the bridle. With one of his eyes, for the other was of glass, James Hopley looked through the streaming panes at the desolate and unkempt avenue. Then he groaned. The chateau itself had come into view. The whole of one end of it was a skeleton of scaffolding. New windows were being broken through. A new chimney stack was being built. The rain beat down on dumps of broken brick and debris, and laths torn out of walls. The yew trees dripped on barrows and wheeling planks and weeds. A Henri Quatre Chateau in the depths of the country. This was the place Blanche and the doctors had said would do him all the good in the world. For many years past, Blanche's kindnesses to him had been innumerable. She had written to him when nobody else had had remembered him when the rest of the world had forgotten him. This loan of her chateau was only the most recent of her benefactions. But there was one thing she would not do. She would keep her memory of him as he had been. Never, never would she see him again. And he sometimes felt that this was her greatest kindness of all. By a terrace door in an angle of the facade, the driver tugged at an iron bell-rod, after a longish interval, the door was opened by an elderly, bald, grey-bearded man in a red baize apron, behind whom stood a meagre woman in black. These were evidently the Marsacs, who were to look after him during his convalescence. 
Without a word, the man reached behind him for a huge umbrella and came forward to hold it over James. From under its edge, James saw a long terrace frontage with tall windows and more tall windows above them. In an inner lobby, a second door stood half open. The man in the apron had returned to fetch his belongings. Then happened something that seemed little short of a miracle. Stepping forward, James suddenly found himself in a lofty room with panelled and tapestried walls, vast armoires, and a wide stone hearth on which, behind massive fire-dogs, a great wood fire burned. Near it, a small period table was laid for one, with cutlery, a napkin, and a large jar of Montbrescia. By a glass stood a tall bottle of wine, with the cork invitingly half-drawn. Outside, the mud and the rain, and inside, this— he stood looking round the surprising room, and then turned to the woman, who with eyes averted was waiting for her orders. "'You seem to have been busy, Madame Marsac,' he said. The woman had a voice as harshly shrill as that of a parrot. "'But busy! Only the day before yesterday, nothing, not a chair. And then, mon Dieu, everything arriving by road from Paris at once. Busy!' And if Madame Marsac had been busy here, his friend Blanche had been no less busy at the auction rooms of the Hôtel Drouot in Paris. Chez Drouot one can buy for a song ancient and elephantine pieces of furniture that no modern room will take. And here they were, the tapestries and leather-backed chairs, tall oil lamps of bronze and onyx, a battle-piece big enough for a wall at Versailles, porcelain vases as large as those of the Forty Thieves, but James Hopley had put out his hand to the bottle with the half-drawn cork. Even a girl cassé, blown up by high explosive in the war and not dug out of the earth again for a week, may still like the inner warmth of a glass of wine. So here was to Blanche. Her white elephant of a chateau was not turning out so badly after all. 2. That afternoon, the rain still continuing, he took a walk round this place that had been so generously put at his disposal. Strictly speaking, it was not so much a chateau as a hunting-box, of two tall stories and a hipped and dormered roof above that, with one row of windows facing the terrace, and the other looking across the neglected park to the river that joined the sea some dozen miles away. But it was the topmost floor of all that instantly seized James Hopley's imagination— what a place for a couple of boys to have played hide-and-seek in! Except for the roof itself, this upper portion had never in fact been completed. Floorboards ended suddenly, leaving bare the joists and the drop to the story below. The dormers were infrequent, and the light already failing, and when presently he began to strike matches, as likely as not a sigh of wandering air blew them out again. He would in fact be wise to get to the safety of the lower levels before it became quite dark and suddenly he was checked. Something had struck him lightly in the face. A bat? There might well be bats up there. And his matches were getting few, but he shielded one carefully in his hands. The object that had struck him was a rope that swung from a beam overhead and disappeared in the shadows below. Still, with workmen about a place, a rope was no unusual thing to find, and he turned away, but by this time he had got confused about the building's plan. He descended to the mansard level again, and found a door that opened on stairs similar to those he had come up by. He groped his way down these, and, in the darkness, pushed at another door at the bottom. And the next moment he was in a high, lamp-lighted kitchen sort of room, stacked halfway to the ceiling with packing-cases and crates from which the paper and straw protruded. The lamp shone full on the bald head of the man in the red baize apron, who, with the meager woman, his wife, was sitting at a bare table having a frugal meal. He had stumbled into the caretaker's quarters. He was about to apologize when suddenly he stopped. The woman, catching sight of him, had let out a harsh, ringing cry, and had clapped her hands before her eyes. The man's hand, too, had closed swiftly on the lighted lamp as if he would have hurled it, but he picked it up shakily instead, rising to his feet as he did so. His voice was strongly under control. Monsieur has no doubt missed his way. It is here, he said, and lamp in hand advanced to a door in a corner. 
He led the way across a drafty apartment, empty except for sacks of cement, and opened another door. James was back in the large room that had first welcomed him, but this time from the fireplace end. Mortified, dispirited, the slow recovery of weeks undone again at a single stroke, he sank into one of the leather-backed chairs. Always, always his face, and so he supposed it must be to the end. For in Paris, when the yearly performances were given, and the cap was passed around for the benefit of those afflicted as he was, be sure you would not find James Hopley standing next to the kiosk where his own picture postcard was for sale, showing off his grafts and his paraffin wax and his seared cheek, with the glass eye glittering as hard as a doll's in the middle of it all. Much more, then, meeting people for the first time, and in a place like this, he ought not to have shown himself without warning, appearing from nowhere at the foot of a flight of private stairs. But he made no mention of the incident when presently the woman came in to lay the period table for his supper. By that time he was busily writing. He was still writing when she came in to clear away, and as it is on this writing of James Hopley's that this tale of him is largely based, a word had better be said about it. The shiny black-backed exercise book before him was the fifth of the series. They contained his own account of his case, apart from anything the doctors might have to say about it, and as they were written for his own eye only, they leave out much more than they put in. Naturally, he did not tell himself things he already knew, but once in a while some unexpected result cropped up, and at present he was noting down this unfortunate beginning with the Marsacs. He passed his hand over his brow as he finished it, then closed his book, took his candle, and at a little after nine o'clock slowly mounted the echoing stairs to bed. His bedroom, too, was Hôtel Douro, with much ormolu and alabaster and cracked and faded gilding. It had two beds, a yard or so apart, as if Blanche had made ready either for merry guests or for a single person like himself— and on a small commode between them stood the second candlestick. James Hopley had had a long journey and was tired. He threw his dressing gown across the second bed and got into the first one. There, having blown out his candle, he lay awake, listening to the hundred noises of the gaunt place. Outside the rain beat down without ceasing. Somewhere a door must have been left open, for he found himself waiting for a recurrent banging. Outside in the corridor vague gusts entered by the window piercings, and somewhere on the scaffolding something flapped. Slowly that mortifying picture faded, of a woman who hid her face and screamed while a man's hand went to a lighted lamp. He yawned, drew up his knees, and slipped over the edge of sleep. He was awakened by a sound different from any he had been listening to. It seemed to come from immediately overhead, and so heavy was the thud of it that it brought him upright on his pillow, startled and listening. But when a sound wakes you from sleep and is not repeated, it is not difficult to persuade yourself that you have dreamed it after all. James sank slowly back to his pillow again, but he was next conscious of a sudden alteration in the air. A strong odor seemed to have found its way into the room and at the same time he was aware of a new sound that came from somewhere in the room itself. It came from the direction of the other bed, and it was the sound of deep and painful breathing. But it was on the sharp, pervading smell that his attention was first of all concentrated. Two of its components he could have accounted for readily enough. They were wet earth and freshly bruised grass, and there was plenty of both outside. But to these was added something else. It was the smell of the chest and arms of a man. Then he gave his attention to the breathing again. Matches stood on the commode beside him, but he did not immediately put out his hand to them. Even the striking of a match would have been an interruption. Sometimes the sounds of the breathing died down, and then suddenly they fought as if for life, filling the room with their noise. And James Hopley had never been in the chateau in his life before, but either that was the breathing of somebody he had known, or else in some other way it broke suddenly through out of the dark tomb of the past. For it is the first time only that we forget, 
set the cord vibrating again, and thenceforward it continues to vibrate as long as we have a memory at all. In the darkness, James lay listening to the breathing for a while longer. Then he put out his hand for the matches. But he suddenly drew it back again. So many degrees colder was the air. It was, in fact, a minute or more before he managed to light one of the candles. The other bed was unchanged in appearance, with his dressing gown still across it, just as he had thrown it down. But, brr, it was cold. The cold, that pungent smell of sweat. The breathing. He had put one foot out of bed and advanced his ear. He advanced it so close that he almost expected to feel the breath on his cheek. Then he placed his hand on the coverlet. But that apparently he ought not to have done. There was the sigh of one who wakes from temporary forgetfulness to the intolerable burden of life again. The chilliness drew away. The breathing became fainter and died. The air cleared. The candle burned on as if nothing had happened. 3. Most of us like our bedrooms to ourselves. If we must share them, we would rather do so with somebody who does not smell quite so strongly, nor bring quite such a coldness into the air. But comparatively few of us have been through the ordeal James Hopley had been through. The main structure of our frame has not been so shattered that as a frame it can suffer no more, but only in its remaining separate fragments. Account for it as you will. James Hopley did not shrink from something that would have sent most of us back to Paris by the very next train. It was, in fact, a slight disappointment to him that for the remainder of the night he was undisturbed, and he was busily writing it all down in his cahier before he had well swallowed his coffee the next morning. Towards the middle of the morning, however, he was interrupted by the announcement of a visitor. The curé of the place had lost no time in coming to inquire after the health of Madame Blanche in Paris, and to hope that Monsieur Hopley himself had recovered from the fatigue of his journey. At least these were the reasons he gave for his call. James had no doubt he had others. One was probably curiosity, and James, who noticed such things, marked him creditably highly for his composure in the presence of skin grafting and paraffin wax— but for all that, the curé had not talked for ten minutes before he was hinting that the chateau was perhaps not the best place for a convalescent to be staying in at that particular moment. When this rain stops, the men will be at work again, he said, fingering his little silver cross. And I see that one of your occupations is writing, which requires quiet. I cannot think you will be comfortable here. Come to me at my little house, if you feel inclined. I should even be happy if you would spend some considerable time with me. My garden is pleasant and my apples are ripe. Also, it would be society for me. Here, so near the river, the air is not salubrious. This was generous, and James thanked the curé, but at the same time it looked a little like letting the cat out of the bag, and presently he was asking about the chateau itself, its history, legends, associations. It seemed a natural thing to do. But he did not find the curé communicative. No place like that was without its hundred legends, some with a basis of truth, others the merest gossip, he said. Three houses had stood on those foundations before the present one. One story was that the wounded were brought to this chateau after the Battle of Arc. There were rumors concerning it during the Terror. Later, if vulgar report was to be believed, it had a history of smuggling. Its skeletons were best left in its cupboards— and that was about as much as the curé would commit himself to. Again he recommended his own vicarage. He accepted a glass of wine, but declined to stop and share James's midday meal, and James accompanied him as far as the rusty gates. He found it interesting that the Battle of Arc had been fought in the neighborhood. He did not know what weather that battle had taken place in, but a battle can be an earthy affair, with much trampled grass— and they who take part in it are exceedingly likely to sweat. But James could not believe that a battle fought nearly three hundred years ago had very much to do with himself. Had nothing happened in this country of France since then? The terror was not exactly yesterday, either. As for smuggling, well, these people ought to know best, but he gave a shrug. The incident had made far too deep an impression on him to be dismissed like that. 
If it were merely that some desperado had been pistoled or knocked on the head while running a bale or two of wool from England, Blanche would have been proud of her ghost and would have told him in her letters. Walking slowly with head down and hands behind his back, he fell into a deep musing. Nevertheless, he discovered the chateau's possibilities with regard to contraband that very afternoon. He found them in the cellars. These were a series of vaults on ancient foundations of flint, with great bays branching off them, a bakehouse, a laundry, wine cellars with the old wooden bins still mouldering in them, and in the very middle of the house he nearly walked into an unrailed and unguarded well. A rope in the rafters to hang him, and a well down here to drown him? But no. On examination he found the well to be a dry one. Then, making a swift calculation, he shone his electric torch up into the vaulting. There were signs that at some time or other it had been cut through, and a tour of the other floors a little later in the day showed the remains of other trapdoors, boarded up and long disused, but all in a vertical line between the rope and the well. With a river across the park, and the sea only a few miles away, here was a depot for contraband ready-made. But still he shook his head. Somewhere not far away there was a truer explanation than that. The rain was beginning to stop. Perhaps a turn outside would clear his thoughts and give some inner James Hopley a chance to say what he had to say. He descended the worn and grey and lichened steps at the end of the terrace. He walked along the edge of the shrub-grown moat, past the gnarled old orchard, and through knee-deep thistles down the slope of the park to the river. There, by the muddy, sliding water that ought to provide good fishing when it cleared, he cast about as it were for a rise in his own mind. His habit of avoiding all company but his own had made of this mind a sparsely furnished but a severely ordered one. Accordingly, he began at the right end, namely with the people he knew something about. First there was the curé. He was kind, hospitable, and well-mannered. James was as touched by the offer of his house and orchard as if he had thought of availing himself of it. But the curé, after all, had to steer a middle course between two worlds, and vague talk about Ark, the terror, and smuggling was all James was likely to get out of him. Next there was Marsac. Marsac was getting on in years. He lived rent-free, the produce of the gardens was enough for him and his wife, and if he lost this job he would not find it easy to get another at his time of life. He would therefore put up with midnight bumps and alterations of temperature in a part of the house he was not called upon to occupy. Then there was Blanche herself. She was spending a lot of money on her purchase, and would be coming to live there in the spring. As for the workmen, he hadn't seen them yet, but like Marsac, they would not be likely to quarrel with their bread and butter. But must every place affect everybody in precisely the same way and degree? Was there nothing in what a man brought to it? It was no light experience that James Hopley was bringing to this chateau of his friends. A smell at which anybody else would simply have opened a window was for him charged with dreadful memories. Coldness to him was not a mere momentary discomfort, but the coldness of all mortality. Disturbed breathing, the suffering of a human frame that could bear no more. Was it then to be wondered at, that after that first night he was ready to appropriate to himself anything unusual there might be about that chateau, its past, its present, or anything else it might have in store. He continued his walk under the alders of the swollen river, sometimes wondering whether the air was really as insalubrious as the curé had said, but always returning to his thought, that if a man brought more to a place than he found there, he already knew a good deal more about it than anybody else could tell him. 4. There is only one sure way of being present at the birth of a legend, that is to be oneself its origin. James Hopley left the river that afternoon with a highly remarkable idea in his head. It had to do with this queer business of revived memory. Show a man, for example, a drawing of a person he has seen perhaps once. The chances are that he will have forgotten the person, but he will remember the drawing. So with the happenings of last night. Should they happen a second time, 
then that would be a momentous and ineradicable event. It was not impossible that out of the sheer force of the stirring up a third would follow, and a fourth. This was the idea James Hopley left the river with that afternoon. But it was only the beginning of it. Something far more pregnant followed. It had been in 1916 that he had been blown up, and had disappeared from the world for exactly seven days and seven nights. Then had come his recent and unaccountable relapse in Paris. Therefore he was now a man who experiments upon the string of an instrument. Touch it never so lightly in the right place, and you were answered by its harmonic. It might be a harmonic of a jangled and horrible discord, scraped rawly out on that open string of 1916, but it would be identical in its notes and duration, faithful in its other correspondences. Seven nights of actually lived through hell then, seven nights of its etherealized repetition now. What was to happen after that does not seem to have troubled him very much. What would come would come, and it could hardly be worse than what had been. And oh, what a lot about this twilight edge of things he would know by that seventh night. As he took his candle to go to bed, it seemed already strange to him that he had only been in that chateau of his own reawakened memories a little more than twenty-four hours. But as he was turning down the bronze lamps, the door beyond the fireplace opened, and Marsac stood in the entry. And James was already finding Marsac not at all a bad fellow. He had intelligence above the average, and also a stolid sort of courage. Therefore he paused in his going to bed to exchange a word with him. It seems a pity to leave that fire, he said pleasantly, for its flames played richly on the tapestries and the high-tinted ceiling. I was just going upstairs. Until the workmen have finished, it is not possible to put a fire upstairs for monsieur. Madame wrote suddenly, and there was little time to make ready, Marsac replied. Did Madame then think I had married without telling her? There are two beds, James said, his single eye on the caretaker's face to see how he took it. But Marsac made no sign. It was as easy to put two as one, and she did not say how long Monsieur might be staying. Because the place is not salubrious. It is what Monsieur le Curé said. For that reason he invited me to stay with him. At that Marsac did go near to betraying himself. Then no doubt Monsieur will do so, he asked quickly. I visit, said James and Marsac became the restrained domestic again. Monsieur is comfortable here? There is nothing else he requires tonight? Nothing. Good night. And as the caretaker finished the putting out of the lamps, the ceiling and tapestries looked the friendlier because of all that James Hopley knew for certain awaited him in the bedchamber upstairs. That night he again threw his dressing gown across the second bed and blew out his candle, but as he lay there awake, he knew now what he was waiting for. On the following morning a young workman in a blouse and peaked cap mounted a ladder and chanced to put his head into a window aperture that opened to the long corridor inside. Suddenly a door immediately across the corridor opened, and James Hopley stood there. The workman descended hastily to where a couple of carpenters were sawing at a trestle under a portion of the scaffolding. He took off the peaked cap and passed his sleeve across his brow. "'Have you seen?' he whispered, glancing involuntarily over his shoulder. "'Has who seen what?' an older man demanded, pausing in his sawing. "'What has arrived? Mon Dieu! Jean the smuggler will not have it all his own way in the chateau now. It is the English girl cassée. Mathilde Marsac told me. You have seen him? If I have seen him, exclaimed the young man. What is he like? Like? What is a nightmare like when it promenades itself by day? I will tell you what he is like. He did so. One of his listeners made a grimace. The other nodded. It is what Mathilde Marsac said. She saw him arrive, looking over her husband's shoulder. She saw him as he stood there in the salon looking round, and that very same night, just as she was having her supper, the door of the back stairs opened, and he stood there, 
his face like a cinder with a piece of glass in it. But the second carpenter was a more matter-of-fact sort of fellow. Mathilde Marsac, he scoffed. Mathilde's knees knocked together if she has to pass the churchyard in the daylight. And is it not in the daylight that I have seen him, not five minutes ago? the young workman demanded. The night is the night. Such things belong to it. But at the beginning of the day— Bah, poor devil. Marsac told me, Madame Blanche wrote it in the letter to say he was coming, that he will not go back to his own country because of those who might remember him there. Perhaps some woman? Perhaps Madame herself? Who knows? Va! Mathilde Marsac and our Francis here, now they have both seen Jean the smuggler. And the speaker reached for his saw again. But Francis the mason had seen what he had seen, and moved off to find another audience. He had in fact seen, though without knowing anything about it, an exceedingly startling development. It was one that James Hopley himself, writing at that moment his roofer to Blanche, and for what a roof, had as yet no inkling of. For James was flushed with success. He had predicted an astonishing thing, and lo, it had straightway come true to the letter. But something else had come no less true with it. He had had no particular reason for looking at himself in the glass more attentively than usual that morning. All that he remembered of his getting up was that, as he had stepped out of his room, some young workman or other had hastily withdrawn his face from a window opening. But James had in fact made his first serious misassumption. He had taken it for granted that the work of the doctors was now done once for all, past possibility of slipping back. An actual physical retrogression had been the last thing he had foreseen. Yet, swift as a returned blow, this had taken place within a few hours, and if it continued, the inner ravage would but make the plastic superimpositions the more ghastly as time went on. It mattered little now what he wrote in or left out of his diary. The thing had already begun to write itself terribly on his face. He was, in fact, already planning the next steps of his adventure at that very moment. He must try to take this room fellow of his by surprise. What, for example, would happen if he were to change the position of the beds? If, approaching carefully, he tried whether that harsh breathing would stir the flame of a candle? dim a looking-glass. If he spoke suddenly and loudly, setting subtle traps in his questions. But now that all was well afoot, there was plenty of time. He did not notice that his midday meal was brought in that day not by Madame Marsac, but by her husband. But he did remember the workman, who had looked across the corridor at him, and, looking up, asked the caretaker his name. A brown-eyed, timid-looking young man, in a blouse and a peaked cap, he said, he was standing halfway up a ladder. That would be Francis the Mason, Marsac replied. Francis the Mason, I see. They are good fellows, the workmen here. Marsac would not express an opinion. They were come si come sa, all sorts. It is doubtless a fine thing for the village that Madame Blanche has acquired this property. No doubt it brings money and will bring more when she herself comes and begins to entertain. The chateau has had its lean years. It is but just it should have its prosperous ones, Marsac replied. I sincerely hope it may have, said James, resuming his work, and the caretaker withdrew. His work, for the moment, was to address Francis the Mason in a sort of written monologue. James, in fact, talked to him with his fountain pen as if he had been actually there. You are young, Francis, he wrote, and for the young one makes allowances. When you are as old as our friend Marsac here, you will not look at a man for a moment like that, and then draw back as if you had seen a ghost. You have perhaps finished your service, but wait till you have seen a war. They will make you a hundred ghosts there, quicker than you can put your head through an opening and take it away again. Ghosts may not be all you think, friend Francis. Much depends on how much you bring with you. Are you married? Have you children? Children grow up, and women grow old, and if that's all, death's the end. But is it the end? That's what I'm trying to find out. In a very few nights I'm hoping to know. 
Would you like to know, too? You look the sort it might be easy to tell. You may not be the first to be told. Madame Marsac looks like being that. But would you like to be the second? And when a man sets out during his lifetime to find out what happens to him when he dies, a few days and nights are little enough for the task before him. Five. His first serious check awaited him on his fifth afternoon. It began with something that he afterwards called himself fool and dunderhead not to have thought of before. Did he only breathe at night? Had he never lain down for a rest in the middle of the afternoon? Also, up to then, he had been content to write of this visitor of his that after a certain time he went. But where did he go? Even he couldn't go simply nowhere. This is what happened. At about five o'clock that afternoon, he needed something. It was nothing more than a clean handkerchief that chanced to be in his bedroom and went upstairs to get it. And this time he does not stint his description of what happened the moment he opened the bedroom door. He is, in fact, unpleasantly explicit, so we will simply say that the signs were at their maximum strength. And it was as he stood looking wonderingly down on that flat, empty bed of suffering that he had his inspiration. Where did the fellow take himself off to when he was disturbed? Hitherto his manner towards his guest had varied. There had been all those stealthy experiments to try. But even at his most intent he had shown a measure of consideration. Now he twitched off the coverlet abruptly. This fellow went back to the battlefield of Arc when he left the bed, did he? To the Cartier Saint Antoine, or the Bastille? To a cave of the confederates of this smuggling gang? Well, wherever he went this time, he would have to pass James Hopley at the door before he did so. James stood in the entry, waiting for the chill waft to pass before his face. For it was by the coldness and the overpowering smell that he followed. After a moment or two these became less strong, but in the corridor the scent was still breast-high. Along the passage he followed in the direction of the stairs that led to the mansard, up the stairs into the space beneath the roof. He followed in cold blood, not into bat-haunted shadows now, but in pallid, dusty daylight that showed up every detail of every post and beam. He came to where the floorboards ended, and the drop to the stage below could be seen. Then the odor left him as cleanly as if it had fallen in one dense body over the edge, and he stood looking stupidly at the rope that dangled from the beam overhead. Stupidly, yet with eyes suddenly cleared, for he remembered now how that rope had been the first thing to greet him on his arrival at the house. With workmen about, its presence had not struck him as sinister then, but now it beckoned to him like some dreadful lure. Your life, the gently swaying, sinuous thing seemed to whisper, it cannot be that you value life. When you remember yourself as you were twenty years ago, have you forgotten? The past was the best, the present is worse, the worst is to come. Twenty years ago you lived every minute, because you knew how few the minutes might be. If anything should happen, at least a whole man would get it in head or stomach or groin. The feel of your body was like wine to you. You made friends of a sudden. Where are your friends now? Can you find one, where before every man had a wave of the hand for you, though you never saw him again? The best of them are dead. They would be glad to be dead if they could see today what they died for. It would at least be decent that all should be dead before men began to think of carnage again. But they are subtly at work, even those who saw it. Security, rights, the glorious past— our immortal story, the heritage our fathers died for, our glory still to be. And what of the multitude who will believe anything if only the lie is big and noisy enough, who cling to their leaders who prepared the evil, and saw the evil through, and made a worse evil to follow it, and are even now tired and helpless before an evil by the side of which the other would be good? Have you seen it once and want to see it again? Do you want to live, James, 
in this world as it is, the past was the best, the present is worse, the worst is to come. Look at me, James, and ask yourself if you want to live. All this, and a thousand times more, the rope seemed to be saying to James Hopley as it hung there, gently swaying from the beam overhead. And suddenly James Hopley covered his face with his hands. Blasted and blackened as he was, he did want to live, and he was afraid of that waving, beckoning thing. He turned and ran. He ran from some inner vision of what would happen to him unless he packed his bags and left that chateau at once. He ran to the door of his own room and put his hand on the knob, but even then he drew it back again with a cry. The door had been opened at the same moment from inside. Monsieur, he heard Marsac's voice, hard and shaken. What, what are you doing here? Mon Dieu, if there is more of this I shall have to leave the service of Monsieur. I ask you, what are you— I came to open the window of the room. It is not sanitary. The room needs air. Why do you do these things? Why do you now serve my meals? How is it that I do not see Madame? It is that Madame is not well. She has gone away for a few days. And why do you look at me like that? Like what, Monsieur? But he dropped his eyes. As James Hopley's face was then, he had reason. As you are looking, as that young workman looked, as Monsieur le Curé looked, as the doctors looked when I was ill. I, Monsieur, if I am lacking in respect for Monsieur. Do you mean that I am changed? They were still face to face in the doorway, one inside the room, the other out. Suddenly Marsac stood aside for James to enter. He spoke soothingly. As I was unpacking this morning, I found a folding bed. I will put it into the room downstairs. The summer is getting late. At night there is a nip in the air. That is not answering my questions. As Monsieur says, he has been ill. First I will get a clothes brush to remove that dust. Then I will set out a glass of wine downstairs. Get the wine, said James Hopley abruptly turning his back. But half an hour later, downstairs with the bottle of wine in front of him and a glass of it already swallowed, he was able to take charge of his thoughts again. Marsac was fussing over him, making excuses to come in and out, and after the second glass James became as politic as he had recently been unnerved. Marsac was closing a placard. James spoke to him in conciliatory tones. I did not know that Madame Marsac was not well. Marsac replied that it was nothing, a slight crise de neuf. He was used to it in Madame. Is it that the chateau does not suit her? We cannot all pick and choose where we live. It may be so. She is from a town, from Rouen. Then, after Rouen, she finds this. What, monsieur? Come said James Hopley, with sudden friendliness. This chateau is a very old place. Many people have lived and died here. When many people have lived and died in a place, it is... it is as a place is when many people have lived and died there. Marsac's knotted hands were twisting his red baize apron. He looked up. Monsieur is speaking of the health of Madame? Naturally. And of the chateau. Monsieur has then heard some rumour. It may be rumour. It is that that I am asking you. Come, Marsac, be frank. If this place was not agreeable to me, I would tell you. Does a room need air? Then give it air. It is cold and not as other rooms? Then choose a different one. I am content with the room I am in. Sit down. But the caretaker preferred to stand. He nodded assentingly, however, at James's words. He, too, had no time for de rien, he said. How many rooms were there, except those built yesterday, in which somebody had not died? Did it matter how they died? One can but die. It was not dying, but living, that Marsac found difficult. 
So this room I am sleeping in. With that, Marsac's tongue was loosed, and he told the story without further ado. Since Monsieur takes so rational a view of it, and as my grandfather told the story, yes, he said. At one time this place was notorious for smuggling. Monsieur will not have noticed, but I can show him places where the floors have been cut through to allow the pulley at the top of the house to be used for the well in the cellars below. There were trap-doors, and they stored the bales in the well. Rather than be taken, one man, he is known still as Jean the Smuggler, tried to hang himself. The rope broke, the trap-door gave way under his weight, and he fell through into Monsieur's room. Nothing can be seen, however, as the ceiling has since been plastered many times. James Hopley did not often smile, but his face gave one of its twitches now. Always the ceiling had been plastered over. Always there was the gap between the event and the first record of it. And what were the next record, and the next, and the next, but so many successive plasterings? Stones were never very long in place before the legends began to follow. So why begin with Ark? According to the curé, portions of the foundations went back centuries before then. It amused James to make little trimmings of his own to the chateau's history. At least this poor fellow had a struggle for his life. One's life is one's life. Doubtless one struggles. No doubt after a flight across the fields, hiding under the haystacks and taking shelter in the ditches. It is probable that to get to the chateau he would cross fields. He is said to have swum the river. I myself remember one place that few would pass alone after dark. Because of this suicide? One supposes so. But there are some who will believe anything. All the same, these things make history. Marsac gave a shrug. As I say, one can but die once. Perhaps it is well. And with Madame away, I have the work of two to do. Monsieur will not let me make up the bed for him downstairs. I am very well where I am. I will ask the men about the chimney. It will then be possible to have a fire upstairs. And Marsac shuffled off to his own quarters. James Hopley filled his glass again. One can but die. Now who had told the excellent Marsac that? and the legend of the smuggler who had come through the ceiling of his room. What tomfoolery would they be talking next? And as it was not a joke he could share with the first comer, he shared it with his cahier that night. There is in fact one passage he wrote that had better be transcribed exactly as he wrote it, lest another pen should seem to have misinterpreted him. It is the first clear indication we have of the lengths to which this ingrowing mind of his was prepared to go. He writes in cold ink, Since that visit of mine to the top of the house this afternoon, I am at least face to face with something real. But as for a man can but die, who except Marsac says so? If all who ever lived are completely dead, what is all the talk about? Since the world began, has no man ever been partially dead? Never? It seems to me a good deal to say. I am not thinking of Lazarus. Unless he was wholly dead, there was no miracle. And I am leaving out translation, for these were not, and death does not enter into it. But say that a few exist in this residual and partial state. On what level do these manifest, and to whom? Assuredly to somebody they meet on the same level. So take such a man as I am, neither one thing nor the other. I am, as you might say, either death warmed up or life cooled down. In that case, there is only a margin of difference between him, scarcely dead, and me, scarcely alive. He is as much a man as I, I as much a ghost as he. For all I know, I am in the direct line of succession. It is merely that in that case I should like to know. But, by the way, a rather curious thing has occurred to me. A set of words has been running in my head for this last hour that I have not the faintest recollection of having heard before. 
Textually, they are the same every time they come, and they do not strike one as an accidental jingle. They are, the past was the best, the present is worse, the worst is to come. Needless to say, I haven't invented them, and they seem to come from a very, very long way off. Where? So here was a man calmly arguing, and with a certain show of logic, the possibility of becoming a ghost himself. If, he seems to have asked, this Jean the Smuggler had been preceded by a spectre from the Terror, and that by an invisible shape from Ark, and the Ark Phantom by a dim line of others, why should the ghostage stop there? As for his quotation, that indeed is slightly puzzling. Very few fragments of this ancient Maya philosophy remain, and such as there are are not likely to have come James Hopley's way. But somehow the words, coming like the phantoms out of abysses of time, add a credit to his other speculations. But with all his logic he had forgotten one thing. This was that ghosts do not appoint themselves. It is still the consensus of human tongues that makes the ghost, and in the end all came back, not to James, but to the men and women of the neighborhood. As usually happens, it was pure accident that brought this to a head, on the Sunday after his arrival at the chateau. So far he had taken his walks within the limits of the chateau's own lands, and he ought to have known that he was taking risks in venturing farther abroad on the day when the masons and carpenters rested from their work of the week. But it was a tempting day for a stroll, and he happened to find himself at a dilapidated postern with fields of wheat and half-cut lucerne beyond that rose up a small hill. There was nobody about, nor unless an unseen cock crowed any sign of life to be seen, and passing out of the postern he began the ascent of the hill. And a man may commune with a rope about the vileness of man and the things he does on earth, but he cannot see the wheat weaving over its poppies and cornflowers, nor the humble thyme and bed straw and rest harrow that make a world of dowdy beauty of the stubble, and remain altogether unmoved in heart. Acute noises of busy insects sounded in James Hopley's ears. The quick eyes of a bird looked into his for a moment, and close to his foot a clod stirred that was a hedgehog, and for all he knew he might be looking at it for the last time. Something came into his throat. This was all of life he would really miss. There had indeed been a time, but what was time to all this untrammeled homeliness? The speck of an insect settling on his hand, its momentary agony were he to destroy it would be as long as any agony James Hopley had endured but its joy in the glowing minutes of the sun was as long. It was endless as those kisses women gave to all men but to him, seeming to keep them alive for ever during the unmeasured minute their eyelids dropped and quivered. Oh, if a man could but have had the floweriness and the love and put all the fiendishness away! And in that very moment he found himself at the top of the hill, looking down the other slope of it. The slender spire of the church rose against the next hillside, and past it the road straggled among the compact farms. But there was also something else going on. In a small field just this side of the church, the people of the village seemed to have been spilt together in a little hollow, as if out of a scoop. Marsac had said nothing to James Hopley about a fete, but there it was in full progress. Half a dozen canvas booths had been set up, with tiny flags and gay banners of bunting. Rustic games were in full swing, and the short crack of air-guns where the boys shot for tinsel prizes, and he could distinguish the curé, short and black in his soutane, moving among the mothers and marshalling the children for their short races. A hedge surrounded the field. It was pure hunger of heart that made James long to draw a little nearer, if he liked to use the slight shoulder of the hill as cover, he might be able to do so unseen. Cautiously he descended, and presently, standing in a dry ditch with foxgloves and cow parsley up to his knees, was peering through a gap. Almost the first thing he saw seemed to have been put there specially for him. 
On a fluttering strip of homely, unsized calico, the homemade letters all blurred, he read, Ancien combattant de la guerre. There, with their half-legs and sticks and empty sleeves and war medals, they moved about, and God knows they could have had James' English one-pound note had anybody told him of the occasion. But these were decent mutilations, mutilations that made a man hold his head up and brought him honor among his friends and the awed regard of their children. James, putting the tangle of convolvulus aside with his hand, could only stand there out of sight, looking on. He never knew whose eyes had been the first to see him. By ill luck it was a child who suddenly screamed. And though an instant later James Hopley was no longer there, a mother was already at the child's side. Other mothers, too, had come up and were gently shaking the child, demanding what it had seen to terrify it. But the child could only sob and gulp and cling to its mother. By that time, James, no longer thinking of concealment, was walking with down-hung head and hands before his face up the hill again. Once he turned. Down in the field he saw them as they watched him, hands that pointed him out. One urchin had lifted a toy gun to his shoulder, and James heard the minute crack. Where the stooks began, he dropped behind them out of sight. Below him he saw the broken postern he had come out of. Better if he had remained on the other side of it. For men might understand and grant that after all war was like that, and women always had their men behind them, but let James Hopley come unawares upon a child, and its father and mother alike turned on him eyes that blazed. Had this accursed mutile then not the decency to stay within doors? Must he stare even at children, so that his dreadful visage haunted them at night? Who was he, this corpse that Madame had sent here to die? He who prowled about the chateau after dark, so that even good Mathilde Marsac would not stay a day longer in the place. Where was Mathilde? Run and get her. She was the one to question the child. Poor little Leonie, she could not tell her own mother, but she would tell Mathilde, who had come over just the same way herself. Francis, Charles, you saw the foreigner, the English girl cassé. Tell us what kind he is, this animal who frightens children. And Francis the mason was able to say that he had looked through a window piercing into the corridor, and it was well the ladder had been secured at the top, or he and the ladder must have come down together, such a glaring face had this stranger turned on him. And Charles could tell them more than that, for he had seen him in his room, dressing himself, putting his face on, for that, bien sûr, was not the face he slept in, but another, that he took off and put on the bedside commode before he hid himself under the sheets. But a third had presently left that far behind. This Englishman, this horror, he said, had a glass eye, which God knows does sometimes happen to a copain in a war without anybody thinking the worse of him, but he does not get a malevolent soul in the war, too. Not only had he a glass eye, ce cadavre, but he played devil's tricks with it. Let them ask Jacques Martin when he returned. Jacques would tell them how he had met this miserable three days ago down by the river, at a certain spot they knew of. Yes, the selfsame spot. He had been under the alders, just as he had hidden under the hedge to frighten the child, and Jacques himself had seen him take out the glass eye and polish it with a handkerchief and put it back into its socket again, and then he had screwed up the other eye, pretending to take that out and polish it too, and it glared at Jacques with them both. What did Jacques do? You may well ask. He looked round for the nearest billet of wood, but before he could find one he had gone, this English miscreant, gone and not to be found, though Jacques had shaken every bush round about for half an hour. As for him who spoke, he wished that somebody would write a letter to Madame in Paris, telling her she must remove her revenant or get somebody else to wheel her barrows. When Madame bought people's labor, she did not buy their nerves, too. Mon Dieu, he wanted a cognac now, the turn Jacques Martin's story had given him. So the workmen retired to the inn, there to discuss their relations with Madame Blanche, but James Hopley sat among his tapestries and porcelain vases, his spirit broken. 
What was the world but a place where little girls had fits at the sight of him, and youngsters of ten pointed their toy guns at him? Ancien combattant de la guerre. It was time to make room. He saw by Marsac's face when he came in that what had happened had already got round to him, and Marsac now had not even the excuse that he had his wife to look after, but he merely brought in James' supper, saw to it that he had a good fire, and left him again. Drawing near to the fire-dogs and stretching out his hands as if they had been cold and stiff already, James Hopley did not even write in his book. Six. Whenever James Hopley looked back on those days of 1916, he looked back on a world of men, each with a face and name and rank and regimental number and a separate history of his own. And that had been a good time to know a man in, for you had learned more about him in half an hour than in all the years since the armistice. But in this harmonic repetition of it all, every one of these trifling, all-important things was missing. He had now spent four nights in that Hôtel Drouot room upstairs, knowing with a certainty that it increased every night what this room-fellow of his was, but without getting an inch nearer to knowing who. He sat long that night over the fire. The flames seemed to make the stiff figures of the tapestries start softly forward and retire again. They gave a dim life and motion to the battle-piece that was big enough for a wall at Versailles, but no friendly face started forth out of the fire to look at James himself. Curse the fellow! James had done his utmost to make himself known to him. Why couldn't he have done the same? If James had been through that storm of khaki and flame and gas and mud and chloride of lime once, he could go through it again, but he would not do so alone. He would have a pal with him the next time. Well, there was another chance tonight. Perhaps his pal would have changed his mind. Sluggishly he rose. His pal had changed his mind. Throughout that night the second bed remained unvisited. In the room itself nothing whatever happened. James lay awake till the first streaks of daylight. Then, exhausted, he fell into a doze but he was roused by a rude enough shock an hour or so later. There was a shattering of glass. Something rolled across the floor and came to rest. Turning his head on his pillow, James saw that it was a stone. They were going to stone him out of the chateau now. And what was he going to do about that? There had been a time when he wouldn't have had to ask himself. The whole village could have gone to the devil before he would have budged. There were plenty of ways in which he could have retaliated. But what was the good? It wasn't the hostility of the village that mattered. It was this utter, heartbreaking failure of the night. Yet where in this shadowy business had he miscalculated? He went over it all again, but could not find that anywhere he had made a mistake. Was then some presumption being punished in him? Some sin? he asked himself, searching his heart. I cannot see what great wrong I have ever done in my life. Looking back on it, I have a thousand meannesses and petty acts to beg forgiveness for, but it hasn't been an important enough life for a big sin, not even important enough for big suffering either, for this is not true suffering. There is a gallantry in defying anguish, and this is only wincing under the blow when it comes, and waiting for the next. I had hoped for something a little braver. I would have stood up to it, gone out to meet it. Next Wednesday was to have been the crux, and I have one more night. If nothing happens, I shall feel like— But what he would feel like in that case is heavily scored out. Again he quotes his bit of Maya about the best and the worst, and within a couple of hours is writing, And now Marsac is leaving me. He has just told me so. I told him he couldn't just step out like that, but would at least have to find me somebody else, but he shook his head. Nobody else would come. But he has consented to stay another week. Then in my place he would go too, he says. In my place. 
am suddenly interrupted. Here comes the curé along the terrace. But this time he was not the amiable curé who had come to ask after Madame Blanche in Paris and to invite James to come and stay with him at the vicarage. He had his most unyielding clerical face on, so much so that not ten minutes had passed before he was asking James whether he would not like to pray. To pray? Why? James asked. The curé looked him resolutely in the face. Have you no enemies? With that James answered the curé in his own tone. None who have not made themselves so. Is it likely the whole village is wrong? Must I pray for the man who threw a stone through my window this morning? The curé frowned as he turned his little silver cross in his fingers. The throwing of the stone was evidently news to him, for he dropped a little of his austerity. It is as I said. This air is not suitable for you. It is best to speak plainly as to the terrible thing that has happened to you. For your physical hurt, so much worse, believe me, in this short time, there is, alas, no doctor. If they have done all they can for you in Paris, it is the will of God. But if your soul is sick, there is always prayer. Will you kneel with me? So the village says my soul is sick too. I must close my ears if you boast of your own righteousness. If then my soul is sick, should we be praying the same prayer to the same God? My prayer and my God will prevail. Enough. I will not kneel with you. The curé became austere again. Monsieur, you come here, and in less than a week you are troubling my flock. Already it is said of you that if the earth swallowed you, it was as it closed upon Dathan and Abiram, who went down quick into the pit. But the incense of God, whose priest I am, rose between the dead and the living. Again I ask you to pray. I live my life alone. I will pray for what is left of it alone. Surely our own ancien combattant should sympathize and understand. What do they say? That where already a fear was, you make it visible. I, I have the protection of my cross. He turned it in his fingers again. But if others think you are the devil, I cannot be the shepherd of my flock without entering into their thoughts. Suddenly, too exhausted for further disputation, James dropped heavily into a chair. It was precisely as he had thought. This curé had his middle course between two worlds to steer. Well, let them have it their own way. He closed his eyes. I am sure you meant kindly in coming, monsieur. It was my duty. Your case shall be pleaded with them, too. At least no more stones shall be thrown. Since you will not pray with me, I will pray for you alone. But he spoke to the air. James was asleep. When he opened his eyes again, the curé had gone. But during that short interval of forgetfulness, James had had a curious dream. He had dreamed that he was upstairs in his room, packing his bags to return to Paris. With the manifestations cut abruptly off, what was there left to stay for? Marsac had advised him to go. The curé told him plainly that he was looked on as the devil and a fear made visible. So he was packing up to leave it all. But as in his dream he moved about his bedroom, he suddenly found himself looking for his water bottle. Somehow his familiar civilian attire had changed itself into articles of wartime equipment, there they lay, spread out on the second bed, his greatcoat, his haversack, his entrenching tool, his tin hat, his gas mask. Looking down at himself, he saw the puttees on his legs, his stained knees, the skirts of his frayed tunic. His revolver was in the holster at his waist, the breech of his rifle was oiled, the piece of rag was tied over its muzzle. His ten days' leave was up. Waterloo, the night train, and the escorted crossing. Where the devil was that water bottle? There was something stronger than water in it. Ah, there it was, on the alabaster-topped washstand. 
Fool that he was, it wasn't his water bottle, but his gas mask that he had lost. It had been on the second bed there only a moment ago. Curse things for getting lost like this, and him in a hurry with the boat train to catch. And suddenly in his dream he was standing before the gilded glass above his mantelpiece, staring at himself. He might well look for his mask. He had it on all the time. Christ, what a picture of all hell it was, with its goggles and its swine snout, its offal like windpipe, re-entering his own entrails, its integument, tucked like putrid wrinkled flesh into his collar. And all at once he gulped, as if a hand had closed hard on his heart. That that he was looking at was not the mask. It was his face. He woke with a cry. It was small wonder he frightened the village if even in a dream he could frighten himself. Fear made visible? But he was angry now. What fear? Why, the fear they had always had, the rats. The fear that they were bold enough to laugh at in the daytime, but that at nightfall drew them close together in the inn, to tell one another over their cognac that it took more than a shadow to frighten them. But because they did fear the shadow, they cast about to give it a substance, and in James they found one ready-made and to hand. Within a week he was no less a personage than the devil himself, and at the thought of this there smote through the dun clouds that enveloped James's mind a piercing, dazzling ray. The devil? He? Why, if they thought that, then it was in his power to be the devil. Suddenly he laughed outright. Wretched little souls without imagination, who wanted all but the picturesquely wounded to take themselves out of sight, so that they might be able to talk with a better conscience about the glorious past and the heritage their fathers had died for. At least the rope had told leaner, starker truth than that. He had turned and run from it before. Would he turn and run from it now? And that non-appearance of the night before. What had ailed James that he had looked on that as a calamity? Was it not in truth the very opposite? What had become of James's theory of first and second times if it applied to appearances and not to non-appearances also? Suddenly he exulted. That first night of unsupported loneliness had been sent to test him. It had been sent to try whether he was yet goblin enough to stand alone. And he had stood alone. His very face was now hardly recognizable as a face, and it had been as much as the curé had been able to do to look at it without blenching. A fear made visible. He broke into a peal of laughter that startled himself and ended abruptly. Give James a second night of tranquility, and the ghost in him would be marvelously strong. No threadbare story of Jean the smuggler. But he, James Hopley, and the devil they attributed to him, would be the unsettling of the curé's flock. Oh, let no chill or smell or breathing come tonight to mar the rich perfection of it. He was eager to begin that deep, dreamless sleep at once. That night he went to bed supperless and slept like the dead. 7. As a small child, just before they drew his nursery curtains late in the afternoon, James Hopley had sometimes stood at the window, looking at the mimic fire that had seemed to burn in mid-air outside, magically and all by itself. People in the street seemed to walk through it unscathed, and young James himself had only to take a step this way or that, and out the fire had gone altogether. It had, of course, been only the reflection of the fire in the room, and yet to James its reality had been such that the illusion had stuck with him through life. He had, of course, had different names for it at different times. At one time he had called it ambition, but he had never been equipped for that, and ambition hadn't lasted very long. Then he had known it by the name of love, and had wondered that others didn't stop to warm their hands at this wonderful thing of his, too, till one day one of them had and out that had gone, too. And he had called it knowledge, and pleasure, and a number of other things, and now he was wondering what form it was going to take next. 
He had also been counting up how many pages remained in his cahier, for it was his intention to go on writing to the very last moment. There were fifteen of them, and his normal handwriting was on the small side. Fifteen should be enough, and as he looked on the blank pages, he wondered what would be found on them at that time, tomorrow. He had arrived at the chateau on a Wednesday, and at six o'clock on the following Tuesday afternoon he was watching the workmen depart. One or two of them glanced backwards over their shoulders, but James kept out of their sight by a tall onyx lamp near the fireplace. Then, when the last of them had disappeared, he took a walk round Blanche's domain. His senses were more than ordinarily sharpened. His single eye was as alert as if he had been making a final inspection of the property before taking possession of it. He noted what a great deal of work still remained to be done. The old orchard there would have to be grubbed up and replanted. The cleaning out of the choked moat would take weeks yet. Summers must pass before the gardens took on orderliness, scores of summers before the restored portions of the building began to assimilate with the older work. But assimilate in time they would, and it would be an odd thing now if James Hopley had no part at all in the place that was to be. There was at least one little girl in the village who, become a grandmother, would be able to tell how, in broad daylight, the chateau's spectre had mocked and mowed at her through a hedge, giving such a turn to her thoughts that they had never really got over it and an aged man by a fireside would nod gravely and say that that was quite true, for he himself had seen it too, halfway up the hill behind the church there, and had pointed a gun at it, and it had fled. The sun was going redly down behind the scaffold poles. It dyed the new chimney-stack rose-pink, and presently, when the empty window-holes were glazed, they would fling back the gold too. It was a short life at the best, and when the hour came it shrank to such a small handful of days as to make one wonder what it had all been about. And suddenly, like an announcement of that hour, a bell with a curiously harsh iron clang broke in on his thoughts. Now where had that bell come from? That was new. Was it something else that Blanche had picked up at the Hôtel de Rouault? Probably. And Marsac, unable to find him in the house, was telling him supper was ready. He had a feeling that Marsac ought to provide a rather special supper that night. Slowly he ascended the steps to the terrace. As all Blanche's friends know, she did not move into that chateau on the following spring. To the dismay of the men of the village, but also as a final confirmation had one been needed, the work was discontinued abruptly, and in the Paris newspapers an advertisement appeared that a Henri IV chateau, partly furnished and needing only a little restoration, was for sale, no reasonable offer refused, and possession at purchaser's own convenience. No tenant has yet concluded the bargain. Several have been down to visit the property, which now has not even a caretaker, and the last applicant, a wealthy man in the motor business, was buttonholed on his way back to his car by a bald, bearded, elderly man who said that his name was Marsac, that he lived in the little shack behind the inn, could tell Monsieur such and such things about the chateau, and for the rest did such odd jobs as were to be had while his wife looked after the young children of the women who worked in the fields. What passed between Marsac and the motor magnate is not known, but the car drove away and has not been seen since. So things draw to a close of themselves. One persists in giving his account of the affair, another his, and so on. But when it is all weighed up, those cahiers of James Hopley's are the only direct testimony that remains, a stopwatch record of what passed, set down in the moment of its passing. They are written in pencil, apparently as he sat up in bed. His first entry is timed 11.30 with all still outside and all quiet in the gilt and alabaster room. His pulse was normal, his breathing easy, and he had not drunk any wine. In these circumstances his personal narrative ends, and the new legend begins. 11.45 Nothing yet, 
but it is still early. I'm writing to kill time as I wait. Of course that was all nonsense about taking my revenge by haunting these poor people. I have other things to think about now. But I don't think I should care to be the curé of a place like this, though I expect that about Dathan and Abiram came from Madame Marsac. She has that sort of look now I come to think of it. Poor Marsac. He's taken this rather badly. I could see he was in two minds about giving notice. He didn't want to stay, but he didn't want to go, either. Quite a bond between us in exactly one week. I shall remember, Marsac. That is, if one does remember these things afterwards. 12.15. Still nothing, but wonder what's just brought Tommy Allenson into my head. He got his at Loos, but he got it clean and quick, not like me and this other chap. You don't have relapses years afterwards and go into a clinic when you've been drilled through the head. Funny, I can remember Tommy's name and any number of other names, but not this fellow's. Always on the tip of my tongue. Some name like Hobbs, Briggs, Crab. A tough devil he was, anyway, pinned in the darkness under that beam like that. Still breathing when they got him out. Gave a shriek, I remember, and that hour before they came for me seemed longer than all the rest put together. Australian. Sergeant, 5th Division. Afterwards, at Horse Ferry Road, they thought I was loopy, asking for a man and knowing no more who than that. No name, no number, no unit, nothing. But they were tough, all those Aussies. That night raid when they blackened their faces and put cogwheels and bits of iron on pick handles. In the trench that other time, when they found a whole section of them dead with women's underclothes on, didn't he come from Brisbane now? Hell, why didn't I think of that before? Big husky chap, scar over right eye, swore like blazes and came from Brisbane. Why didn't I tell them that at Horse Ferry Road? Higgs, Biggs, some short name. 12.30 Keep looking up at the trap door, Marsac says they've plastered up but I know he's not always punctual to the tick. Wait, what's that? Thought I heard something. Wee-oo! Bump! It's nothing. Only Jerry waking up. Half an hour and he'll stop. You can set your watch by Jerry. Worth a quid to see what we're doing to him when it's our turn. Something pretty dirty a fellow who managed to get away told me. Wait a bit, though. That was something upstairs. 12.55 Note, this entry consists of the hour only. One thirty. Can't say I'm sorry that's over. Hell, but it was good and solid on top of us that time. The other must have been the last lot of earth settling. Why can't it stop where it's put instead of shifting and rumbling to itself like a man's belly? That get you any, Digger? Don't like his being so quiet. There's something pushing against my right foot that wasn't there before. First you can't move, then it loosens up, and you're afraid to lift a finger. Christ, that bastard's woke up. He's at it again. Hell, give it a rest, man. Am I on a bloody feather bed either? Something crawling over your face? They don't charge you anything extra for that. I haven't got any legs that I can feel. Day or night, how in the goddamn blazes do I know? What do you think I am, a sundial? Stop it, or you'll start another bloody vibration or something. Fool, you stink, or somebody does. Any more of us here? Same old smell, boys, good for you. Doesn't make you think too much of yourself. For the love of God, stop it, man. Listen, that was picks, shovels, voices. I heard him. Damn you, I tell you, I heard him. Oh, my God, he's stopped. Passed out this time, I guess. Are you there? You. What's your name? You, from Botany Bay. Two, five. That thing by my right leg's a box of some kind. Just managed to get my hand down to it. Anyway, it's wood. Iron's colder. 
ammunition box, perhaps, with the rope handle come loose. Stop. This is getting exciting. There's too much of it for an ammunition box. Perhaps an end of broken wagon with a trace on it. Never know what you find when a dump blows up. Yards of it. Wonder if I could work an end over to him and tell him to make it fast to the timber. Hi, Cobber, are you awake? Got a hand loose? There's a rope here. A rope, man, do you hear? Lots of it. Then get your hands free and scratch away out. A rope end coming over. No hurry. Haul in and try again. Weave all the time there is. 2.15 This is queer. The place has got all turned round, and there's a light, and I can see. Where did that candle come from? What am I doing in bed? Don't you begin seeing things that aren't there, my son, or you're done. You've been blown up. Two beds mean you're seeing double, and bedrooms don't stink like this. No, making it fast to the beam's no good. Once a dead prize up with a lever, shall be crushing the poor devil to pulp if I begin to haul. He's dead off again now. Off for good if he's lucky. You have ten minutes' nap, Digger. Do you all the good in the world, as Blanche says. I was a rotten swine to wake you up that afternoon. Regular dog in the manger. Didn't want the bed myself and wouldn't let you have it. Let a man sleep when he can. Sleep himself right off the map. Go out like a candle. Funny place, this. A candle one minute and not the next. And that candle's nearly out. Better put another one in. He didn't need those fifteen pages after all. Indeed, his closing words are in a scrawl so agitated that something dire must have happened. One conjecture is that in putting in the new candle he upset the candlestick on the other bed, scaring this companion of his away. There is, in fact, a small trace of wax on the counterpane, though no scorching. The cahier was found the next morning face downwards on the floor between the beds, the one tossed, the other as smooth as if it had been newly made. It ends almost illegibly with the words scattered all over the page. Damnation! Quiet! He stirred. No, he's only turned over. Wait! No, he's getting up the door. Listen, I found a rope. The past, the present, to come. Wait! Wait! There was one point of the roof gutter that the plank cradle did not quite reach, but Francis the mason thought that by lashing it to the nearest point of the scaffolding he could cant it sufficiently, and so save himself the trouble of setting it up anew. He called to Marsac, who was passing below. Marsac, have you a rope handy? Descend by the ladder and get in at the window piercing. You will find one in the rafters there. And he passed on to prepare Monsieur Hopley's coffee. Francis descended and scrambled through the aperture. He found the rope, or what was left of it, for it was newly broken. Francis looked up at the centre rafter, where it had jumped from the sheave of the pulley and jammed, and then down at the unboarded floor. There below he saw the rest of it, but it was attached to something. The something wore a pair of pyjamas, and its feet were bare. Francis fled. In his own quarters, Marsac was pouring boiling water into a metal jug. He looked round as Francis the mason entered. You found the rope? But the young mason could only stammer, Yes, and you, in the night, you heard nothing? At something in his tone, Marsac's bearded face, too, had turned the color of butcher's fat on a slab. What? Heard what? The girl cassé, suicide, il s'est pendu. It is the work of Jean the smuggler. He does not do it himself. Always he makes them do it. Go and see. But at that moment the door at the foot of the back stairs swung slowly, silently, emptily open. And Jean the smuggler was apparition enough for Francis the mason, but not for Henri Marsac. Suddenly the caretaker gave a harsh cry as his wife had done before him. The jug of Monsieur Hopley's morning coffee was still in his hand. 
All at once he hurled it across the apartment, full into the vacant doorway, as before he had almost thrown a lighted lamp. Then he fell in a heap across a chair and lay there, shuddering. The metal pot crashed against the edge of the open door and fell to the floor. Slowly what was left of the coffee spread out in an irregular pool about it. I shall remember, Marsac, James Hopley had written. He had remembered him. <laughs>